you all for uh, for coming uh, to this first uh, the first presentation of today. I know it's tough. Uh, I'm not. Uh, um, I have troubles waking up early regularly, so I appreciate all of you being here. And well, um, well, my name is Gustavo Silva, and uh, we are going to be talking about uh, a little bit about security, uh, the Linux kernel, and uh, the implications of. Uh, well, implementing security upstream in the upstream Linux, Linux kernel, which is, uh, well, is, uh, is, is tough. <laughs> well, uh, first, a couple of disclaimers. Uh, this is the first time I'm going to give this presentation. So uh, you are going to be my test audience. So I appreciate that. So hopefully I'm going to get a pass at the end. And um, another disclaimer is that, well, usually, uh, the person that uh, speaks about the kernel self-protection project is Case Cook, which is uh, the person that uh, created the project in 2015. Uh, so, of course, he has all the credentials. Um, and well, I'm going to give uh, this presentation from my from my own particular perspective. Right? I have been collaborating with this project for uh, some years now, so uh, I, I I have not uh, all the experience that Case have, but uh, that Case has, but um, I'm going to going to give it a try. And well, first, before before I even begin, uh, let me ask you a couple of questions just to have an idea of, of the audience present today. So, how many of you here um, started uh, his uh, career in the kernel uh, community uh, in since 2017? Ah, come on. <laughs> From from 2007, yeah, yeah. no, no. <laughs> okay, how many again, please? Oh, a few. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, well, the, the reason for this question is because well, I started uh, participating and collaborating with this community in uh, in May 2017. So, well, I I'm still new. So, well, the second question is how many here have uh, have heard before about the kernel self protection project? Okay, awesome. Well, a lot of you uh, actually, uh, it seems you don't know what we are doing in the current separation project, but this presentation is for that. And well, okay. So first, who am I? Uh, well, I have a background in embedded systems. Um, I have experience working with uh, real-time operating systems and embedded Linux. So before I joined the kernel community, I was uh, an embedded software engineer for eight years. So now I have uh, been doing a, a upstream Linux kernel development for the last six years. Uh, I am now recently I am a maintainer. And well, I collaborate with the Google Open Source Security team in the kernel division. Well, I had to say that uh, this presentation is, is, is made possible thanks to the support of the Linux Foundation and Google. And well, I am a volunteer uh, at Kids on Computers. I was a board member and now I volunteer occasionally. Uh, but later on, I, I guess uh, in the day, we are going to talk a little bit more about this project. And well, this is um, Tuxote. <laughs> Tuxote was my, my support, uh, uh, how do you call this? Uh, emotional support to stop animals during the pandemic. So <laughs> it was a, it was a, a special gift. Okay, the agenda. Uh, of course, we are going to talk uh, about the kernel self-protection project, what it is and what it is not, uh, some of the tools and platforms we regularly use, uh, and also uh, what it takes to, to actually harden the Linux kernel, right? And then, well, I'm going to share a little bit about the work in progress uh, currently and uh, some, a few accomplishments. And Mostly what I am involved in too, so. And well, I'm going to try to, uh, to persuade some of you or some people that is uh, watching this presentation out there at some point um, on, on collaborating with us uh, to improve the overall security of the Linux kernel. And I'm going to try to explain how you can do, uh, how you can uh, do some changes to the code that are important to accomplish some, some, some goals. And well, finally, the conclusions. OK, 
Okay. Uh, first, uh, the Linux kernel cell protect the, the kernel cell protection project is uh, is an upstream project, and I have to clarify this because on IRC every now and then uh, we we get some some messages uh, from people asking uh, where is the the, the the repository of the of, of this project, where can they go and take a look and try to uh, uh, and, and test it or, or try it out. Um, we don't have a, a repository. Uh, we don't have a clone. We, we are not a clone of the Linux kernel. We are not a downstream project. Every everything we do, every uh, every major or minor uh, minor middle step we implement uh, is supposed to uh, to go upstream. So everything we do uh, is for the upstream Linux kernel. And well, of course. Uh, we uh, focus our efforts on hardening the Linux kernel. So now, usually when people uh, talk about or read about hardening, hardening software, the next thing they, they, they read or, or they hear is that, well, hardening is about uh, making the, in this case, the kernel harder to attack or making some particular software harder to attack. Uh, I don't usually, I don't like that, uh, that, that explanation because to me it's a little bit shallow is a little bit too general. Uh, what we are trying to do in this project is to uh, to do whatever is possible in order to get rid of entire bug classes, right? And ultimately, the, the ultimate goal and, and what would be just amazing is to eliminate uh, methods of exploitation, right? And also, I have to add here that we are not um, we are not working on fixing uh, bugs. On, on hunting and fixing bugs, uh, we have decided to focus our efforts on on trying to implement defense mechanisms, trying to implement safer APIs, trying to identify some buggy code patterns, some idioms that people have been using for decades, and uh, and trying to replace them with uh, with um, with something a little bit more secure and less prone to errors, right? Uh, however, addressing bugs and issues, uh, individual bugs and issues, is still important. So, uh, whenever you can do that, well, it's great. And of course, well, we are trying to move the whole code base to, uh, to a safer APIs. And well, I have to uh, say a word about CVEs. Um, we are not uh, we are not writing CVEs. And why do I even mention CVEs? Well, that's because. A little bit more than a year ago, uh, there was this uh, press release from announcing a collaboration between Google and the Linux Foundation, and they were announcing that they were funding some um, a couple of developers to focus exclusively on, on security in the Linux kernel. Well, those people happened to be Nathan uh, Chancellor and I, and well, at that time, uh, some people started to ask if uh, well. Now, it was a good time for, for the kernel people to start uh, paying attention to CVEs. And well, the short answer is no. We, we don't write CVEs. Uh, we don't care about CVEs. Uh, so we decided to, uh, to spend our time on, on other stuff, on, on things that we consider a little bit more important than CVEs, than, than writing CVEs. I understand that for, for certain sector, of the software industry, CVs are important, but at least uh, in our case, they are not. Okay, well, some tools and platforms we regularly use. We have a, a Linux hardening mailing list now. It was recently created in 2020, and that was because at some point, Case had some disagreements with. Uh, uh, some of the of the admins of the other mailing of the other kernel hardening list, and the thing is that it seems that uh, they didn't want to uh, to see other things that uh, I mean th they only wanted to see new things landing in that list. They only wanted to see discussions about uh, I don't know maybe some important inno innovations, and it's something they wanted only to see like a list of all the small middle steps uh, are absolutely needed in order to achieve bigger goals. They only wanted to see a list of that things being completed. But they didn't want to, to see discussion about it because they considered that uh, in, unimportant. 
So we need a list where we could discuss about those unimportant things, which are actually uh, absolutely important for us. And, and well, uh, Case created this new list. Uh, there is a link at the end, so you can go and see the whole discussion. It's somewhat a long, a long discussion, but it's interesting to read. Um, and yeah, well, we we needed this. Um, we we also have to do in order to um, to let's say to enable a compiler option. Uh, we need to do a lot of cleanups uh, along the way. So sometimes we need to deal with mechanical changes. So all those things that even if they appear small and simple, uh, well, we need a, a place where we could talk about it. So patchwork, well, of course. Uh, the, the project is not a subsystem, but somehow we have maintainers. And uh, well, the maintainers are Case and I. And well, we need a place where we could uh, collect all the important uh, tags, the review bytes, the tested bytes, the uh, knowledge. And well, now the project has been growing, and we eventually get some uh, some some contributors, some external contributors to the project, uh, some occasional contributors. And in the past, when we didn't have uh, the patchwork project, well, some of those patches uh, were lost. Even some of our patches were lost. I mean, uh, sometimes we were sending a bunch of patches, and by a bunch of patches, I mean like a more than 100. Uh, and then after some months, we ran into a piece of code that looked familiar, and well, it turned out that those patches that we were sending were, were never applied, and we forgot about them. So yeah, we wanted to, uh, we wanted to avoid that, and, and that's, uh, that's why we use patch core is very useful. And well, another thing about uh, occasional contributors. Um, every now and then, uh, contributors appear and their patches are lost and so, but every now and then something funny happens that we see uh, contributions with, uh, with a copy paste commit log. And that's interesting for us. And uh, that, that's something that if you want to collaborate to a project and you are absolutely new, uh, that's okay. That's totally fine. So we would actually love to see a lot of people copying and pasting our, our commit logs if they are going to, to help us to achieve some goals. Because, well, I personally, I, I, I did that at the, at the beginning of my career in the kernel. So I did it once, and it was fun. <laughs> Okay, we have an issue tracker. Uh, al along the way, when, when we are trying to, to complete bigger tasks, I think it, it could sound familiar to you that uh, along the way you run into more issues and more problems, and you all of a sudden you wanted to complete a couple of tasks. Well, now you have like a, a dozen of, of them, right? So we need a place where we could keep track of all those issues that we were finding along the way. And well, sometimes that's also useful to extensively document uh, some changes uh, before before we uh, we send a pull request or we send a patch uh, to the for, for the documentation subsystem. And, and this extensive document is is added, right? And it is taken as as something official. So in the case of uh, we were doing, or we we have been doing uh, replacement of. Uh, zero length and one element arrays with flexible arrays. Um, in the case of the zero, zero length arrays, those are fair, fair, very big mechanical changes. So however, at the beginning, when we were trying to land those changes, well, people were, were asking, OK, but what's the point of replacing, uh, of sending this one line patch uh, and replacing this zero length, I mean, just removing the zero from the from the array declaration. I mean, that's the same, the structure, uh, the size of the structure containing this array uh, is the same. So what's the point? We don't want your, your patches, right? So we had to come up with this huge document uh, with all the explanation of the history behind one element arrays, the history behind zero length uh, arrays, and, and how uh, now, uh, in recent times, in C99, well, a new form of, of uh, 
dynamically sized array uh, was included in, in the C standard, which is uh, the flexible arrays. So well, before uh, we, we needed to to, uh, to have a place to, to place all that documentation, right? In the process of adding this documentation to uh, to, to the official uh, to the official documents, and then something happened. Uh, I mean, I learned I learned uh, my, my lesson the hard way. Uh, I had this experience uh, with Linux when I was recently a maintainer, and I had like uh, this. Superpowers to sample requests to Linux. Uh, I was, I, I guess, I, I implemented like uh, 20 of those uh, fairly simple replacements of, one of zero length arrays with flexible arrays. So there I was with this one line code change and this 100 line commit log, right? And I was sending these patches uh, everywhere, right? So those patches were supposed to land at the same time in the same subsystem. So I didn't see a problem with that. I wanted people to have the complete explanation of what this changed, what was needed. <laughs> so then, well, of course, uh, at the beginning, those patches were completely ignored. So I had the idea, the idea that I was going to gather all those patches, and, as, and I was going to create this amazing pull request to Linux, and I was going to impress him, right? And well, yeah, I sent the pull request, and Actually, this is not the answer that I received. I received another kind of answer, but this is like a, like a nice one. <laughs> and well, the, the problem is that, yeah, Linus actually merged my, my, my pull request, but he merely noticed that he now had like a, this 2,000 line log, right? And he was pissed off and, and he decided to, uh, well, to just get rid of my pull request. And, but well, the thing is that sometimes some maintainers really actually want to know everything, every possible thing that you can add to, to the commit log, they want to read it, right? And that happens to be the case of, uh, of Dave Miller. Is Dave here? Where is, where is Dave? No, he's not here? Hey, Dave. <laughs> yeah, well, I found this on Twitter um, and well, Apparently, at some point, uh, they wanted to, to, to know what you had for, for breakfast, yeah, right, in, in your commit log. And when, when I read that, that, that actually may, made sense to me because, because, yeah, I mean, if you are receiving, you are working on something, and then this other person come out of nowhere and is trying to modify your code, uh, you, should, you should actually have, like, a, the whole explanation of, of why this, cha this change is needed, right? So that's totally fine to me, I mean. I'm, I'm totally okay with that, but well, apparently Linux doesn't care what you had for breakfast outside of that. <laughs> but thanks, Dave. Okay, anyways, uh, coverity. Well, coverity is not actually f uh, for, for hardening the Linux kernel. However, this is the way how I started uh, my career in the, in the, in the kernel community. And I particularly consider this tool an amazing tool for newcomers. I mean, there are different kinds of newcomers, right? So newcomers that already have professional experience working in the C language will find it fairly easy to, uh, to start contributing to the kernel if they take a look at the, uh, at the scans that Coverity provides. So, well, just... Uh, quickly, uh, the name of the project is Linux Next Weekly. However, Case runs daily builds. So in a daily basis, a new build is uploaded and you have this daily scan, this daily coverity scan. Uh, why we still, wh what the project still have this name? Uh, well, the issue with that is when we contacted the coverity people, they told us, well, you already, uh, we, we already gave you a project, we're already uh, scanning uh, the Linux next project, so we don't we don't want to have duplicated projects. So deal with it. So and that's it. So well, it's called Linux Next Weekly Scan, but it's actually a daily scan of, of Linux Next. And well, a little bit about Coxinel. Coxinel, we use Coxinel a lot, and it's it's an amazing tool. However, it's not not that magical. I mean. It is really helpful to find, uh, if we already know what we are looking for, and we already know that this, uh, this pattern, this idiom is buggy, and we want to find every instance, every possible instance in the whole code base, well, 
we could write a fairly simple and small uh, uh, code signal script, and we can find all the instances. The actual work is to, to go and, and take a look at every piece of code and determine what is going on, right? And if you actually can, can change that code or, or, or not. And here are some examples of, uh, of code signal scripts we, we use. I mean, this is a, a fairly simple and small uh, script. And it helped me to, uh, well, to get rid of all the remaining uh, zero length arrays we had in the code base after we already had audited tons and tons of instances of this issue. Another example, another script is this one. Um, this one actually, uh, actually, uh, well, for those of you that are familiar with the stock size, um, we are we are trying to find uh, all these instances of code that fall into uh, these possible scenarios, right? So, at first, we wanted to find that pattern, that idiom that is so popular in the Linux kernel when, when you want to uh, to get the size uh, of a structure that contains a flexible array within, and you actually want to calculate the total size for for uh, for the allocation of dynamic memory. Uh, that can be buggy, so we wanted to find all the instances of that of the of that piece of code, and look at it and and evaluate if we could actually change it, uh, and instead using the stroke size helper. So this is the script that uh, if you run this script, it will find all the all the remaining uh, instances of this of this issue. So it's a simple script. It's not that convoluted, and is is quite usable. Okay, now another tool we we, we regularly use is the services of the kernel test robot. Mm, this is supported by Intel and well the results are usually within 24 hours and whenever we are implementing complex changes that actually need to uh, uh, actually need to be built tested in across multiple platforms and multiple multiple configurations uh, something that I usually do is to add uh, Build tested by tag with a link, with a public link to the results of, of the kernel test robot. So, if you if you send an email to to the robot, well, you can ask for your tree to be included, right? And, and it can be build tested. Yeah. Just a question. 
So I was just wondering if you knew or not. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, well, as as Steve was saying, yeah, you can you can ask uh, the the admins of, uh, of this project, and well, they can they can make uh, the results publicly available. So so yeah, you can you can be able to include a link and and, uh, and, and, and maintainers can see the results, right? Um, this is uh, uh, an email saying that uh, well, the build was successful, and just to um, just to explain a little bit. Well, it tests uh, if it tells across multiple arcs and configurations, and in this side you can see the results from Clang. These are from GCC. These are from Clang. This is recently. Uh, in the past, we only had um, um, results for uh, with Clang and x86 only. Now we uh, we have a lot more uh, architectures. And well, we have some. Uh, you want to hang out? Oh, well, those are the the IRC channels we use. Uh, we we regularly. You can contact us uh, in both the Linux gardening and and build uh, clan and clan build Linux. Um, libera, libera chat. Yeah. In and, and yeah, and that's that's the wiki. Okay, well, now let's talk a little bit. What what does it take to harden the kernel? Well, really? <laughs> okay, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, I mean, as I was saying at the beginning, um, one thing is to uh, to have a, a downstream clone of the Linux kernel and do whatever you want with it and do as you please and implement these convoluted and complex uh, security features or security hardening uh, stuff. And other thing and completely, completely different scenario is to try to land those changes upstream. It's, uh, it adds orders of magnitude uh, of work to, to the same task. And, and well, usually, uh, when when people talk uh, talk about security and software, uh, there is usually this this fantasy that uh, uh, I, I mean that, that people that do security stuff are some kind of uh, superior minds or rock stars or whatever. But actually, it's not that glamorous when when you are uh, trying to land like uh, hundreds of uh, of patches that people usually see with disregard. And that's something I'm going to expand a little bit uh, later on. And, and well, actually taking a look at the code and finding these 4,000 instances. I mean, we recently enabled uh, implicit fall through for Clang. And originally, we had 40,000 40, warnings. So we had to go through all the 40,000 warnings and try to see if we could uh, place a break or we could place a, a, a fall through marking. Some people, uh, some people usually uh, send us an email and say, well, that's so silly. Why don't you address with that with a coxing script? And yeah, but it's not that simple. I mean, we have, we, when we were doing this, uh, this work, the implicit fall through work for GCC, we found actual bugs in the code. So we can, we can just do that. We can just do a mechanical change, and that's it. I mean, that would be uh, counterproductive for uh, the credibility of the project. So we actually had to do the job. And well, along the way, we have to develop some strategies. I mean, in order to be successful uh, in the Linux kernel, in the upstream Linux kernel, you have to develop some strategies if you want to land a lot of patches, right? If you have this big goal, and, and you need to do a lot of cleanups and you need to do a lot of uh, uh, mechanical changes, somehow you have to persuade people, somehow you have to convince people that that small and simple change is actually needed, even if they consider that a little bit of a burden. And, well, that implies uh, doing a little bit of political work, right? I mean, 
persuasion, trying to convince people, trying to uh, uh, be being very careful on how we interact with people. Um, there are certain people in like everywhere, right? Like in every community, that well, they usually respond like uh, not in a nice manner. Uh, yeah, they I don't know. Certainly, there are, there are people that you read the email and just you don't want to meet this person at a conference. Yeah, and, and, and usually the, the problem with this is that we need to get the job done. We cannot just reply the same they reply to us. We need to be careful, even when we, when, when we sometimes bite our tongues, right? And that's, that's not actually right. I mean, it, it shouldn't be that way. And well, the same as to convince people, to talk to people. And of course, uh, there are some people that are very supportive. I mean, uh, at the beginning, when we were uh, trying out these strategies on how to land uh, apparently trivial changes that no, nobody wanted, uh, well, we found great support, particularly from, from Dave. Uh, he was taking a lot of patches uh, for the implicit fall through work. And that's how we actually managed to, to advance and to make some progress and to prove other people that, well, you know, we have done this work, so we are about to enable this, this, this option, so please help us. And well, as I was saying, we want to avoid friction. Friction is, I mean, uh, we need to be a little bit smarter, right? Uh, these goals are big. These goals are important. Uh, usually, we tend to see like uh, computers can be exploited, computers can be attacked, right? It's, it's fun and cool to uh, run and exploit on this computer, on this device, yeah. But however, what, not, what is not that common to realize is that uh, persons are, people are actually, uh, in danger of, of actual attack through computers, right? So at the end of the day, ultimately, uh, that's what, what is at, uh, at stake, right? The security, uh, the security of, of people, right? Well, I want to uh, expand a little bit on enabling compiler options. Uh, recently, the strategy, one of the most successful strategies, and at the same time, complicated strategies that we have been following to improve the security of the kernel is to try to enable important compiler options. Well, recently uh, we managed to enable a rebounds. In, well, it's, it's complex, right? It's uh, usually, in some cases, there are some compiler options that people decide to disable because, well, they see a lot of warnings, right? And they don't want to work on them, they don't want to take a look. They don't want to. They, they don't want to determine whether what they are seeing is an actual bug or is a false positive. Uh, the thing with that is that some of those warnings and some of those false positives usually lead us to to find corner cases in the code, in corner cases in the compiler. So it's not that uncommon that along the way we we find some bugs for GCC or, or for Clang. And that, that creates impact. I mean, if we uh, manage to fix a bug in the kernel and at the same time manage to fix the compiler at the same time, well, it means that a lot of other projects are going to be benefited from that, right? So I think that's, that's great. And well, of course, while trying to enable compiler options, we we run into this 99-1 rule, right? Like, uh, yeah, uh, in order to uh, in order to get to the point, in order to get to get to that one percent where you are actually able to innovate, where you are actually able to implement this uh, amazing uh, amazing thing that maybe is going to make the headlines. Well, first, the 90 percent of the time, you need to uh, complete small middle steps along the way, right? and deal with a lot of people that don't want to see your code and don't want just cha your changes, right? So yeah, 
it's a lot of work, 90% of the time is frustrating at times, or most of the time. <laughs> but at the end of the day, that work, that 90% of, uh, uh, of work allows for trying to implement more, uh, more ambitious things, right? And it's important, and it's something that it has to be done, and that usually nobody wants to do, because it's hard. OK, well, now. Uh, Let's talk a little bit quickly, because I'm running out of time, about some work in progress. Well, uh, Stroke Group is a, is a recent uh, API that uh, Case, together with Kate Packer, uh, implemented. Uh, we are working on some flexible array transformations, and we are still addressing array bounds, because even when we enabled this option, uh, it was enabled for GCC 11. However, uh, in the recent release of GCC 12, uh, well, apparently they improved uh, their bounds checking stuff, and well, now we got like a 150 new warnings. And well, main CPI, uh, the hardening on main CPI. Okay, it's group, quickly. Okay, uh, usually, um, the, the, well, the true group is supposed to be used uh, to wrap adjacent members uh, in the same structure that somehow uh, are going to be accessed, are going to be uh, some data is going to copy into them uh, using mem CPI, mem, mem, mem copy, or mem set uh, at once, right? So the problem with that is that, well, you are actually uh, crossing the boundaries of objects. So we want to avoid that. So in this case, if you have to do that, that's totally fine as long as you uh, use a Stroop group. And what the Stroop group does, and I'm going to, to show a little bit. Well, uh, wha what it does is um, it, it inside it has an anonymous union with a couple of uh, structures. Those structures say share the same memory layout. One of them is named, and the other one is uh, anonymous. Why? Because if you want, you actually need to copy data across multiple members in the same structure. Well, now you can use the name of a structure instead of using the first object and just telling the, the, the just writing code to write past that object, right? So you just use the name of the structure and then you can actually copy data into the whole thing, and you are not going to get any warning from uh, from MemCPI or, or MemSet. Yeah, well, the reason for that, uh, well, the flexibility of the language is, is a whole thing. Uh, we can have our, like a, a whole conversation talking about the flexibility of the C language and why the flexibility of the, of the C language is one of the most important features of the C language and is, if not the most important feature and why the, the language is, has been so successful. But at the same time, the flexibility of the C language is uh, its uh, Achilles heel uh, because, well, C, one of the guiding principles of C is uh, to trust the programmer. And that's a mistake. <laughs> and the other guiding principle is to provide the developer with whatever it needs, whatever they need, in order to get the job done, right? So if you want to cross across, if you want to, uh, to store data across boundaries, yeah, sure, if you need that, that's okay. But that's actually not. Okay, well, um, the reason for, for, the, for the warnings was because uh, Fortify Source is now uh, had an update uh, like a year ago. And well, now uh, internally, Fortify Source uses this uh, compiler's building object size, right? And what it does is, well, it has two, two options. Uh, if you use uh, building object size with a pointer uh, to the object, and zero, you are going to uh, to get all the size of the of the whole structure in which this object is contained, right? And if you use object building object size uh, with, with 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 an argument of, of one, well, you are going to get actually the boundaries of that object only, right? So that allows for uh, hardening the bounds checking of objects. Well, you can see more details of that commit. And, well, 
this is actually an example. Uh, if you see there, uh, we are trying to access uh, the member array, and, we, and if we use the zero as an argument, we are going to get, as a result, uh, 22 bytes, which is what we have from array to the end of the structure. But if we use uh, the array in uh, one as an argument, we only are going to get the size of that object, and that's what we want. And, w and, and then, well, when, we, when you try to do this, when you try to cross across boundaries, well, you are going to get a compiler error. And well, yeah, this is what I was talking about, the internals of uh, a struct group, the anonymous union with an anonymous uh, a structure, a structure and a name uh, structure. Okay, these are uh, some examples of, uh, of the use of a stroke size on the field. So there, uh, originally, I don't know, you, ca can you see, can you see the code in red? Is it's clear to you? Or do you have uh, problems? No, right? I cannot see it. <laughs> okay, anyways, well, the problem is that um, here in red is a main set, and that main set is trying to uh, uh, to set to zero uh, from all the thing entries in Mac objects, right? And that's an error, that, uh, that triggers an error. And now, if you use uh, the struct group, you are creating, you are, you are naming, uh, you are enclosing entries, entries in Mac within this new sectors structure. And now you can access sector, and that's totally fine. Now, we don't get a warning because we know you, you want to do that, right? And well, before the stroke group, this is how we used to do things before having this uh, new uh, this new API. Well, we basically uh, were copying directly the, the structures when possible. And this is another way where we were trying to address these issues. Well, instead of, of, of having an, omni an anonymous structure to, together with a named structure, we created, we, uh, we, we, we just added this new structure and the problem with that is that the code, uh, well, becomes a little bit verbose, and it's not, it's not, uh, it's not the base, it's not the best solution. And well, these are uh, some uh, um, APIs related to a stroke group. We ha we can have attributes, and we can have uh, we can have tags. Okay, now flexible array transformations. Um, well, uh, there is a. Um, Historically, um, there are some cases in which, well, we need to use a trailing array in, in, in a structure, and that trailing array, we need it to be uh, of variable, or dynamically variable size, right? So some tricks were used, right? The ancient way of doing that is, uh, is when with a one element array, which is actually, which is valid C, but, uh, well, it's, it's been abused. And the old way, the more recent, uh, one of the more recently than, than more recent that, that the one element array is to use a zero length array. That's uh, actually not valid C, but it's a GNU extension. So uh, now the modern way uh, that was added in C99 is a flexible array member, which is uh, an array uh, uh, just with an, with an empty, empty size. Okay, well, as I was saying, uh, one element, uh, zero, uh, zero element array, which actually it, it is, that is wrong, it should say zero length array, uh, is a GNU extension, and one element array was basically a hack. And well, now zero element arrays and uh, zero length arrays and one element arrays are deprecated. Uh, that's, the, that's the link where you can see why they are deprecated. And well, those transformations are, are tricky. And I have introduced bugs, and fortunately, I, I found them like uh, months before when I fixed them. And well, this is usually how uh, um, the use of uh, one element array looks like. I'm going to go quickly because I'm running out of time, right? Yeah, I have a lot of information. Anyways, we can talk a little bit more about this later on. Okay, yeah, this is how uh, we usually implement a flexible array now. Uh, now, with the new, with the hardening of MEMCPI, the use of flex or the flexible array structure is not longer needed because, well, 
Mency Pi uh, is helping us with that. I'm sorry. Um, and well, now it, it turns out that uh, we realize that uh, the compilers were treating all trailing arrays as flexible arrays. So it doesn't matter if we have a flexible array, an actual flexible array, or we, we have an array of size 100. Uh, the compiler, uh, the compilers, GCC and Clang, uh, treat that as a flexible array. So in the case when we, uh, when we updated uh, Fortify source, that becomes a problem because now we actually, uh, the compiler tells us that it doesn't know what's the actual size of a sized trailing array, which is a problem. Okay, uh, on, on array bounds, well, yeah, they were, uh, the, the compiler option was enabled for, G, for GCC 11. Now in GCC 12, we have uh, 153 new warnings that we are addressing now. That's the, that's the issue on the poke tracker. You want to help us with this? And of course, uh, this uh, uh, enabling this option uh, has allowed us to find bugs. This is just a short list. Uh, and there is a link of a discussion that Case was having with, with some some person and um, well other work um, well finally well we are making some progress uh, by fixing uh, string operations overflows uh, we enable implicit full through for clan we had 40,000 uh, warnings of this that's crazy um, and well we recently enabled cast function type actually Steven uh, helped us to uh, fix the last uh, problems so we we managed to enable that option. Um, I want to reflect quickly a little bit on, on hardening MemCPI and the compound effect. Well, this is a simplification of the hardening of MemCPI. Uh, just to illustrate uh, which, which part of the code is where, uh, where we catch the, 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 the errors at compile time and where we catch them at runtime. This was only possible because over three years, maybe more, we have been replacing one element arrays and, and zero length arrays with flexible arrays, and we have been addressing every uh, array bounds warning that we found. And it doesn't matter to us if that warning is in test code or in old code that nobody uses. If we need to fix that, and that's uh, in the way, uh, if that gets in the way, and we need to fix that in order to enable a compiler option, we need to address any issue. So. Uh, for us, it doesn't matter actually uh, the, the origin of that code, right? Or where, or where that code lives. That, that um, if it's in the kernel, we have to fix it and we make uh, everything possible to fix it. How you can help? Well, doing flexible array transformations, of course. It's, there is an issue there, so you can take a look. And, uh, and actually, in that issue, uh, you, you're going to find a list of uh, hundreds of, of patches, so you are, going to you are going to find hundreds of examples of how to do this work. Um, and well, of course, uh, you can help us to audit instances where we can replace the stroke size, uh, use a stroke group, and the size, uh, size T saturating helpers. Uh, so yeah, take a look at the, at the issue tracker. We have issues for everybody. Yeah, this is just uh, an explanation on some things that you have paid attention with doing uh, flexible array transformations. So yeah, just take a look uh, at the uses of size of when you use a size of on the container structure. Also take a look uh, on the uses of size of on the, on the actual uh, type of the array. And usually when one element arrays, you are going to find that, that pattern, uh, the n uh, minus one, which means that you are subtracting something from the, uh, from uh, in the calculation. That should be changed to end because differently to what, uh, to, to a zero length array or a flexible array, if you include a one element array in a structure, it affects the size of the structure. So it affects the size of the structure uh, by the size of the of one element of the type of the array, which doesn't happen for, uh, uh, doesn't happen for uh, zero length arrays or flexible arrays. Okay, so we need to verify 
that the, the, the calculation of the size for the allocation is uh, con som somewhat consistent uh, with the um, within the w w with the iteration uh, over the array, right? So we have to look for places where we iterate over the array and make sure that we are not out of boundaries, comparing uh, the actual size of the allocation. So, anyways, if you or anyone seeing this presentation out there uh, want to give it a try, just uh, CC me and uh, I can review the patch. And well. These are just examples of one of array transformations. Conclusions, quickly. Okay, well, um, what would be the best outcome? Well, the best outcome would be to, of course, eliminate classes of bugs and methods of exploitation, right? That's the ultimate goal. That's the big goal we have. And uh, we are steady and slowly making progress towards that. Uh, political work, we have been doing some political work. We have persuading people, we have talking to people, we have uh, convincing people. Uh, at times, we have, uh, I don't know, it, it say confront people uh, in person, asking them, okay, why are you not taking these patches? Well, they tell us, well, you know, I am deliberately ignoring your patches. The issue with that is that we have to understand that we all are part of a community. And it's totally okay for Every uh, every small group in the within the community to have their own opinions is fine, but at the end of the day, if you see, uh, if you are seeing that the community is speaking, well, you have to comply. Um, unless you have a really, 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 really a strong uh, uh, argument, right? Anyways, you comply. Okay, and well, a committed time. Yeah, we are making progress slowly and steady. And uh, every small patch uh, is important, even if, it, if, in, if, if, the, if the task is, uh, is small, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is simple to implement. It's usually, uh, it demands a lot of work, it demands a lot of time, it's exhausting, it's time consuming, but it's worth it. And well, we hope that uh, the work we have been doing uh, during these years, we have been doing this work like, a, well, it's, it, it was created in 2015, I joined in 2017, well, it has like seven years now. Well, we actually hope that all the work we have been doing uh, benefits new people, because new people is important. Uh, again, there is this uh, wrong narrative around new people and newcomers. <sighs> we, need, we need new people, we need newcomers, right? And we need to understand what I said before. There are different kinds of newcomers, different types of new people. Maybe we, ha we have to find those, those, those new people that are useful for the, for the project, right? Um, well, yeah, another thing to mention is that uh, at the end of the day, the kernel is useful for billions of people, right? And a lot of companies uh, make profit out of, out of the kernel. And well, those companies need to consider funding some efforts on improving the security of the kernel. It's not glamorous stuff, of course, but it's absolutely needed. There is a link uh, down there uh, of a blog post from Case Cook, so it's interesting to read. And with that, thank you. No time, co no time for questions. Oh, yeah, OK. Uh, I might just ask real quick when you been telling me this whole time that you have not enough work to do and you're looking for more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get out of the <laughs> um, Believe it or not, the likely unlikely tracer that I have, that's, I, you know, I like to run it and every December I'll set my machine to turn on, there's a likely unlikely uh, profiler actually. It tells you all the places that there's a like, likely code, you know, the for branches and it tells you how much they're right, they're wrong. Mm -hmm. And as not, like I do a lot of places where they're not right. I mean, it's like 100% incorrect, so yeah. unlikely, which causes slowdowns and stuff like that. Yeah. But there's a few times where I brought this up, um, and the, the author said, wait a minute, this code should never be hit. And they actually found bugs in the code because of, by the likely unlikely, they thought something that they thought was supposed to be done wasn't being done, <laughs> and they actually fixed the code to solve that. So I was like saying, if you know, like this might be for newcomers too. I could run, I run every Wednesday, like I said, December, I run the thing, find it, but I just haven't had time to analyze it. I always tell people who do look at it, don't just finally say, oh, the unlikely, unlikely is wrong, 
wrong, or, or it's, it's exactly. always wrong. Yeah. You can't do that. You have to have a reason why. Some, there's a, sometimes there's legitimate reasons why it's always wrong. Yeah. Uh, so you, you actually have to find out why. And once you find out why, you see if there's a bug and say, I don't understand. Why is this always wrong? And basically ask. So that's just another one thing you might want to yeah, think absolutely. about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can send me an email with that. Okay. Please. Hi. You mentioned coccinelle transformations uh, in your talk. I was wondering, if you do a coccinelle transformation, fix all instances of it, how are you preventing the same pattern from being introduced again in future patches? Well, yeah, th that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a whole problem because actually there are, uh, there are a number of uh, scripts uh, in the Opsin kernel, coccinelle uh, scripts, that are fine actual, actual bugs, but we need people to run them. The problem with that is always that uh, there are a lot of false positives too, right? So that's a problem. Uh, with with the static analyzers in general, that's the main that's the main issue, and that's why we need actual people to spend the time and to take a look and to take the time uh, of, of reviewing all those all those uh, all those errors or warnings that you might get, right? All those all, all the reports of all those instances of code. Yeah, that's a problem. I mean, we need we need people to run it. I mean, every now and then, I, I do it. At the beginning, when I started doing this work, I, I was doing that regularly. And I found uh, some, some, some important cases. Actually, due to uh, one of the scripts I run that is actually in the Linux kernel, we found this tautological compare uh, problem that then was fixed in Clank like uh, uh, three years ago. And that same that same pattern was found in the in the compiler itself, and, mm -hmm. and yeah, and, and we and we somehow helped to fix an issue in the compiler, and now we have an option, uh, thanks to that coccinelle script, thanks to that thanks to that finding, we have we have this new uh, tautological compare option in Clang, and actually I like a couple of weeks ago or almost a month, I filed an, a bug for GCC for the same problem. Because I noticed that they actually they don't they, they, they are failing to find that same bug. So the idea is after you fix all instances using Coxinel, you want a compiler warning for the same pattern for future reference. In some cases, mm -hmm. yeah, when, when when possible, right? That that that's ideal. That's the that's awesome. That's great. I mean, but that's that not happens regularly, but it does happen. Uh, so I've done very, very similar work in the past, and I think uh, what I also kind of consider a bug fix, if you audit code and find out that the code is correct, but you still you have hours figuring it, figuring it out, the bug fix would be to add a comment explaining why it is correct. But I found out that getting such patches at stream is totally part of the, you, you totally enter the uh, non-glamorous uh, po political work because it's th they are even harder to get upstream. But I think for me, for my vision, that's also a bug fix because it saves other people. You spend hours and I, I don't want to see that wasted. So I, uh, and I want to see that wasted. So uh, I think adding a command, so yes, it is co it's complicated code, but it's correct. It's, uh, I think that's also worth adding. Yeah, and for that we need we need new people. I mean, th there is something that uh, I have heard Greg saying at some point. Sometimes people with blind ambitions is really useful. I mean, they are going to spend time taking a look at the code. That's how I actually started. Okay, thank you.
conference happened, I said I'd give a technical talk. I didn't want to give a managerial procedural talk. Uh, a number of things have happened since then, so I have to give another managerial talk. Uh, but here's a cool, your cool technical tip of the day. Uh, this is my build server running right now. It's actually at a load of, oh, it's pretty low. It's only 400. Um, but it's a cool tool called BTOP, and it's slow. Anyway, it can handle stuff like that. Just a neat thing. Never mind. Um, so if you have to manage large numbers of systems that work heavy under load, use BTOP. It was originally written in Bash. Think of that. Bash talk. Um, okay, my talk. Cool. Okay. Let's talk about trust. Not rust, trust. I don't want to talk about rust. That's in a couple years from now. There is trust in rust. I um, first off, this is me. I'm speaking for myself, my personal opinion. Hopefully I can convince you of the same, but it doesn't reflect anybody else. All right, so let's start with this. Um, this is the old idea, like Linus's old talk, with all, enough, bugs, enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. Transfer that to real world. The real world issue is, and I'm going to show how, I'm going to, I'm going to try and prove this, that with open source software is more trustworthy than closed source. And it's actually hopefully not an argument anymore. People still like making that argument. Um, and this is the reason. You can audit it at any time by anyone. And that's really important. And also, you can fix, it can be fixed by anyone. And you can do this, and you can also, I'll talk about later, you can go backwards in time. And backwards in time is very powerful. I'll point out um, a number of years ago, Juniper Networks um, networking appliances were found to have um, bugs. And those bugs were supposedly planted there by random developers working for other agencies. Um, but a lot of questions a lot of people came up with was, what other problems were there in those systems? What other problems did those developers add? Because they're closed source, nobody ever knows. With open source, you can go back in time and figure that out because fixes are public, fixes are trackable, fixes are traceable by people. You can track who did what. Metadata is actually out there. So here's what happened. This, is a, this, talk, this conference is great. I have to give a new talk every year, and the best thing is I can give it once and then never have to give it again. So this is the last time I want to talk about this topic. <laughs> Hopefully. So I'm going to talk about what happened in the past. Um, it was well documented. I'll give you a pointer to the report. And then what has happened since then, because this hasn't stopped. So in the beginning, 2018, 2020, um, various small fixes were coming from this university. Uh, this turns out to be the university that is my boss's alumni. <laughs> Um, and there's also alumni of um, a number of kernel developers have gone to the school. So this isn't, yeah, okay, there we go, Kevin. Um, this isn't unique to this school. This is unique to a number of people at that school. Um, this isn't systemic for that. Oh, and please heckle and ask questions during this. So it's more fun that way. So a lot of patches were coming. Many were submitted. Many were accepted. Nobody really cared. Um, what happened that brought this to people's attention is they started sending some patches that were called hypocrite commits. Because during the previous amount of time, the professor who was submitting patches realized that a lot of his submissions were being rejected. And they were being rejected properly because they were wrong. But it turns out also a lot of things that were being accepted were wrong. So he came up with the idea like, oh, let's talk about how you can submit a, an incorrect patch knowingly. And what you can do about that. They came up with the idea to write a paper about it. Um, they tried to create patches that were wrong and submit them. They um, submitted four of them. Actually, they submitted five. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and one was accepted because it was correct. <laughs> These guys tried, and they documented in their paper, here's this really cool, tricky way to write a patch that's wrong, and it's doing the wrong thing, and nobody's going to catch it. Ha-ha. It turned out it was correct. That leads you to suspect a few things behind the people behind this, these patches. And I'll talk about that, too. Um, this was published. This paper was pre-released. 
Um, it came up to a number of peoples. Um, I want to call out Sarah Jamie Lewis for calling it to our attention. A number of people got in this room probably got emailed about this, saying, hey, there's this paper being submitted. It's been accepted by IEEE. Um, they were researching on you guys without you knowing it. And in the real world, you're not supposed to, well, in the nice world, you're not supposed to research on people without them knowing about it. There's ethical issues about that. Anthropolo anthropologists have known about this for years. Political scientists have known about this for years. Um, for some reason, computer scientists don't think of us as people. Ah, we're people. Um, so they, um, people complained about this. The it looked like the researchers backtracked and said, oh yes, we really did have approval um, by our internal review board. Um, we gave an exception about it. That's one point that's never actually been clarified. Universities never clarify whether they really did ex go through the review. And that's up to them. That's their own processes. That's an academic issue. And then they are issued a clarification to IEEE saying, yes, all is good. We knew about this, yada, yada, yada. Um, all was fine. The kernel community, we didn't care about it, whatever. We saw that the commits went, never got accepted. Um, didn't think anything of it. Six months later, and that's a couple months later, they started sending more patches because they went off and did something else. Um, bad pun, sorry. Um, a number of us saw this and said, what is going on? These are obviously wrong commits. Are they trying to do this again but actually using their real name? Um, I called him out on this, said, please stop sending this stuff. It was wrong. Um, don't, main, don't research on us. You already wrote one paper. Don't keep doing more. Um, they said, no, 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 no. This has nothing to do with you guys. We're just sending out patches and, oh, yeah, maybe they are wrong. Okay, that's not very nice. I say, stop. Please stop. Let's all figure this out. We can audit everything. Please calm down. And then all hell broke. I admit uh, I took it to Twitter, which I shouldn't have, <laughs> but it worked. I mean, I wanted to call attention to the fact that you shouldn't research on us. We are people. We have feelings. Um, there are legal and ethical issues involved here. Please don't do this. People actually care about Linux. They use Linux. So I start reviewing everything. I had 10 interns at the time. I let them loose on this stuff. They were so happy to do this. Really, they did a great job. Um, and we said, let's review everything. Case Cook got involved and said, let's go even further back in time and review really everything. Uh, um, David Wheeler from Linux Foundation is a really well-known security researcher. He's a teacher, I think, at John Hopkins, said, this is bad. This is you, people should not be researching on, try on open source projects. They should not be purposefully introducing bugs, if that's what they're doing, they should not be doing this. And then the academics got involved, and they were just so pissed. Um, but the lawyer, oh, then the lawyers, I did not do this, the lawyers wrote a letter <laughs> to the University of Minnesota and said, we want to know everything you really did, document it all. We're working in public, document everything. You need to withdraw your paper, this is not ethical. You need to ensure everything that you do going forward is okay and it's been approved and you need to ensure that you don't experiment on people without them knowing it. This is the lawyers getting involved. Um, it's fun when the lawyers are on your side. Um, the university published an open letter, we're all so sorry we didn't mean to do this, and then they withdraw the paper a few days later, hours before IEEE was about to reject it. The IEEE people were pissed because they accepted a paper that it turns out was wrong. These researchers lied in their paper about what they were doing, they lied about how they did it, and they even lied that they got patches in or they submitted things that were wrong. They were right. <laughs> um, do not mess with academic uh, paper boards. These guys know how to get back at you. Um, so they were about to reject it. I was on some mailing lists, or some internal mails from them. It was fun to just watch them sit back and do it. Uh, but the university withdrew it um, just before it was published before they were about to reject it. I probably was pissed that they didn't get to it sooner. <laughs> but um, then they did. Um, they withdrew the paper on that date. They responded to our comments. They said everything's going to be fine. We will 
we will work on training our facility our faculty we'll do it next year and this year we're so sorry we're gonna get on doing this stuff um, in the meantime we've been auditing all these stuff I ripped out a whole bunch of patches reverted them fixed them properly everything went on it was good and then case cook and me and the technical advisory board published a detailed report there's a link to it and it's I mean for some trivial patches this had the most words written ever <laughs> about trivial patches um, but it's cool it, it's good it's we prove that you can go back in time you can find everything that came from a particular entity and then some because we found things that people didn't even realize um, and audit them again and see what's wrong with them see if it's good see if it's bad see if it's correct and we did that and in the summary of this paper this research or this report um, we reviewed, <laughs> reviewed 439 or 35 patches. Some people in this room helped out a lot. Uh, thank you very much. 95 people overall helped out, uh, which was amazing. Uh, thank you for taking your time to do this. It wasn't fun. But was, think of it as just a patch review test. <laughs> a number of us took these patches in the first place. <laughs> um, we confirmed that everything that they intentionally submitted as bad were rejected. Um, that was good. And the one patch that was accepted, we did remove it because it was submitted under a fake name. And we do not knowingly take patches from anonymous people, from people with fake names. We can unknowingly accidentally do it if you make a fake name, but we do not knowingly. That's against our legal rules of the kernel, the developer's certificate of origin. We say you can't do that. So we ripped it out. Um, it was a dumb, it was a print, it was a debug print message. Um, it turns out the huge majority of the patches they submitted were correct. But um, the overall, these patches were really, really bad. Um, 25 of these had to already been fixed by other commits. 39 of them needed new fixes. So overall, the percentage of these, of accepted patches, were about 20%. And if you look at our numbers, I'll give us the numbers later, this is really, really high for bad work. Um, the reason these were accepted mostly is because of where these were submitted for. These were submitted for um, really obscure drivers. Famously, the, the Sega Dreamcast CD-ROM player module knit code error handling path that nobody's ever hit. The patch um, would leak resources <laughs> if this fix went in. These fixes went in. It was a lot of cleanup paths. They were cleaning up error message error recovery paths that are never hit in the first place, obviously, because nobody has a Sega Dreamcast CD-ROM player. And they were, I mean, a maintainer sees these, like, okay, yeah, that looks correct. Because you have to unwind, you have to see more context in this stuff. So they were submitting cleanup patches that were not really cleaning up and were actually causing more problems. But because they were never hit, they didn't really actually cause the problems. None of those 400 and some patches actually were anything that anybody has ever run in the real world. So we were good. We're all, all is calm. We're all happy. But again, 20% of this, this is a really, really high rate of error. Um, we're incorrect. Um, a number of people who saw this and saw the errors that they were submitting, I think there's, I don't remember who said it. I know, I think Alviro said it. Um, maybe somebody else. It sounds like something Al had said is, you are creating something that, if we didn't know better, was intentionally malicious because you're maliciously submitting something that looks correct but is wrong. And um, it's really, really hard to detect if you're just not that smart or if you're malicious. I mean, there's this famous quote, right? <laughs> um, I err towards the stupidity here. <laughs> um, others claim the malicious side of this. Um, either way, it doesn't matter, it's wrong, and we need to fix this. Um, what, what is nice is that it showed a problem or a potential problem that people thought we had, that we handled it really well. We recovered, we audited, we proved that this was okay, um, because this has been a theoretical attack vector for a long time. I know Ted So has talked about this for like 20 years. Um, yeah, I don't know. People can argue whether this was intentionally malicious or not. I, I'll get, stay out of that argument. Um, one interesting thing is, and again, the university never has really addressed this, they intentionally did an illegal thing in their paper. And this is what really made IEEE mad. 
because they agreed to a legal document, a legal statement with a fake identity. That's not very ethical. Um, the ethics of people who do anthropology and other things like that are really up in arms about that. I'll let the academics argue that. But that's why the lawyers got involved. And that's why the lawyers at the university got mad too. But that's up to them. So let's talk about the patches. Um, these are links to the patches on patchwork, or on lore, in case dug them all out. This one was valid. <laughs> um, and they claimed it was invalid. This one is why some of us err towards the side of the stupidity, not maliciousness. <laughs> um, because these developers obviously don't understand some basic C functional programming issues and how the kernel works. You can look at the patch yourself um, to see that it really is a valid commit. Um, but it shows that you, the people involved did not understand the basics of how drivers work, um, which is kind of interesting. Second commit was, um, this was funny. <laughs> so my talk in 2019 was about how CVEs suck here at this conference. Spawned a whole talk, I point people at it all, wonder why. This, a patch based on that talk, was the forefront of that talk about how bad it was and what it caused us to do and yada, yada, yada. It was the center of that talk. They duplicated that, talk, that same patch and sent it to me, <laughs> expecting I would accept this. Um, they picked the wrong thing to do. <laughs> um, they tried to create a patch that I had seen in the past, that I wrote a talk about. Um, again, malicious, maybe not, I, not the smart. I instantly rejected it just based on the fact of why are you trying to send me the same crap again. Um, this is where things that really made me mad and why academics should be concerned. Um, the maintainer quickly recognized this was wrong. And then they started offering suggestions because as maintainers, we want to help you out. We want to help new developers out. We want to help you along. And so you can become a productive member of our community. We take our time out of our, out of our own time to help you out. We teach. We want to lecture. We want to encourage. We want to educate. This maintainer did that. They took a lot of time. They tried to explain the problem. They tried to help them out. They tried to do this. And as academics, the university should also recognize that that's a valid thing to do. You want to teach. You want to help. You want to do that stuff. You don't waste your teacher's time and energy and efforts. And these guys did that. The maintainer was completely ignored. And all that effort and time that he took was a couple hours, thinking back and forth, was dropped on the floor. On the on the reason that somebody was trying to do a research paper. Academics should really care about that. The IEEE was really mad about this because those were academics, they're researchers, they're teachers, they want to see people do better, they don't want to have their time wasted. That's what made a lot of people mad. Fourth patch, this wasn't that bad. Um, at least the, pr the maintainer instantly caught it. The person wrote back saying, so sorry, and disappeared. Um, Again, wasted maintainer time. They offered a number of possible solutions. Didn't care about it. And then there was a fifth patch. It turns out that the developer who was writing this paper forgot how they set up their computer <laughs> and sent out what they thought was a real fix, and they sent it under the fake name. <laughs> they thought they meant to send it under their real name because they were trying to do something. Um, that was really funny. They didn't mean to send out a bad patch. It was incorrect based on the developer's work. They didn't mean to send a patch from an invalid person. They did because they forgot how they configured Git. Uh, fun thing, here was the name that they used. Uh, so the names they used were this and then another very common name that was pretty obvious. Um, anyway, that's why. It, it was pretty funny that somebody sent it out like that, that way. Um, so in summary, we caught it all. Everything was caught by maintainers. We did a good job. Our development model, people can claim, yay, it works. We do good stuff. Um, this whole issue that they submitted stuff that was rejected and caught was totally and completely ignored by the paper. The main thesis of the paper is here how you submit things that can slip by people, and <laughs> that's not what actually happened. Again, that's what really pissed off the triple IEEE people, because what actually happened in their experiment was not what they documented was going to happen in their experiment. And they kind of weasel around a little bit, but the, their summary of why they did all this work 
was actually proven wrong by the real world experiment. Um, so, yay, our development model works, right? We got lucky. These were very um, incompetent attempts to do this. Um, I feel we got lucky. Um, but something I'll talk a little bit interesting about something. Um, we trust our developers, and we trust our developers a lot. And that's good. And a lot of people were worried that why are we trusting developers? And they outs people outside our community was like, we should change the way we trust our developers. And I'll argue that the way we trust things are good. So anyway, let's talk about the timeline again. Keep things kept going on. The university met with me and Case and the Linux Foundation people. Said we're going to try and fix this. We're going to do better. We're so sorry. IEEE published a great statement how they violated the ethical guidelines. What's going to be put in place to ever stop this again? IEEE has gone above and beyond and changed their rules and changed their things that they require. The people who submit papers have to attest to and whatnot. They're doing a great job. IEEE is doing really good here. Um, they actually respond to our report. They said everything you did here was correct. We, um, they also identified one set of patches that we missed, which actually happened to be rejected anyway. <laughs> um, again, malicious or not, but you decide. And then they unequivocally state that they have not submitted anything to Linux or any other open source project. Because like Kubernetes came to me, uh, another, a number of other open source projects came to me and said, wait, are they researching on us too? Are they submitted problems here? The university said, no, this is only this one group over here. We can't tell our professors what to do. They went off and did this, but it was only in Linux. Well, no. Okay, so we reverted, ripped everything out. Everything got cleaned up, 513, ripped them out of all the stable kernels, fixed them all up. Everything is good. Everything is calm. Um, we should forget about it. Last year, all is good, right? That was the last that anybody really heard of it. But no. Um, the professor behind all this emailed me and Case. Actually, I think emailed Case. My filters, I think, might have been blocking them. Case copied me again. And asked, basically said, hey, can we start sending patches again? We want to do some other. We're doing some tool. We want to send some patches. Can we do this? And I thought that was a little odd, thinking that the university took care of this, wouldn't take care of this, wouldn't handle this. We both say no. Um, we said no nicely. We said, don't you really think you know what you're doing? Please go talk to the university. Don't do this. Like, okay. All is good. They came back. This time I did not go to Twitter. Because <laughs> I, I wanted to figure out what's going on. A uh, number of developers, myself and a few people, maybe in this room, email me saying, what's going on? They're sending crappy patches again. Have they learned? Have they done anything? And I said, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's happening. So luckily, I happen to have the email address of the head of computer science at the university now and their lawyers. And I told them, you agreed to do this. You agreed to set all this stuff in place. But what is going on? You're doing it again. Um, they, I could, the um, administration was very upset, but <laughs> I mean, it is easier to ask forgiveness than permission, I guess. Um, they claimed ignorance. They're like, "Way hey, you never actually published your research or guidelines that you said you were going to do, and oh, we never got around to it. We never talked to our professors. We never set anything in place. Gave a whole bunch of other valid excuses. I mean, it's tough running an organization, COVID, um, remote learning, not remote learning. Anyway, they said, we're so sorry. Okay. So researcher guidelines. So part of this work was that came out of this was Case said, let's write a document that explains how you can research on us. Because we want to work with a lot of researchers. One reason I moved to Paris a number of years ago was to work with Julia and the group at the university there because there's a lot of good academic work that applies in research that applies to the kernel. We want to have these interactions. The University of Am in Amsterdam, I work with them as well. They found like the row hammer, the spectrum meltdown issues. We want to work together. Um, Real-time work has come from universities. 
But let's set some guidelines for people to know how to work with researchers, how researchers can work with the community. So we can also say, see, you violated our rules. Don't do that. Because <laughs> sometimes people need to be told that they messed up. So Case came up with a great document. Julia, I don't think she's here, helped out with that. A number of other people helped out with that. Um, it's in the kernel now. There's a link to it. We expect you're acting in good faith. We default to, okay, you're doing good. If we were to default to the other way around, it wouldn't be a good development model. Um, you can research on all the passive data out there. Go mine our mailing list. Wonderful. We don't care about that. That's public data. But active research on us to try and do get us to poke us and see how we respond, don't do that. We have to be told that you're going to do that. That's fine. I mean, I get about one email a week saying, please talk to us about this research study or things like that. I, base, they, I think they just troll the mailing list, um, which is good. I want to see good research stuff, but it has to be opt-in. And um, when you submit a patch and you're based on researchers, you need to have all this information in it. Because these people are submitting patches that basically said, fix the bug. Um, we want to know why this stuff. So you'll see a number of us maintainers now push back on, I found a bug based on a tool, and that's all they were say. We want to know more. We want to know how this was found. When was it found? Why is it correct? And actually, this is a good thing that all bug fixes should have in their change log. Like you said, David said, put more information in your change log. These are all great things to have it in there for any bug fix, not just researchers. But researchers, please do this. The most interesting thing is, how can you actually find this problem? Have you actually hit this problem? Have you tested the fix? Because a lot of all these fixes that these people were submitting, and you'll see a number of other bug fixers submitting stuff lately, are things that they have obviously never tested. Because again, it was for the Sega Dreamcast CD-ROM player module and it probe. Um, do we care about that really? Probably not. We should delete that driver. But tell me about that. Test that. And show me that you've tested that to prove it. We're going to put another barrier. Prove that you tested this and it works. That's all maintainers should push back on that. Unless it's obvious and you feel that I should take it. And what commit this fixed? Because we want to track. We want to track history and be able to track things over time. So that was good. So that happened in May, April. Finally, one of the reasons, one of the things the university said is we're going to take bring in a uh, kernel developer from your community and help us fix it. Somebody instantly volunteered who happens to live in the town. Uh, he has a core kernel developer. He's been around for a long time. I trust him. And um, they finally <laughs> contacted him again because he had reached out in the beginning, and he's gone in and is starting to help them out. It looks like he might actually teach a class, which would be cool. Um, and they're going to work on that from there. Um, I think he's going to teach a class on how to work with open source communities. <laughs> and he also said he's going to teach a C basics class. <laughs> so that's it. I don't want to talk about this number again. But the interesting thing is you could prove that with an open source body of code, you can work back in time and see what happened. You can audit code based on new information. Because we went back a long time in history to find out all these commits, see the history of this professor and his graduate students, see what happened there. Oh, and I feel sorry for the graduate students. They didn't really know what they were doing. I put the full blame on the professor. They should know that. But you can go back in time. So our so open source projects, you can go back in time and look. We have Git history, we have pre-Git history. Other projects have all this stuff. This is good. This shows that you can trust the project, and you should be able to trust Linux because of that. So let's talk about trust. Big term. Should you trust Linux? Should you trust open source stuff? And the first thing that comes to a lot of our minds is no, fuck no. Um, who cares? Um, you're not forcing, we're not forcing you to use our tools. We're not forcing you to use our programs. In fact, we warranty in the license of our project says you don't trust that. We, we're, dis we're disclaiming trust for anything. No warranty whatsoever. Yay. We can go do what we want. Doesn't really work that way. <laughs> um, so let's talk about this. So other people instantly um, came up with their ideas of you must have uh, verification. You must verify all the developers to know who they are. So closed source verifies knows we know who contributes to our code base because we've hired them, we've vetted them, yada, yada, yada. 
I point out the Jupiter issue, and people like wave that away. Uh, <laughs> these are people who are actually paid, vetted by Juniper. Jupiter. Um, you must verify, and all the developers. And I say, great. How would you do that for Linux? Here's the development model for Linux, right? I've given this slide for 15 years, 20 years. Developers, developer file data. This is how our developer works. This is for 2021. 4,600 developers, right? 1,600 maintainers, 350 different subsystem trees. Linus, Andrew, and Linux Next get merged together daily. Email, email, get trees, yada, yada, yada. How are you going to verify 4,600 people from different countries all around the world, different organizations? How are you going to do that? Um, some people, I ask who you work for if you show up in the kernel log, and I don't have an email address. Um, my most famous response was, I work for company X, Y, and Z, uh, this company X. Um, I am in charge of our kernel people. We have a policy that we're not allowing all any of our engineers to contribute to open source. I happen to be the manager of the team, and I submit this patch <laughs> under my own name. Um, <laughs> there's somebody, there's some cognitive dissidence there um, who didn't want to know, the world to know who he worked for because he was in charge of the policy that said he couldn't let his company contribute to open source, but he was contributing to open source. I took his fix. It was great. <laughs> so how are you going to do 4,600 developers? That's impossible. Everybody says, OK, I guess you really can't do that. So let's turn around and see how do we trust that these changes are good. What do we do today? We talked about yesterday the um, kernel CI and the testing efforts. Um, talked about the zero day bot. And these things are good. So last year, we had almost 80,000 commits. These are commits that have been accepted. I, I give the argument. Um, we only take about one third of the patches that have been take, sent to us. I was talking to Alexi, and he says he's only taking one quarter of the patches it takes. It takes four times to submit a patch before he takes it. Um, so there's a huge number of quantity of out there that's much larger than this. So when you start showing these numbers to people who say, we must put in place a verification of all your developers and every commit that they've had, I'm like, great, where's the, where do I point the fire hose to? And they give up. But let's look at this. So we have that many commits. We're fixing a lot of bugs. We said 17% of all the commits that we submitted last year that were accepted had a fix this tag. So they fixed this other commit over there. So it looks like it's kind of close to the, the university's failure rate, right, <laughs> overall. Um, and, but this is all the commits that happened after they were in a tree. Because these were uh, things that were happened after they were in a tree or a local tree. Um, it doesn't matter. It would have been deleted. So these were found after they had a subsystem tree. So we went back and looked at and dug it out. And it turns out we're fixing a lot of things before they ever hit a final tree, which is good. Made me feel a little bit better. <laughs> um, so of last year, 26% of the fixes were for the kernel release that hadn't been released yet. So every you know two-week two week merge window, release candidate, release candidate, release candidate. We should be submitting bug fixes only in there. Note that not all subsystems actually tag fixes. There's some subsystems, some file systems that are notorious, and they never say they have ever fixed a bug because they never wrote a bug in the past. <laughs> there's some file systems that you should not run. Um, anyway, those developers are working on that. Um, so that's not that bad. So overall, we fixed 12% of all, 12% of all the commits that went in the tree were for previous fixes. Now, that wasn't for the previous year. They're for the previous years behind that, all 25, 30 years. So it's not that bad of a rate. It's better. Overall, we're better than the university. So they were actually writing code that was twice as worse as a normal kernel developer. Um, so who's doing this? Who's writing all the bugs in the kernel? Because we can track this, right? We have data. We can passively look at our data according to our research rules. Let's see. So last year. No, no, this is, this is the developers. These are the people who wrote all the commits, right? These were not bug fixes. Well, maybe they were. Um, this is top 20 people went to the tree. Um, some of them are in this room. Developers, this is all the work that happened that last year um, out of those 80,000 commits. Again, like Christoph only wrote 1% of all commits. Lee wrote 1%. Um, good stuff. So who wrote all the fixes? Some of the same people. <laughs> Some of the same people are fixing other things, which is cool. So 
So um, people are writing fixes or fixing of other things. And um, that's good. So how about who they're writing the fixes for? <laughs> the French, this was fun. It took three native French speakers to find the right word for this. Um, I, I don't want to call people out. I think that there's eight of these 10 people, including somebody on stage right now, that are on that list. <laughs> and that's to be expected. If you look at who writes the most number of bugs, it's the people that write the most code. So are we going to say that our top 10 developers, top 20 long-term developers, should not be writing code? Do we not trust them? You want to trust the top five people there. <laughs> um, you do trust those people. Percentage of what? Of those people? Well, some people, I mean, one problem is, and I had to rule this out, like everybody marks things previous to Git as addressable that Linus caused the bug. <laughs> um, he didn't cause the bug. Um, I, I didn't go back. You, uh, you can mine Git. It's, it's really simple to do this stuff. It took a bash script, and I was running it yesterday. Some people saw me running it. Um, so the goal is, the most I like saying, I've written a ton of security bugs. I've written a ton of security holes. There's an infamous Red Hat bug that I wrote that caused all RHEL servers to be insecure because they didn't take the stable kernel updates where I fixed it. <laughs> um, but I didn't even realize it was a security hole. Do you not trust me? Um, I don't trust me. I don't trust you. I don't trust myself. We don't trust ourselves to write good code because we're human. Everybody gets things wrong at times. Everybody is stupid at times. Right? It's hard to tell stupid from maliciousness. So let's take and not trust anybody. So let's make it easy to find and fix these bugs. And we've been doing that. For the past number of years, we've been doing it and making it easy to find and fix these bugs. The zero day runs on the mailing list submissions. This is the best thing ever from a maintainer's point of view. Because if I see zero day respond to a patch, like it broke something, it causes a problem, I just instantly delete it and move on. This is before it ever hits a tree. Zero day is awesome there. I'm so happy about that. Once it hits a tree, kernel CI runs on a bunch of our maintainer trees, on almost all the subsystem trees. Get a report back saying it submitted a whole bunch of stuff. Zero day runs again on that thing and finds problems. And then people start submitting patches that say fixes based on this commit because we don't rebase our trees. Things start happening. We run more tests. And then when they hit Linus's tree, when they hit um, next, we run even more tests. Zero day, there's a number of builds and the number of tests that are run, I'm not sure on some of these. Kernel CI isn't publishing how many tests they run yet. Do we run tests in Kernel CI yet? We do. I, I couldn't find the number. Anyway, um, I think you're running about 200 on one of my last reports, 202 different builds and boots on different systems, which is awesome. Uh, Lunaro's OKFT, I made fun of it a long time ago, but it's come up and it's doing really, really well. It's run like over 90,000 different tests on daily on Linus's tree, on Linux's next. Uh, it's doing this stuff. We're finding the bugs and we're fixing them because of this. Gunter runs on every RC, 151 different architectures. He boots QEMU for almost 500 different architectures, which is amazing that QEMU handles that many. And again, on the stable releases, when I do stable releases, Kernel CI is doing it. Uh, LKFT, Gunter, Shua, Android sending me responses. The Android tests, they're not public, but they send me private emails. A number of companies send me private emails based on um, the RC releases or based on stable releases. Huawei is publicly doing it. NVIDIA is publicly doing it. Debian and Fedora are doing a great job and publicly sending me bug fixes saying, does these things, many, many others. And these are tests for fixes that have already been in Linus's tree. And we're finding bugs again. So the goal is to find as many bugs as we can find, fix, or as many as we can find because we're all stupid. We all write bugs. All the core people write bugs because we're human. Let's find them, fix it, move it on, and not blame anybody. Because we're all, we're all foolish. Again, I wrote a great RHEL, RHEL security hole. Um, so the old mantra, trust but verify. For the kernel, it's trust but test. And I'd argue that those bugs that those people submitted, it would be proven from that paper that they never actually tested those. 
Because if they had tested those, we would have seen that the very tool that they were saying found these problems would have triggered the fact that they didn't solve the problem. And we could have seen that. And they didn't show that proof. So test. So if you are a maintainer, you get patches, and you're curious about how they found the bug, push back. See if it, is, if it isn't obvious that it's there. Prove it. And because we have this big, huge development model, I've talked about this in the past, as a maintainer, we have to trust the people underneath us. This is a web of trust. Linus trusts David and Stephen and people to send in patches. He isn't reviewing it all. We trust the people sending us stuff. There's people who send me changes like Johan and Alan Stern and other people that I will just blindly take because I trust them. I trust them not that they got it right, but I trust that they will fix it when they get it wrong. And this is the Linux development model, trust model. And this is what our community has been doing for 25, 30 years. I've said it forever. I've never actually written it down. A number of people ask me to write it down. But like Johan and Alan and me, if I get it wrong, I'll fix it. People in this room take pride in their stuff. We all make mistakes. It's not a big deal. We fix it and we move on because we're here to make the project better. People that run away aren't going to fix it. So this is why it's hard to get core changes into the kernel in some spots because then it puts the responsibility on the maintainer. But for things that are obvious, this is our model. And this is something that the outside community doesn't seem to understand, that we, everybody gets things wrong. And the whole thing that we can do better is to fix it and move on. So thanks. I did it on time. Nobody heckled. Ah, nobody heckled. Come on. Questions? Yeah, Lily. Um, when you say trust but verify, I would say uh, trust the intent. And uh, uh, what I mean by this is the also the reason why I also ask people to describe their intent in a commit message. Yes. Because in practice, we, we are all wrong from time to time. Yeah. And uh, the best way to detect a bug is that the code does not match uh, what was described in the commit message. Yes, very, very true. Describe what you're doing. If, it, if it, as a reviewer, if you see that this doesn't match the text above, well, then that's something. Something's wrong. Push back. Anyway, David in the back. Real, real quick, one quick, and then jump ahead. <laughs> no, <again>. David's <laughs> first. Oh, really? Okay. okay, well, no. I can try it, then we can go through here. Ready? Walk, it, walk, it, walk your question back. Walk, walk your question back. Talk oh, it. Oh, jeez, you're making me nervous. <laughs> I want to throw it. No, no, I mean, ask your question as you walk backwards. I know, but I want to throw no. it. <laughs> okay, no, no, it's not really a question, but one thing I want to state real quick, I'll go on the way, is it's not the fact that just it's trust. Trust takes a bit to build, but I also tell people it's very easily to lose it. It's very easy to lose it. Like and that's actually a fear, I think, at least for me. Like, I make sure I'm always up front with Linus. And like, when I do something that I know Linus may not like, the first thing I put in my change request is what I just did that he does not like. I, I let mean, him know it right up in front. So I mean, we all make mistakes. You know, I all do stupid things. We've all had the email saying, what the hell are you doing? I've, I've written that to other people. And that's fine. Call, call, be call, being called out and doing something wrong is, is part of review. It's part of development. It's part of being human. Another thing that's pretty cool is that like we have a whole bunch of pre-checks and patchwork that like not only check that it builds, but that you know the, the commit message is formatted properly. There's a proper fixes tag there and everything, and it's all things are did away before I even wake up in the morning. And yeah, it's, it's it's the best feeling ever, right? <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Uh, Oop. Yes, maybe this is going to be a kind of political question, but have you ever considered uh, a, a system, a mechanism like Web of Trust to, uh, as for example, Debian developers do to uh, identify all the um, developers and maintainers among themselves? Uh, so we have this. So I, people, a lot of people don't know, and I didn't want to go into this more. We have a Web of Trust today. I submit patches to public mailing lists that are actually signed with my key. 
Our tools check that. You can know that this was sent by me. We have a developer, Linux kernel developer, GPG, ring of trust that anybody can download and see that we've signed each other's keys and we've done that. We did that in order to reconstruct the, the kernel.org infrastructure. It's public to other people and see. You can verify that based on our signed tags that we're sending to Linus, who you are. I verify that you, when you're sending me patches, a pull request, I do that as a sign tag. We have that web of trust there today. I don't want to go into that, but it's there. And we use it and we rely on it. Our tools automatically check it. It's awesome. D4 can automatically check that this patch came from me, came from Kevin, came from anybody. Set it up. Constantine's made it trivial to set up and work. Every patch that I send out using git send mail, it's hooked into git send mail. Works great. What would you answer to people who argue that uh, it's easier to find and exploit uh, bugs or uh, zero days in uh, open source software than in closed source software? I, I don't think so, but um, I've never figured out what to answer to people who say that. So it's just as easy to find it both ways. You can reverse engineer binaries trivially. Um, as proof of this, sometimes, I was talking to them this morning, the kernel security team will get, here's a binary that we captured on the wire that looks like it's a security exploit. Figure out what it is. Some people on the security team is like, okay, great. Yeah, here's this binary. We can figure out what it does. We know how it's doing this, so we can go from there. Reverse engineering software is trivial. Reverse engineering hardware is trivial. Hardware is supposedly closed source, right? People decap chips and see how they're working all the time. People reverse engineer microcode. It's, that is a low barrier for entry. Open source is better and easier to find bugs, it's also easier to fix them. Because again, anybody can fix bugs. Go back in time and do that. We all have bugs, all software has bugs. Our software has been independently audited that open source software has less bugs than closed source software. That's actually research is out there. You can point them at that research. But finding new stuff, it's easy. People look at how many bugs are found in Windows. They have the patch Tuesday, right? We have a patch weekly, <laughs> so it's the same. Willie, up here. Oh. Uh, I, I would say that it's uh, much harder to, ins to insert a malicious uh, code in open source uh, than in proprietary code without being discovered. It's because much in a small team, you can consider that probably you put your bug and nobody will look at this code. But when you know that the whole world can look at it, even if the probability is low, uh, it's very hard to remain undiscovered for a very long time. Yeah, so Jason, who did WireGuard and lives here in Paris, famously said, I'm terrified when I send out pa patches on a mailing list. Um, just because it's my name, it's going to be out there forever, so I do my best work. I never had that, he never has that feeling when you're checking code into an internal repository, you sometimes trade off, hey, you, you review my code, you plus two it, I'll plus two yours. Publicly, it's a lot it more It should scary. be like us and consider that the whole world already takes in for stupid, and that's all. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we all write bugs. Writing bugs is, is normal, it, but fixing them is good. Cool. Hey, ended on time. All right, thank you very much.
hear me? Jamat, who is the mic? Okay. Tell me when it's uh, when it's ready. What? Like this? Okay. Interesting. 
so, but this is one realistic chance. Also, the project cannot run on no MMU machines, but probably will in the future. Already has some no MMU features, but it's not complete. So, for the moment, it's not there yet, but it's part of the plans. As I said, it's not ready for production use, lacks uh, several features, storage, networking. So, that's why it's still educational. It's a toy, maybe a nice toy. <laughs> why the binary compatibility with Linux? Uh, well, first of all, it's so cool to be able to test the same bits on both the operating systems. Like, it excited me, this idea, from the beginning. Um, uh, also, uh, it, it can be useful for testing, for, uh, you know, robustness, because uh, when you write software, if you, if you write both the parts of an interface, you're somehow maybe biased a little bit, because you know what can be done, what can, what can't. So if you run instead software that has never been written for this operating system, uh, it's a good thing to be able to make it run. Of course, it didn't run a lot of software on the first time, but I made it work, you know, after some debugging, so I thought. Also, I didn't want to design a new Cisco interface from scratch, uh, you know, mm, mm, it didn't make much sense to me. Like, unless uh, either, either we design something completely new, innovative, something super fancy, or the other choice was to, to stuck with uh, a compatibility with a known operating system like Linux, uh, because it's a more practical choice. What's the point of making something that's 90% compatible with Linux, but not exactly, like maybe a little bit polished, but, and then what? It's uh, like it's a non-trivial uh, advantage of being binary compatible, at least to me. I, I do performance measurements, I run the same tests both on Linux and Tilk, so I can do some real comparison. And didn't want to implement a custom libc, uh, and also I wanted to use um, the pre-built toolchains, since I discovered toolchains.botlin.com, like I was super happy, and become like uh, this whole thing, the toolchain, the, the Cisco interface, it, it became a good idea for me to uh, to use already stuff made for Linux. Tools, tool chains, everything. Uh, and I also hope that this choice will somehow uh, increase the interest uh, of the community for this project. Maybe because it's more e easy to port pro uh, pre existing software to it. It will require some effort, but maybe not so much. So, uh, as you can imagine, for a project like that, uh, what what can be the typical goals, like mim uh, minimal memory footprint, ultra low latency, deterministic behavior, extra robustness. Uh, let me point out here that TIL currently can run smoothly with eight megabytes of RAM in a VM, but with some special configuration uh, by dropping some uh, modules at compile time that are not essential. So it, it can be shrink down to three megabytes in total. Like this includes the initial RAM disk with a, a busy box, so it's like depends on what you put on the initial run disk, but overall, like with uh, three megabytes of RAM, it, it can run. So it's like has potential to very small scale applications. And uh, it's very important for me the robustness. I don't claim this Tilk is uh, so robust uh, like Linux or other, you know, mainstream or plus operating systems, but it's one of my goals. Like uh, I, I have a plenty of tests, uh, still not enough. I have. Uh, 69% of code coverage, uh, but the idea is because it's so simple, be able to reach like a hundred percent like coverage, maybe a hundred percent branch coverage, and be like something super reliable that you can, uh, you know, trust uh, your your life uh, on it. Like it's not today, but this is like my my goal because it's it's small. You can uh, here things can be done that in Linux cannot be done because of the legacy stuff that Linux gets to support is uh, it's big it's complicated it are different things here we can cut corners and not support this not support that and support whatever is just convenient uh, and leave leave out the rest and also can have of course custom interfaces and just for the simple stuff it makes sense to be a hundred percent compatible um, and it's very important to to work on real hardware so even if it's uh, uses some legacy stuff, legacy hardware components, it works on modern machines. It's 32 bit, but yeah, it works on this machine, this Dell XPS, it works smoothly on it, and I bet it will work on most of other 2022 laptops. Another thing that, that I wanted to, to mention before, 
before proceeding further, is a um, non-technical aspect of this project. I really care about the developer experience. Um, this is, this came from my personal frustration towards some some projects, my, my personal experience that, uh, you know, oh, how cool is this project? Then I download it and it starts. Oh, I don't know, don't have the right packages. I have to install them. I don't know the list. Or maybe there is a file with a list, but the list is incomplete. So I have to figure out what to do. Uh, sometimes I have to spend hours trying to build something. Not I'm not talking about the best of the best the project. It's not Linux case. Linux is very, very well done. But many projects, you know, I observed, like, there are other projects like mine. Small operating systems are very complicated, you know, to build. And I don't like that. So this is, like, part of uh, the choice of being competitive with Linux and using the Linux toolchains are part of this whole plan to make, like, super easy to build and, and test this project. Even if you know nothing about current development, just... Uh, able to, you know, do simple stuff with the console. I, I'd, be, I'd like to everyone to be able to at least compile it and test it and maybe some, imagine some students, some students just go there and write a print K. Why not? You don't have to understand everything and to be a super, you know, senior engineer in order to just build a project and test it. So if for senior engineers, of course, it's a way to save time. Like in five minutes, you, you run a script and that's it. So uh, that's the hardest part now. <laughs> A live demo because I believe a demo is worth and more, more than a thousand words. Uh, I was already too long with <laughs> the, the initial part. Um, so uh, let me let me show you something here. So how it starts? I don't know if is the text is the font good enough? The size? Okay. So once you uh, clone the the tilts repo. You're supposed to run this script here. That will uh, that will automatically uh, check all the packages that you have to uh, that are required on the system to be installed, and and then generate eventually a command like sudo apt install uh, if and run it for you to to install those packages automatically. If none of them are required, no, it, it won't run sudo. And this doesn't work just for Debian, Ubuntu, or those uh, distros, but it works for other distros as well, like Fedora, OpenSUSE, Arc Linux, and all their clones. Uh, so if necessary, I would want to eventually extend this list with other distros as well. It has to be super simple. After this step, the, this tool uh, downloads the pre-built tool chain uh, and other packages, like BusyBox, the bare minimum. There are other packages that you can see if you if you run with dash h or dash dash help. As you can see, uh, all, all of them, uh, and all of them are installed. Also, there is a cache. In this case, I'll show you how simple it is to just install the tree command. That's it. So now you can run, and it's installed. So now then you're supposed to run uh, the CMake wrapper script, or you can run just run make, which is just a wrapper for our uh, CMake wrapper script. So it's so convenient to just run make. But in reality, it's CMake. Um, now, OK, we, we're, uh, we're down here. We have, to, we have to enable this package, because uh, having Intel chain doesn't mean it's enabled. It will just rebuild uh, uh, the image. It was very important for me to, to have an incremental build that works very well. So CMake helped me a lot. So uh, I launched the script for, for running it. Now the resolution is low. Uh, I will use, just for the bootloader, this feature here to increment the, uh, the size. Uh, you, can, you can choose a, a different kernel file if you want. You can put m more than one kernel file in the, in the boot partition. You can set the video mode, like in this case, I would say 10. You can edit the uh, command line, like I want a, a Pretty wise. So uh, now I'll just want to reset this to default and then boot and voila. Like that's it. Uh, it boots super fast. As you can see, it detects some stuff. Mostly it does uh, enumeration of PCI devices, uh, initialization, general initialization of the kernel, in, um, uh, enumeration of PCI devices, and full enablement of ACPI. Like the whole five steps are enabled, so it, like it, the machine is in fully ACPI state. This was uh, one of the 
maybe more challenging stuff because I have to implement the whole OSL layer to make ACP ICI work. But it does, and other than that, I don't have a lot of uh, ACPI drivers. But uh, I can, you know, for example, on some machines like this one, if you have the battery object as a control method implemented, you'll see here on the top, uh, next, uh, before the date, uh, you'll see the percent of remaining battery. And on this machine works, for example. Uh, then, you know, the experience is, uh, what to say, similar to any Unix uh, operating system. It's like, of course, it's limited. But you can you can use pipes. You can you can see BusyBox all the siblings. With three, you can just uh, dump. Uh, uh, you you can see the whole flat system. Uh, here in my CFS, I have this ACPI directory, which is very useful for developers mainly to see the whole ACPI namespaces namespace with uh, these extra attributes like type and value and the list of methods where it's available. Uh, it's very useful for me when I move to another machine, see oh, what is available. Instead of writing a ton of, uh, you know, print case statements and reboot the machine, I see everything here. Uh, and in CCFS also there is the PCI devices, just info. I don't have some drivers, but I have the infrastructure necessary for PCI drivers and things like that. And then I have config that are compile time, you know, options. CCFS supports al also runtime editing of uh, options, but I try to keep that to the minimum the moment there is no CCFS uh, options that are editable at runtime because this is not an operating system like Linux, uh, like FreeBSD, that it's meant to be booted on a machine and then stay there for um, a long time and then have users customize it. Uh, like, no. Like, there is an option, for example, to not make the cursor blinking. It can be made absolutely at runtime, but it's not for this. This is like. Uh, I, anyway, you don't even need a console for this. The console and everything else is just for developers. The rest is, if in the future becomes production ready, you'll just have a serial console, something like the bare minimum. So all these options doesn't make sense to have a lot of complexity to, to configure at runtime. Um, so still, I have plenty of features that are implemented for for myself, for other developers, and because. Um, it's cool. Like part of my effort was also to uh, to show the stability of project through ways that are, you know, a little bit indirect. Like for example, VI works, and I was pretty happy with this result. This is like a minimal VI implementation of um, a busy box. But uh, people say, uh, people say to me, "Oh, but this is not the whole thing. It's not Vim. You don't have syntax highlighting. You don't have this and that." Uh, and I say. Well, this is like a small operating system for embedded. No, yeah, but it will be so cool. All right. So <laughs> I spent some extra time <laughs> and I make Vim to work. Let me show you. First, I have to, to put it in the image. I'll put another thing as well. Now you'll see the boot will be uh, slower because it will have to load plenty of stuff in memory. But it's exactly the same thing. Here we are. And after maybe two months of work, I don't know, I implemented a ton of stuff and you see Vim here. We've seen tax highlighting and megabytes of plugins and completely useless stuff. <laughs> completely useless. <laughs> but hey, it works. And it required fixing a ton of stuff, you know. Uh, also implemented uh, Yet, as part of a way to attract contributors and maybe people that are not hardcore kernel developers that but may want to, you know, enter the community and trying to create. Uh, at the moment, it's not existing. Like, I have people that made one line change, but I, I really wish to have some contributors. So I say, well, let's, let's implement the, <laughs> the frame buffer interface. So uh, I already have the frame buffer console. Why, why not support exactly the same interface? If you see here in dev, you know, uh, you can see FB0 it has exactly the same interface as Linux, the newer one, the newest one. So I implemented a, a library that uh, just draws stuff on the screen because it's cool. And then I, I think that was more useful for me. I implemented Tetris <laughs> because it was so cool, like uh, even my wife playing on it. Uh, and it really increased the stability of this kernel. I have a, a smaller machine and I played a lot of Tetris at the beginning. This is 
2018, like this has been working since 2018. And um, it allowed me to, you know, catch some race conditions and things like that. And people can say, it. well, well, this is cool, but you know that there is a frame buffer, uh, there is a um, uh, Doom port for the Linux frame buffer. I mean, why don't you make this run? That will be really impressive. Okay, guys, le let me run down of my uh, embedded system, like. <laughs> Because why not? <laughs> well, and, and I realized that actually my time management uh, wasn't fine. I was trying to cut some corners. I cut too many corners. Uh, so I have to increase the, um, the granularity of the, of the time. Anyway, I have made some very uh, useful changes to make this work. If you have the commercial word file for Doom 1, you can put it. But I didn't want to show this in presentation. But if you put it in the right directory, it will run the real commercial Doom. Not because it's just a map that's different. So yeah, I hope people are happy. <laughs> uh, other things, as you can see here, the virtual console. But this is this is not so impressive. But hey, you have it. And um, then another thing, I wanted to show what helped me uh, support Vim and uh, uh, more complex applications. Um, let me show you here. I have by default a serial console. Uh, by default, on the first serial serial port, you can it automatically tilt runs a, a, a console. So here you can do exactly the, the same stuff, okay? But uh, mm, what is cool that uh, you can you can use it for 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 tracing. So uh, before getting to the tracing, le let me show you here. I implemented a debug panel, um, which is uh, before uh, before um, the time of the, um, uh, uh, the CFS. I implemented this to to see some useful uh, things on on the kernel when I put it on hardware machine because I didn't have GDB. If I put he put here uh, tilk, I don't have you know GDB, and uh, so. I did some, you know, useful stuff here for me, and uh, then I realized that I can extend it and implement a, a syscall tracer. Actually, it was mandatory for Vim uh, because I didn't know Vim didn't work properly because I didn't know all the escape sequences that used. Like I've implemented like 50 or 60 percent of the, of the, maybe 70 percent of the the escape uh, sequences that Linux support. But it wasn't enough to run Vim. It was a disaster. It ran on the serial console, but not on the video console because my console didn't support all that. So what I did, okay, let me implement a syscall tracer. Then you can run like this. You can see the list of uh, processes. You can select a PID. It will trace the PID with all of uh, its children. Then we go here, and then whatever you write, it's like it, it, it traces and and and. Um, how to say the reference uh, pointers and show strings and everything it doesn't uh, work 100% of the cases it's not that that work I don't have the metadata all the functions for every struct every type but it's a fair amount of things that I needed so it's uh, modular I can add more more stuff for example if you have a stat booth here stat booth is just a pointer because I haven't added a code to render it the buffer just uh, uh, writes the raw data in in the ring buffer when you when you trace and then and then there is the, this other component when you run the tracer here to s to extract the data from the ring buffer and see what's going on. So I needed it for for Vim. So now if you if you open Vim, you see how many stuff is uh, how much stuff is going on, and uh, it's, it starts to be uh, unreasonable. So that's why I m I enable the filter. So you can say I just want to to trace. Uh, right and right B. So that's what happens. So that's why that's how I uh, made Vim to work. Uh, it, it it was non-trivial, and I realized that the consoles are more complicated than I uh, wish them to be. Anyway, this works. Uh, now I wanted to to, uh, to spend a few words about testing Tilk. Uh, I have four types of tests. The the first one, the my preferred types of testing is unit tests. I use the Google Test uh, framework. So it's super simple. You can run it like that. It's super fast. Like a plenty of tests. Um, then, of course, not everything can be tested this way. Uh, then I have um, kernel self tests and uh, system tests, which uh, uh, the kernel self tests are run inside the kernel. 
uh, and uh, they're mostly for things like, uh, as you can see here, the full list, for things like uh, condition variables, uh, semaphores, uh, you know, mutexes, uh, locking primitives, uh, synchronization primitives mostly. And then you have all the rest that are uh, runnable with uh, syscalls. And I can run them both from a runner in Python, and then the runner um, runs still with uh, redirection to a C report and reads line by line the, the C report and detects if something goes wrong. And uh, I run this way the tests in the cloud. Um, but I can also I can also run the system tests on on the machine itself. It's very useful when I just reboot the machine. I can, you know, uh, do something like this. So I have a runner from outside and a runner inside just for the um, uh, for the system tests. You can run self tests, but not with a runner. You can run them individually uh, because if one uh, self test crash crashes, the whole kernel is gone. While if the system test crash, nothing will happen, just the child will die. Hopefully, I mean, <laughs> and uh, that's it. And I wasn't satisfied with that. Like, it was good, but it was not enough uh, because there are still some code paths that are not exposed. Which code paths? For example, if you run this in the cloud, okay, you, you have, uh, let me show you here, uh, I run this, all these builds, like run all the tests. Like with three different compilers, I support also the system compiler with uh, an external libc. Even if I use the uh, pre-built toolchain, it's like just uh, the default thing. I support other scenarios. Anyway, um, this was not enough because there are some parts like, for example, what you do when you want to test like um, the actual RQs that come from PS2. Like you have PS2 input. It's not the same thing. One thing is the serial console, the other is the PS2. Uh, so, also the frame buffer console, I mean, it's not the most important thing that you need 100% coverage, like my locator has almost 100% coverage, but still, I wanted to, to increase the coverage and um, do automatic testing. For me, it's very important to have automatic testing. So what I did, I introduced a weird kind of test, I call them um, interactive tests. Correct me, if, if, if you came up with a better name, just tell me, uh, I call them interactive. So what happens is that um, to simulate 100% what happens if you if you use Tilk, I boot it in the graphic mode, okay? And then, because I know exactly the font, I put it with uh, the fixed resolution 800 per 600, I know exactly the font, I wrote a tool that transforms back like an OCR, but it's a perfectly deterministic OCR, transforms back the image to text. And then I check this text against some uh, tests and find some strings to be sure that it works. And I use uh, QABOS monitor with uh, send key. Actually, there is a better interface, but I use this one. Now I'm running a simple test. You can run Vim this way because I thought how you can test like all the code paths that Vim exposes. Well, this way. As you can see, this is like an image. I have the image here. Not all the images are printed on the screen to avoid spam, but you can see here the commands like send L, send S, you know, send space, uh, and so on. And here are the images that actually are deleted, but I made a patch to, to make them keep. And it was tricky to implement because you have to do more than one screenshot, uh, be sure that uh, nothing on the screen changes, and so on. But it was very useful to me because I, I can test more code paths that I could with the other cases. So all the four type of tests are needed. And actually, for a real production test, I'll have to write stress tests and a lot of stuff. But I first like to get 100% coverage and don't have quite the time and the resources to to do all of this by myself. Um, so I believe this is uh, good enough for the live demo. Uh, there are too many, too, too many things to show, but I, I, I believe it's uh, it's worth moving on. So now it's, uh, I believe it, it work, uh, it's worth to talking about some funny stories and interesting challenges. Uh, so let's start with uh, the first one. My latest bug. Like there couldn't be something better than just working with this presentation, working this material. Then I found a bug, like that. Uh, and uh, this bug has two a uh, two char fix. I couldn't find a bug with one char fix, but it's like closer. <laughs> I recently introduced a test for a feature that I have for a long time, but I didn't have a proper test. This test does the following things. Estimates the amount of committed memory that can be used in an empirical way. 
uh, allocates and commit more than half of that memory, then calls fork, then the child tries to commit all of that memory and expects the child to be killed by the kernel. Of course, I know the whole story that uh, the out of memory killer, like I know the whole heuristics, like uh, I don't know everything, but I know it's a complicated task, but this is not Linux, uh, it's like a small embedded system. That's what I wanted. Like for the moment, that's it. Like if you try to commit memory, the process uh, that it's so unlucky that tries to to do that gets killed. And for the moment, it's uh, either zero over commit or infinite over commit. Like I don't have all the, the stuff in between. I can do it, but it's not right now. Anyway, uh, that's the behavior I expect. So it's good, to, even if the behavior is not definitive one, it's good to have for every behavior you expect to have a test. So I found that it felt some real hardware machines. And I always, you know, be, you know, why? Come on, it works perfectly on VMs. Why it has to work on hardware machines? Now I have to do some hard debugging. No, I realized that it fails on VMs too. Why uh, uh, just the VMs use uh, less memory? So if you use more memory, create a bigger VM, it will fail. And that's weird, and I had to debug it. Like it was a few days before departing from here. And as you can see a screenshot, it's uh, doing fine. Like everything's fine, it allocates uh, 262 megabytes of memory while uh, 501 is usable. And then it forks and the child is able to, to commit all of that. And this is like more than half, of, uh, more, um, uh, I'm sorry, more than all the usable memory. This is incredible, it shouldn't be possible. We don't have swap, we don't have anything like here, so it's not possible. And then it fails with uh, kernel panic, and that's weird. Uh, because uh, we're trying to free an object that hasn't been allocated on the heap. So I started debugging my copy and write logic, and I realized that, uh, well, we get here, which is a check where you have um, uh, the, the physical page have uh, a ref count of one. It's the case where you have a, a process, then you fork, you have a child, then the parent dies, and the, the child now can own directly the page instead of, you know, copying it. Uh, so this shouldn't be the case. It, it should never happen, like in this case. And I observed this after a few megabytes in the child. So we commit and then we fork and after a few megabytes in the child, that's we end here. I used some debugging techniques. Anyway, then the last I had a search disabled. <laughs> I enabled them and observed, yep, it's the zero page. We're trying to free the zero page. I believe in the Linux kernel is called empty zero page or zero empty page. Like it took me one hour, one day to, to find it. <laughs> anyway. So I, I continue to investigate to the limit case and realized if you alloc try to um, allocate you know, and commit 255 megabytes, it works. More of that, it doesn't. Can anybody guess why? Here is a hint. Where is the bug? <laughs> Steven? <laughs> okay. No, 16-bit ref count. <laughs> With a 16-bit ref count, what happens is that it, uh, the, the, um, the ref count wraps around after uh, 64k pages. That means that uh, we cannot support more than 256 megabytes uh, of uncommitted memory. Like for me, it was super reasonable at the time to not use more than uh, 16 bits for ref count because it's a small scale, uh, small, uh, small scale uh, operating system. You have like a uh, hundred tasks at most. You you, do, you don't share so many pages. Like it's pointless. I, I like, and these arguments are still true, except one case, the zero page. <laughs> because if you have uh, uh, hundreds of megabytes of memory, the zero page has a very high ref count and we don't, this, don't want this to, to wrap around. Uh, so the fix was trivial. I use U32 and that was the fix. Now, um, um, a stuff that's more interest, I, I'll, I'll try to, to make it in time. Making the frame buffer console fast. And I, I'll show you later what I mean with fast. But uh, first of all, why implementing a frame buffer console? Like, I, as I said, I didn't want to support Doom, Vim. Uh, I didn't want to have even a frame buffer console because why? Well, TextBot is like was died was dead even five years ago, and it's just an x86 thing. So actually, I want to able to test and run my operating system even on Raspberry Pi or on modern Purify machines. I had no choice. I had to implement a frame buffer console. And why speed matters so much? You know, the the guys, uh, part of you that are more expert, you know that 
just mark uh, the solution is to just mark the pages as right combining and that's it. You'll be done, that's it. Uh, that's the problem, that's the solution, and we are done. Yep, but I didn't know about right combining at the time. <laughs> I, I spent like two months, at least I discovered it. So I implemented a series of optimizations. I cannot tell you all about this, the whole story. It's a mess. I don't remember even myself, but what I what I, I'll say a few things about this, about my experiments. So the PS fonts are very simple. You have a bit field, and you just you know for each bit you have to use either the background color or the foreground color. It's trivial. Um, and the simplest draw function, as you can see, you just need a draw pixel and a draw char function that just goes over and draws each, each pixel and checks uh, which color to use. And it was uh, insanely slow. But it was kind of usable on lower resolutions, but in particular this laptop has a retina display, so uh, 3200 by 1800. It took 2.5 milliseconds per char. You know, I, I, it's like you you have s you can see the screen redrawing. It was insane. Why I run Linux here, the frame buffer console, it flies. Like it cannot be like my code is incredibly stupid. I didn't know by like combining. Then I started to do some naive optimizations like this because I was desperate. It didn't work on modern machines, gave some impact on older 32 bit machine, but it's still ridiculous. Then I made a lot of other stupid things like a shadow buffer, N nothing was so good. This was one thing that was interesting, pre-rendering the glyphs, this, this intuition, pre-rendering the glyphs, rendering the glyphs uh, pixel by pixel is too slow. So what about pre-rendering? This was an intuition that has some interesting outcomes. And uh, the problem is that it's unfeasible. Even with small phones, it's totally crazy with bigger phones, like it's, uh, it's a disaster. But what about pre-rendering just the scan lines? Again, a term that I used, but maybe it's not the right one. Uh, it will take just two megabytes. I'll show you what are the scan lines. These things. Like uh, it can work o o also on um, bigger um, bigger fonts. If you if you render all the possible this for it doesn't matter the fonts because there are just two to the power of eight uh, possible scan lines. You render them for all the possible colors and you spend two megabytes of memory. It's a lot, but for a laptop like this, if you have Retina display, maybe it's worth it. That's what I, uh, what I thought. The pre-render code is trivial, just for nested loops. And then the problem number two. It's too slow to copy for bytes at a time. Even if you have everything pre-rendered, how you copy to the frame buffer? I use rep moves, which is too slow. Then somehow I read something, I don't know. I thought about something like a few mem copy. Uh, um, and the cost of that could be, uh, the cost of saving and restoring reg registers can be offset when you, when you, when you scroll. Because uh, if, you, if you don't scroll, uh, you just write, uh, you press one, one char, it doesn't need. But for the whole scrolling, it's too slow. Uh, so implementing the functions, you can see you have a function here that just copies 250 bit, bits in the fastest way possible. If possible, with just two instructions, here we have some checks. I do some hot patching tricks. And as you can see, if you have AVX2, you'll use the, the version uh, above. Otherwise, uh, this one with 128 bi uh, bits. And then the latest one, if you have just 64 bits uh, registers. And actually, it was not bad. Like, almost a six times faster on, on this machine, two times faster on the older one. And almost seven times faster on the native resolution, because we don't have the overhead of scaling. And still, it wasn't fast enough. It's, it was significantly faster, close, you know, to the 8x limit. But still, it's like we're talking about almost 500 microseconds per char, still noticeable. Like, Linux was way faster. And then I was stuck, like, here for, like, maybe a few weeks, two weeks. Then it's called right combining. As you know, like, right combining, you, you, uh, you w once you mark the pages as right combining, uh, the hardware writes uh, the data uh, in a temporary buffer, then releases in burst, and uh, it's great for frame buffers. So what happened that I got, like, without any other effort, 33 times uh, improvement, uh, just 12 uh, and a half percent improvement on the top of that with my optimization. So as you can see, my optimizations are pointless uh, after using uh, write combining. Uh, on the older 32-bit machine with smaller FPU regs, my optimization has no effect. And like the, the whole write combining is, it's like my optimization alone. Like 
uh, as you can see here, my optimization alone uh, was uh, 1.9 times faster. So here, like red combining is a little bit faster than just my optimization, but on the top of that, my optimization gives nothing more. But it's interesting that on the native resolution, when we don't have overhead of rescaling, like it's a hundred times faster with right combining, and my optimization gives a 2.6 times uh, faster on the top of that. So it's like it's something. It's still not uh, super critical, but 2.6 times on the top of like a hundred times is, well, we went from 2,500 microseconds to just 9.55. And it was super interesting now, finally, to compare in a fair way the performance of the Tilk uh, console with the performance of the Linux console. And like the best is uh, 9.55 microseconds and Linux 56.4. I have no idea why is that. Like it's almost six times faster. Guys, I don't know. Like I believe that Linux doesn't have this optimization to prevent any stuff. This is like, it doesn't feel like uh, I think that will exist in Linux, uh, I don't know. Uh, but even without that, with just my failsafe code, just, just uh, those pixels, uh, it, uh, it's like 25 microseconds compared to the 56 in Linux. And I don't know why. It's like an open question for you guys to, I don't know, like I didn't have time to investigate. It's a curious thing. Why? Maybe nobody cares because it even 56 is super fast, fast enough. Just it was a curious thing. Why is that? I don't know. This is like the benchmark code. It just writes some letters on the screen and forces uh, the scrolling to, to happen. And um, I guess I don't have time for much of rest, but you can download the presentation and ch check out, uh, you know, my story about uh, how I tried to, to make uh, Limmuzzle's applications to work. And I wanted to cheat because uh, they required uh, the TLS support, so it meant implementing a separate area. I didn't want to do that. Uh, so I tried to cheat uh, by returning NOCs by returning zero, by returning zero and setting uh, a descriptor number. And here it's, uh, you know, very simple, just the steps of debugging and you'll see that uh, I was uh, punished uh, and I couldn't cheat. Uh, so often we cannot cheat, so I have to implement the whole set rate area and then additional stuff for ref counting of, um, of GDT entries. And then another case, uh, I, I won't go uh, over time, just wanted to say that uh, this uh, case where I had to implement this ACPI OS weight semaphore and uh, I didn't want to cheat because I don't know what ACPI does, uh, uh, God forbid, like it, it wanted an implementation of semaphore that supports uh, weight uh, and signal with uh, N units, not just one, like traditional semaphores. I spent some time implementing this fancy semaphore. I didn't want to do it, but I did because that's what ACPICA wanted. And then how did you guys like how Linux handled this problem? I was too curious that after my implementation, I get, now I can read it because, you know, we have different licenses and I cannot read too much the Linux source code. Well, it didn't. <laughs> like it didn't. Like this is like a piece of the code on Elixir. And uh, sometimes cheating works. Like, <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> if we have time for a question, uh, otherwise. I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Air metal. Yes, it works. Do you want to see it? Yes. Oh, sure. <laughs> Sure, but I, I not sure. I, I have to disconnect this. It's okay. Like I can, I can run it. Yeah, he told me he doesn't have HDMI implemented, so he can't do it. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, I don't have HDMI. <laughs> but uh, I, I have a flash here, so we can actually reboot the machine. Turn it around so we can see. See, well, one second, <laughs> one second. I have to, to press uh, uh, F12 <laughs> repeatedly, <laughs> hoping to not miss it. Yeah. So here we are. Legacy or UFI, what do you prefer? Well, you got to run Doom. <laughs> Sorry? Legacy, yeah. That's Legacy. It took a bit to, to switch the screen resolution. Then you choose the video mode. Do you want the native? 
if you want the native here we are the native is number seven This is the commercial one. Thank you. you uh, so you said that you had to do GD, GDT entry ref counting for TLS, but um, if for 32-bit, I think you can just switch the entries on context switch, right? So I was curious what you meant by ref counting the GDT entries. Okay, uh, so uh, for separate area, uh, they, they use uh, really GDT. I yeah. wanted to say LDT, but uh, that that's was the code that got us. So, okay, GDT is a global thing. Okay, I, I create an entry. You have a max for three entries uh, per uh, process. Why? Because Linux does that. It's, it's not, not documented anywhere, but in Linux is three entries, so in TLC will be three entries. Then uh, you, you call this uh, special wrapper separate area that doesn't have a glibc wrapper anyway, that you request, you know, for TLS request uh, an entry. This way you can use actual segmentation. Um, and then what's the problem? A GT entry has, uh, it, it gets created for, for your process and that's fine. Then you do fork. What happens? That the child now has to access the same thing in the same way. But it's different memory but use copy and write, so the addresses has to be the same. Now the, w what happens? Like you need a ref count because otherwise, if without a ref count, like I had at the beginning, like I had for a few months until I discovered this bug, the, the parent dies and then it frees the, the, the GT entries. And then the child tries to do something with TLS and then it crashes. Mm. <laughs> so you have to, to keep the ref count every time, you know, every time you fork, you have to keep ref count in this global table. I was wondering what's the memory footprint or the minimal memory footprint of TILC? Yes, it, it, uh, I can, I can tell you here it's, um, the kernel with like this full package uses just, uh, one megabyte and 280 kilobytes, but it's like the full thing. If you, if you drop it, I have a tiny kernel option. It can be just a few hundred uh, kilobytes. I don't remember exactly. The point is that like this, it can run on eight megabytes machine, on a VM, maybe even on six megabytes. And if you cut down like fancy things like the frame buffer console and other not uh, super important stuff, you can get up to three megabytes, including uh, 400 kilobytes for BusyBox. So with three megabytes, you can run decently with a zero console and everything. I can probably squeeze it down a little bit, but it makes sense to have a no MMU support. I'd like to make this. Actually, plan to make a x86 no MMU, which is super pointless, but it's good from the <laughs> research point of view. Because once you made it a no MMU, it doesn't matter if it's 86 or ARM, it will be like I have to port it to ARM and then I'll be able to run on the Cortex R processors. So, like 3 megabytes, 2 megabytes of RAM, I believe it's reasonable. I can, won't go much more than that. Uh, we got uh, a question from the stream because there are some people watching online. So yeah. I'm, I'm providing the question for you. Um, is it possible to run this on 32-bit systems like the Intel Quark, uh, Quark SOC? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Is it possible to run what? On 32-bit systems like the Intel Quark SOC. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was an idea. I don't have the hardware, I, so I didn't try it. But yeah, the problem is that hardware is dead. That's the real problem because uh, if the hardware is dead, I don't have a busy way to buy it, but even if I buy it, like, it's dead. But yeah, theoretically, yes. Like, this one, one of the things, what if, like, I wish to have, you know, an embedded 32-bit uh, processor, but all the projects are, are dead at the moment. Intel don't, um, don't want to invest uh, in this direction. Sure, ARM and RISC-V are, are better options, but it should work. Like, it should work, absolutely. It should. Okay. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, uh, I was thinking about your Vim uh, debugging stories, uh, and I was wondering if you had the uh, ptrace support, so you can just use strace for tracing Cisco. No, I don't have uh, the Linux interface for. Yeah, I don't have ptrace at all. Okay. One of the things that uh, actually my friend Steven told me, oh Vlad, don't implement ptrace; it's too complicated. <laughs> no, so I have like a trivial uh, mine interface. 
actually, okay, let, 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 let me be uh, here 100% frank. The debug panel and the tracer running kernel. That's why these yeah. are just developer tools and exposing a whole interface to user space will be complicated. It, the kernel will be, maybe it's better to do it, but it overall increase the complexity. So at the moment, it's everything in the, is done in kernel. This, like the tracer, the debug panel, it runs in kernel. You have just a user process that do a syscall, and then you see this in kernel. And you're supposed to like not use it at all for production systems. And uh, yeah, so the tracer, it's no, you don't have to be traced. I don't, I don't know if I will implement, but do you imagine I already spent some effort implementing the signals? If I, if I have to be 100% competitive with Linux, like it's better to pick up Linux. Linux is great at what it does. Like I want to get corners and cheat whatever I can to implement something super small. Like uh, I have a cut down signal support because the full support of signals is very complicated. This is like one of the other things. Maybe, I don't know. If it's not too complicated, maybe I will support it. But what's the point of debugging with GDP on a machine that it's not a desktop machine? Like you're supposed to test everything like in a different way for embedded systems. I don't know. Maybe this, this project will evolve in a different direction. For example, for to run uh, applications in micro microservices in the cloud. I don't know if it goes that direction, then sure I will uh, go in that direction. I don't know. Like I prefer the embedded direction, but we'll see. It depends a lot on the community as well. Uh, as you can see here, the battery, I'm sorry. It's very small, but you can see here the battery. <laughs> yeah, the battery, the percentage of the battery. Yeah, sorry, couldn't do it on the game. Yes. Um, so I, I, I wonder about you calling Linux, which is of course right. About drivers and driver cores. Do you also uh, like PCI, for example? Is the PCI core very similar to Linux? So you for drivers, or did you do something on your own there? There is, there is a PCI enumeration. It supports PCI Express as well, and that's it. Like you can write a PCI driver, but that's it. Like it's uh, just the beginning. So no, I don't support the Linux interface for drivers. I don't have plenty of ACP drivers myself. Like, no, sorry, this aspect is, I didn't get there yet. I, I believe when I implement the first network driver, I want to implement some network drivers. Then I, I sure start implementing infrastructure, but I don't think it's a good idea to try to support the Linux drivers. It has to be something more limited. I don't know, people mentioned BSD drivers. I don't know, like, I accept suggestions and feedbacks for you guys. Uh, at the moment, it's not there. Just enumeration. You can see everything, but it's limited. Uh, just to follow up on that, do you have any driver model yet? Uh, almost no. It's very limited. Okay, when you walk through uh, the ACPI namespace, ah, here by the way, I can I can show you. But sh show it's a <laughs> it's a big word. I can show you with three the whole ACPI tree of this machine, which is super big. When when the tilt boots. Uh, what happens is that um, it, uh, it has some callbacks, a very naive interface with callbacks, and then then you can you can plug your callbacks like I did with the driver, the battery driver, and then you can you know you can detect you say for this uh, ID of this uh, class device I support uh, I support, but it's very very limited. I have to work a lot on it. Actually, I admit it's like a lot of work to be done. So yeah, it's very basic. Yes. What kind of file systems do you support? Ah, good. Who is asking? Sorry. Yeah. What, what kind uh, of file? Very systems? good question. So um, there is a initram disk which is a FAT32, but it's read only. It's like it's convenient because you put a flash drive in any machine and you will be able to put files and uh, also UFI uses uh, FAT32. It was very convenient. And then you have a custom file system for dev. And uh, the main file system, the root one, is uh, RAMFS. So it supports uh, most of the Unix uh, things, like uh, even file holes. You know that you can skip. You know I have uh, holes in files without having the data. So things it supported, symlinks, but uh, that's it. Like no support for X2. I wanted to support it, but I'm not there yet. You have to implement a disk driver first, and then implement actually, you know, paging. Uh, sorry, page cache things like that, and then support X2. Yeah, sure. It's a to the list. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have to throw this. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So thanks a lot uh, for this presentation. We are.
you're back uh, after lunch at uh, two fifteen, right? Cause you're not resolved in your heart. You're waiting for me to improve right here when I'm lonely I press play swimming in blue after new I'm lonely, I press play Can I get any closer? What a little can I bring to you When I'm lonely, I press play 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4 If you're lonely, press play. Can I get any closer? Can I get closer? What any dog can I bring to you? When I'm lonely, I press play. Cause you're not resolved in your heart. You're waiting for me. Tembo and what he's got to do. But first I'm going back to the co-work road to find the mission and help him with his load. Mr. Tembo's on his way up the hill with only this song to tell you how he feels. Uh. But to get that he will need a help in uh. uh. hand. It's where he is now, but it wasn't what he planned. In Chile, in Chile, we will sing with you. Just like the TV in Mr. Tembo's room. Of the emphatic.
at the morning trying to work out how I got here cause the distance between us is the glamorous cars late night on the shop floor what language was I speaking not sure I remember the thrill I'm for Always in me 
when the photographs you're taking now are taken down again when the heavy clouds that hide the sun have gone the millions of us on the hill from the start to land's end when photographs you're taking now are taken now present this is a precious opportunity be aware of the photographs you are taking now we are flying over black sands in a glass Thank you. 
Il est quelle heure Hello. Uh, some uh, small modification in the uh, the schedule because uh, uh, a speaker is a bit late. So we will have uh, Benjamin first instead of TGLX, and then uh, Ernst de Goethe and TGLX will speak tomorrow. Okay, uh, instead of Ernst de Goethe. All right. Okay. Your turn. So I'm Benjamin Tesfor, I work for Red Hat, I'm also the heat commentator, and I'm going to talk about a thing that uh, is named heat BPF. So first, before you start sending tomatoes or whatnot, uh, this is still work in progress. Uh, currently I'm at the V5 of the series. Uh, the API is mostly designed, but you can just pick up your laptop and try with it, uh, because it's not there yet. Uh, heat BPF is heat plus BPF. Yeah. So the engine would be a little bit of primer about heat, then heat BPF, and then why I'm introducing this, uh, what it is, how you can use it, and finally uh, how it was made. So heat, uh, for those who don't know, it's a plug and play protocol for input devices, and it stands for human interface devices. It's a Windows 95 era protocol for handling plug and play USB devices being mice keyboards. Basically, whenever you bought your brand new Windows 95 computer, uh, you've got your uh, brand new keyboard, and if you have a floppy disk to install on your co computer, it's kind of a problem. So you would like to just plug it, it works. Nowadays, we've got a lot more transport layer on top instead of USB. We've got Bluetooth, Bluetooth Low Emission, I2C, Intel, and AMD sensors also doing stuff. And there is even an SPI driver in progress. And the nice thing is that most devices nowadays are working with generic driver. Yay. How this can be done is because of the key report descriptor. I don't need you to actually read the entire thing. Well, I'll go through it a little bit. But what's important is that the device has a memory in its flash uh, that actually um, tells and teach the host, the computer, uh, its language. So in this particular case, uh, the first few lines we say, okay, this device is a mouse and it's supposed to be a pointer. So you know that you are supposed to map this into a cursor on your screen. And then the first five bits in the report are going to be the buttons. Then we've got three bits of padding, of course, because you always need padding. And then we've got X and Y, and uh, each of those two events are 16 bits. And so on, so on, we will, and so on. The important bit is that this is static. It's stored in every single device, and that's what the host needs to know to be able to understand what the device does. If you're more interested, there are a lot of documentation around. The first one is the device class definition. Last update was in 2001, more than 20 years ago. Uh, it defines all of the operational model that you can have with uh, with a heat device, what you can do to talk to it or retrieve the various descriptors, um, how to report the, the report descriptors, do the requests, and so on and so forth. Anyway, it's a somewhat stable protocol. Okay. On the other hand, you also have the heat usage table, and this is the fast moving target. Last update was in 2021. And this one defines how uh, you map the various usage in the report descriptor. So, for instance, X and Y are defined in uh, 30 and 31X. It is extended continuously by companies. Uh, the most disruptive change were the following ones the multi touch protocol, the universe, universal stylus interface pens, and the hardware sensors. But in most cases, whenever there is an update in this document, we just have to do to add a new hash defined kernel and add a proper mapping. So it's really a small change in the code. Okay. So why did it work? Um, most devices nowadays are working with generic drivers, except for a few. Half of the driver in the current heat subsystem need a fix up in the report descriptor. The first the first byte data that I showed you, sometimes they just say, oh, well, I don't know what to do with this key, so let's just use something else. 
and to convince you that they are not doing a lot, half of the drivers are under, under 100 line of codes, which means that they are really not doing a lot when you're coding with C. And for example, um, uh, one driver just changed the one of the input mapping in heat riser, so it was a brand new driver just for one key. A. And so I was attending kernel recipes for a few edition and was seeing all this weird guy talking about BPF all the time. And so I'm actually glad that this is the first talk about BPF to, uh, for this edition. And I was thinking in my head, can eBPF help me there? Because it seems like there is something we can do. So given that it's the first talk about BPF, what is BPF? You'll get a more uh, detailed presentation uh, from Alexei tomorrow. Um, but basically, if you I really like the definition of the Cerium project, uh, which says that BPF is a highly flexible and efficient virtual machine-like construct in the Linux kernel, allowing to execute bytecode at various hooks points in a safe manner. It is used by in a number of Linux kernel subsystems, most prominently networking, tracing, and security. In other words, it allows to add safe kernel space code from the user space, if you have root access. So, heat plus BPF, what it is? It's basically using BPF in heat drivers to have user space driver fixes in the kernel. Before we start saying, hey, what's happening there? Uh, these are the few principles that uh, define the entire frame of heat BPF. First and foremost, I'm only working on an arrays on arrays of bytes and I'm only talking heat. That was what was problematic to me um, because as soon as you start talking about drivers, you want to have access to input, to LEDs, for feedback and this kind of stuff. If you want to introduce BPF in your subsystem, you have to stick to your subsystem. So I've got heat input, I transform it eventually, and I return heat. I don't have any access to any other subsystem. Any smart processing that can happen at the heat level, like if I want to parse the report descriptor, this is not part of the BPF. This is part of the user space. User space has to parse the report descriptor or the programmer. Given that the report descriptor is written once in flash of the memory, you can completely write one program that does everything and uh, you don't even have to pause the report descriptor. You just realize, hey, this device is this one, so I can just use uh, X at this particular value. Um, I also want to execute one PPF program and attach it specifically to one device. Uh, just in case in the future we have hundreds of devices and hundreds of PPF programs, I do not want to iterate over all of them. Uh, one important point is that we need to unfold GPL program with BPF, and guess what? We get that for free with BPF because we are talking to the kernel, and the kernel is exported as GPL functions. And I do not want to users to have LLVM, and so program needs to be CORE, which is compile once, run everywhere. So basically, you compile, you compile the program, you can provide the bytecode and ship it in any kernel as long as you've got the proper APIs. So why? Why am I using heat BPF? Um, there are four your ca use cases that I'm going to present here. The first one is, in my opinion, it's going to introduce a more convenient and more simple way to do fix and user testings. Okay. Nowadays, what it means to add a new quirk in the heat subsystem? You've got a device, a keyboard, that has a broken key. You first have to identify the issue. Then you have to either write yourself a patch in the heat subsystem, or you have to ask somebody to write a patch for you. And you have to test it. And users need to recompile the kernel, which is a hard task, as we saw yesterday. Then we need to submit the patch to the LKML. We need to do the review of the patch. Uh, we need to do eventual some changes, and we need to ask the user to re recompile the kernel. And then we include the patch in a branch. That's classic development. We scale it either for this cycle or for the next one. Then the patch goes into the industry. The kernel is either marked as stable because it's, thick, it's a new driver, for instance, or the patch is backported into stable. The distribution starts taking the new kernel, and only now the user can drop the custom kernel build, which means that for the whole time between the identification of the issue 
and the, f the time for the for the bug to be fixed upstream, the user still has its own custom kernel build for this one key that is broken on this particular device that he might not use. So what it means to have this with BPF? We will still have to notify the issue, we will still have to write something, except that it's not a proper patch, it's a BPF program that will be created. And the user would just drop the bytecode into the file system, whether the user compiled it or not, yeah, it depends. To give you an idea, this is what I'm looking for. This is very sim simple things. You get an array, you just change one byte in it, and you return zero. I'm not looking for anything more fancier in this, uh, in this system. And the interesting bit is that now that the user has his device fixed, the user can still continue to use it regular kernel updates. CVEs are fixed and whatnot. But then, the developers are continuing to include and ship the fix within the kernel tree directly. So we submit the patch in the DUL KML, we review the patch with the BPF program, we include the patch in the branch, we ship it, and so on and so forth, and these questions are taking the new kernel. Second use case, heat firewall. If you have Steam installed on your machine, good for you, the problem is that it installs a UDEV rule that says every game controller device I know are gonna get you access. Which means that you're gonna open to the entire world access to your game controller. Which is okay for like, okay, you've got a classic gamepad that doesn't do much, okay? But if you have like, for instance, a DS5 controller or any PlayStation controller, I think, they have this tiny bit which is called firmware upgrade that you can do. The problem is that what prevents Chrome or JavaScript polling to actually talk to the heat device and start the firmware grade and start messing up with your device. So you just bought an $80, uh, I don't, can't remember exactly the same the price, but you just brought a brand new controller and somebody just kills you, kills the controller, sorry. So that's not good. With heat BPF, what we can do is we should be able to fix and to, to detect, okay, this device, this application is actually trying to access the firmware update point. Nope, it should not, and we just reject the request. Also, we would be able to change the device based on the user context. The example that I have here is this tiny bit of uh, device. It's a nice one, it's a pack from Microsoft called the Surface Dial. It's a rotary knob, um, very nice. In the kernel, we export it as a rotary knob, but the problem is that user space doesn't use it because none of the developers working on the user space stack have it. So basically, we implemented stuff in the kernel for it, and you can't use it because, eh, why not? So what you can do with BPF, though, is given that you know that it has haptic feedback and it has quite a high resolution, why not use it as a wheel on a mouse? So with hit BPF, you can change the device into a mouse with high resolution and use it to scroll your web page. Yay. And suddenly, if you have a menu, you can enable the haptic, have one click per five degrees, and use it differently. The interesting bit here is that the kernel cannot make this decision for you, because we don't know how you're going to use the device, and we cannot really lie to the user space, because if we start saying, OK, well, let's convert this to your layer into, into a mouse, that means that we are lying to the user space, and at some point, user space will want to revert the change that we did in the kernel, which is <laughs> terrible. Last but not least, on the example that I have here is tracing. In the heat system, we have hydro, which is nice. It works well, but it's not enough. It's not enough for a couple of reasons. Some drivers are simply disabling hydro. And also the problem is that hydro is a one-to-one -one con communication between the process and the device which means that we don't know what's happening outside of our process. With BPF, we are in the kernel, we should be able to get an overview of who is accessing the device and what they are doing. So, how does it look like? Already shown one, but uh, let's start with this one, which is more uh, common for the BPL folks. Um, so let's say we have a device and we want to change the incoming data flow. Like for instance, we've got the X coordinate of the mouse that is inverted. We can 
just introduce this tracing PPF program in the in the kernel and attach it to the device. What we do is we do a get data and we change the data in it and we return zero and the data is modified on the fly. This is executed before any other driver processing. Uh, so that's one interesting bit is that from the user space point of view, everything happened as if, as if it was not here. To be able to attach the BPF program to our device, currently what I have is I have um, I have a syscall BPF program that I need to, to 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 write in your BPF code, and you need to actually attach the device uh, into uh, so the program FD to the device um, that you identify by this system unique ID. One of the interesting bits is that you can load more than one program for the device event. So this is a dumb example because you do not want to have two programs for X and Y. But what is interesting is that you can have a firewall, a device fix up, and you can also have a tracing program. And you don't have to recompile them together to have everything working properly. So the use case for this one, for the device event, it's, it's useful, for instance, if you have a uh, joystick that is quite old and is drift the one of the joystick is drifting, uh, you could set up a neutral zone and don't wake up user space any time you've got uh, an event that, is, that should not be there. You can also fil filter out unwanted fields in a stream, and you can uh, fix the report when something should not happen. If you have uh, an old mouse with a bouncing button, and you are able to detect it for via some, I don't know, a way of common filter or whatever you want, or just saying, oh, it's not possible that the user is doing that. You can just filter out whatever you want. The second interesting bit with HitBPF is that you can change how the device looks at all. This is the surface dial example, and this is what I shown previously. You can change the report descriptor. So basically, we can turn the device from something to something else. Uh, we are still using the same API, which is HitBPF get data, and this time data contains the report descriptor of the device. The interesting bit here is that whenever you load and you attach this program to the device, the program gets disconnected and reconnected with the new um, with the new uh, uh, description. And of course, we can only have one program of this type uh, because otherwise uh, it would be a mess to understand what is doing what. So with that, you can fix a bogus report descriptor uh, if a key is not properly mapped, or like if this, the device says, hey, this key is constant, expect it's not. You can morph the device into something else, um, and you can also change the device language. If you, you can do fun things there. Um, yeah. And last, but not least, uh, what you want to do is probably you want to be able to communicate with the device. So for that, you still have to introduce a syscall BPF program. And then you have to allocate a context, because when you're on syscall, you don't have the context. Well, you sort of have it, but it's uh, not the context that we are interested in. We want to do the mapping with the heat device. And then you can use heat BPF for our request and do whatever you want in it with the data that you provide to it. Heat BPF hardware request is the exact same behavior than the internal function heat hardware request, if you know the heat API, uh, which means that it cannot be used in interrupt context, which means uh, that whenever you want to query device information or put the device into a specific mode, this needs to be initiated from the user space, not directly from the kernel. We cannot do some direct uh, communication between two. OK. How? Really fast. Um, so last, uh, the last, the last point is about uh, how I managed to get that. And uh, the architecture of heat BPF is interesting now because thanks to the work from Alex and all of the other BPF folks, uh, we can pretty much um, map any subsystem or attach any. No, the other way around. We can attach BPF to any subsystem uh, with. Uh, Two functionalities: the allow error injection API and the kfunk API. Of course, currently uh, I'm missing a few BPF core features uh, that are addressed in the patch series, so I'm, I won't into, uh, go too deep in, into detail there. Um, 
but this is on the back and not really interesting there. So what is a low error injection? Uh, basically, it's introducing a trace point in the kernel code that can, that can be tweaked by, the, by eBPF. It has a lot of other uh, use, but for my case, it's eBPF, so that's why I'm focusing there. Uh, it's introduced by a programmer to give and place in the code. Uh, this is completely voluntary. You do it on your own, and you exactly know what you're doing. So what it means? is that on the left, you've got the kernel module itself, on the right, the BPF program. Uh, it's a simple function that you have to declare. It's a no inline function. You have to declare it as weak so that it works. And you tag it with allow error injection. Then you've got your regular processing function uh, that does stuff. And at the very beginning of your function, you say, hey, if my trace point returns an error, you just abort. And by default, if you don't attach any BPF program to it, it doesn't do anything. But if you attach a BPF program to the, to the right, you can do a test on the event. Something happens. You return an error code. And then that means that my trace point will this time return an error, which means that you can actually interrupt the kernel flow of processing directly from the BPF program. The other interesting bit are KFUNCs. KFUNC is quite recent. I, I won't ex can't remember exactly when it was introduced. Um, but basically, it allows you to export a kernel function as an eBPF dynamic API, which means you don't have to update eBPF anymore if your uh, intent is to add a function to a subsystem, which means that you let the BPF forks on their own way, you are doing on, on your own side, and it's everybody gets happy. However, of course, kerns need to be taken. It's a syscall, definitely a syscall. Um, so all of the uh, problems of a syscall are um, there. But the interesting point is that eBPF takes all of the cumbersome part away, because eBPF would ensure that you are calling the function with the right arguments in terms of uh, structs and uh, parameters. Not um, You have to check the values, but uh, you're sure that the function is called with the correct, the correct uh, um, types. If the call is not there, the BPF program won't load. That's it. Uh, all of the versioning is also somehow integrated with all of that, because if you change, the, if you change your struct, then the, the BPF program would say, OK, I'm using a different struct. So now I just can't use this same function with the same name uh, because it's not the right parameters. So how does it look like? It's slightly more complex. Um, not so much, but still. Uh, so you still have to define a non-inline function so that the kernel compiler doesn't uh, strip it away. Um, you then add it to a BTF uh, set. And once you add it to the BTF set in your module init function, you register the BTF set with BPF core. And then in the BPF program, uh, you, of course, you include vmlinux.h. And uh, you also redefine your function as a ksim. That's the small bit here. That is quite important. Um, and then you just call this function as if it were a properly BPF API. I was supposed to do 35 minutes and it's not going to 23, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Wrapping up. Summary. Um, the goal here is to simplify easy fixes in the kernel. Um, I want to allow to add user space defined behavior depending on the context. So all of the decisions that we cannot take in the kernel, user space can take it from for us. We can also, add, of course, traces in the event, even if we have k-probes with ftrace, all this kind of stuff. It's much more convenient to have a full API to, to, to get uh, to there. It will allow to have live fix without having to update the kernel. Uh, this is that something that happens when I have my Red Hat uh, employee uh, etiquette, which is basically uh, we are updating every six months. It's a problem. Um, so fixing devices directly is, is a nice thing in the same way of live patching. Kind of. uh, it would, as a maintainer, I'm particularly
very interested in this one because it would allow me to remove any custom kernel API for any particular device because I can tell people, okay, look, instead of having a module parameter for this one, just add your BPF program for your particular API that you need, which means that I don't have to um, take care of those in the long term um, because the user space is responsible for its own API. And of course, it will not replace internet drivers uh, for some devices. For instance, if your device is completely broken at boot time and we cannot actually ship the BPF program in it, we can't do it. Um, or if your device actually needs a driver, like either MI or the Wacom driver for input tablets, it will definitely not replace those because uh, as soon as we need some communication between um, the BPF program and user space, it's not going to be uh, this. And that's it. <laughs> so, any questions? Um, so I was curious, assuming that um, someone provides me a BPF program fixing my broken hit device um, and I would like to upstream such a fix into the kernel, the uh -huh. BPF program get turned into a C code then and applied as a patch to the Linux inputs drivers? So the idea, the idea that we have is uh, that, so BPF program are C equivalent code, so we can put them in a patch for, for, no, for no issue. Uh, what you can do also, and what HitBPF is doing right now, is you can actually load a BPF program from the kernel mm -hmm. and talk to it. So the idea is that uh, we would uh, fix the BPF, so fix the device, provide the BPF program, ship it as a, as, as a patch in the kernel tree, and also provide some auto tooling that would convert the BPF program, the same BPF code, into a module uh, that would be dynamically generated based on the BPF program. Mm -hmm. And so it would be a regular kernel module, except that this kernel module would load the BPF program for you. So we actually distribute the BPF program within the kernel tree. So that will make the BPF support in kernel basically mandatory? Sorry, can you repeat uh, that? That will make the BPF support in kernel basically mandatory? Um, for some devices, yes. Yeah, got it, thank you. Um, so w when you say allowing to add user space to find behavior, do you mean letting user space choose which BPF program to load, or do you mean user space actually like sending information to BPF to make a decision? No, the 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 idea is that so so we got I've got an an hybrid approach. The the small fixes would be loaded by the kernel. For the for the for the fixes, where like like if you just want to fix the report descriptor, it should be loaded by the kernel, and that's it, and you forget it, and it's it's done. Um, for uh, for instance, we've got an example with the USI pens, where like we need to actually talk to the device and change the parameters on the pen themselves directly, and so it would be entirely the responsibility of the user space to load that program inside the kernel. Okay. I'm working on um, a new map type in BPF uh, for user space to send messages to BPF programs. So it's like the ring buff, but it goes in the other direction. Okay. Um, I don't know if that might be something that could be useful for Maybe. this as well. Uh, so just always on your radar. Yeah, cool, cool. Seems yeah. interesting. Any other questions? Yeah. So, so how does the distribution work? Like when you have a fix with a BPF uh, fix, like how does the uh, distribution, like a, like a like Ubuntu or something, how can they distribute these these fixes? Like uh so, if if they are distributed in tree, uh, like simple fix, there it's it's just a regular kind of update. Right. So for the users, it doesn't change anything. Uh, it only change for the user who actually start the initiate the process of fixing the, the, the device, where like this one actually needs to have this. But we could also ship those device, those fixes through UDEV or through systemd or this kind of stuff, but right. going through the kernel is actually the most sensible yeah. way for those. So no difference from people. 
it's uh, partially related to the previous question, but uh, don't you fear that uh, it the discourage some users from uh, um, upstreaming their changes? Because it encourages an approach which consists in uh, deploying a quick fix locally and forgetting about it. Yes, I mean, uh, the, the, the one thing I'm aware of is that it's completely opening the Pandora box. Um, it's maybe uh, some user will do that. Uh, hopefully, hopefully some user will still continue to contribute if they have this local fix and they want to, to, to continue to it. The biggest interest I see for me is that uh, I will be able to provide fixes for users without having to recompile the entire kernel or ask them, okay, can you try this particular kernel, this kind of stuff. So yes, that's a risk. In the same way, it's a risk that suddenly um, any hardware vendor starts uh, building in an entire um, uh, an entire big thing that is completely ugly and um, completely in BPF. Yes, that's true. But I think the, the pros are against the cons. That's very likely. But uh, we are just perceiving this little risk. Yeah. Okay, thanks. There's a question behind you, really. I'm not sure I understand. Um, when you pr uh, when you distribute the BPF programs in tree, do you distribute just the source files, and people will then need LLVM to actually what? compile them, or will you also have the binary in there? So my plan is still not implemented yet. That's why it's a it's a work in progress. My plan is that we submit the BPF patch, the the BPF program as a patch. And alongside with the patch, we have to run some tooling that would also add the loader of the patch itself. So we would compile the bytecode of the BPF directly in tree, add this in the patch, and then have the loader directly load the thing. So it's exactly the same. Than, I mean, exactly, not exactly the same. Um, we might be able to also compile the BPF program at compile time. Um, this is not what is currently done in the in the other BPF program that are preloaded, um, but we've got a lot of opportunities. But the idea is that you do not have to have Clang and LLVM installed on the user space. Okay. Any other questions? Then. All right, thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Hans de Goede, and uh, I work for Red Hat as a software engineer. I mostly work on uh, making laptops work with Linux. That's the best description of what I do. And a part of making laptops work with Linux is uh, making sure you can control the brightness of your LCD panel, which is actually harder than it sounds. It should be really trivial, but unfortunately it's not. So yeah, that's what today's presentation is about. Uh, I missed the memo that we were doing a competition who could do the most slides, but I might win the competition for who has the smallest amount of slides. <laughs> so it won't be very long. I hope we can have some, some discussion afterwards. We will have plenty of time for questions. So, uh, yeah, oh, here we go. So, uh, as uh, my first uh, the title slide mentioned, uh, the it's, this is about replacing the Sys class backlight user space API. At least that's part of it. Uh, so, I will start with a new uh, user space API proposal. But before we can get there, there is a, is a bunch of uh, technical debt we need to, uh, to deal with. Uh, um, a big part of which is also some probe ordering issues, which is always fun stuff for those who have dealt with probe ordering issues in the kernel before. So yeah, that's, that's the topics for today's. Uh, so let's first take a brief look at what, what the problems are. Uh, actually, this is a long unsolved problem. When I started preparing this talk, I was looking back in history and I gave a talk about this before, eight years ago at X Developer Conference in 2014. Then Intel sent a proposal to try and fix this to the mailing list in 2017. And actually at Plumbers Conference in Lissabon, uh, I had a long discussion with Daniel Vetter uh, about this uh, and we sort of made a plan. Uh, and then, then COVID happened and, and other stuff. Uh, so yeah, it's a long, long unsolved problem. So problems with the current user space API is if you look under Sys class backlight, you get a bunch of uh, class devices there. And uh, they have names like ACPI underscore video zero, ACPI underscore video one. And you might have an Intel backlight and an Intel backlight one. And a Nouveau backlight and a Nouveau backlight one. So you get six. And then user, and they're all for the same panel. And user space gets to, to figure out uh, which one works. But also, uh, if you actually have multiple panels, which we really don't support yet, at least not in the sense of controlling backlight for them, then there is also no way to figure out which, uh, which of those devices on the Sys class backlight actually belong to, to which panel. Uh, another problem is with using a SysFS interface, it requires root writes. So we have ugly code in, in both GNOME and KDE and XFCE where they have a little set user ID helper which has a pipe. Either it has a pipe which gets values echoed into it or it gets exact every time they want to set a value. Neither of which is really pretty. And we don't like set user ID root helpers. Uh, so, and uh, what's also interesting is the meaning of value in the API is, is not clearly defined. Uh, on, in, on some laptops, if you write zero to the brightness attribute under Sys class backlight and then whatever one you want to use, uh, and then brightness, you will get the screen will turn completely off, or well, the backlight will turn completely off, which with a standard LCD makes it unusable. Uh, in another, another case, you just get the minimum supported brightness value, which might be so dark that it's not readable in the sun, but usually in a low lit room, it will still be, be readable. And readable enough that you can actually find the slider and slide it up again if you don't have hotkeys on your keyboard. So those are, those are all problems with the current API, which, uh, which we want to get rid of. So uh, there is a pretty trivial proposal actually for, for a new API, which is uh, there will be two new properties added to DRM connector objects. So in uh, the DRM subsystem is strange because it has like the DRI part, direct rendering infrastructure, which is meant for sending commands to GPU, but it also has the KMS part, kernel mode setting, which is about setting up the display pipe. So I'm mostly talking about KMS here to be clear. Even though we call it a DRM object, it's actually kernel mode setting. So in kernel mode setting, each connector, each physical connector in a laptop, including internal connectors, has uh, a, a software object associated with it. And the proposal is to, to set properties on those connector objects. Uh, there will be two. There will be a display brightness property and a display brightness max property. Uh, the reason for having two is that the, the kernel mode setting object model doesn't allow adding properties after an object has been created. Uh, and especially when we also want to be able to control uh, the brightness on external monitors through a protocol called DDCCI, 
which so far is impossible because of the issue that the sysclass backlight interface cannot map clearly to a specific display output. But this will map clearly to a specific display output, so then we can support DDCCI and also do brightness control of external panels. Uh, but that requires um, an external panel can be plugged in later. So at probe time, at creating the, the object, we won't know if there will be brightness control possible. And uh, also we won't know the maximum value. And uh, DRM uh, uh, properties, if they're an integer property, you specify a range at creation time. So what will happen here is that there will be a display brightness property, which gets a range of zero to int max. And the max property, which also gets a range of zero to int max in the actual maximum value, which user space can, can effectively use, will be in the maximum property. And if there is no brightness control, then the max property value will be zero. Uh, so yeah, and it can change on, so the might, uh, brightness max value can just change on hot plug events, which is something new. Uh, currently, it's really interesting. Currently, when, uh, for example, GDM, the graphical login manager, which you get with GNOME, starts up to show you the graphical login prompt, it scans sysclass backlight, but it does that only once. It assumes that all the backlights have been initialized and that nothing new will ever show up during the runtime of the computer, basically. So yeah, now, uh, but the hot plug events through UDEV are already a standard component of the, the kernel mode setting interface. This just means that when they get a user space gets a hot plug event and it uses these new properties, uh, it will need to also uh, check if brightness max has changed. So as I mentioned uh, during the brief list of the topics, there is a bunch of technical depth here. This is all very x86 uh, laptop specific. Uh, that's, that's what I work on. That's also where, where most of the pain is. In device tree, things are clearly described. We have clear links between like this backlight controller belongs to this display. That's part of the, the, the node tree in, in, the, in device tree. So, but on, on ACPI systems, it's a mess. So uh, yeah, there are uh, m many ways to control uh, the backlight on, on a laptop. Uh, when laptops first started appearing, they were basically using uh, low voltage versions of desktop GPUs or even pre-GPUs, just desktop graphical cards. And these didn't have a PWM controller to set the backlight. So this was done by the embedded controller. So the embedded controller controlled the brightness. And uh, yeah, there was no standardized API to access this. So you have a Dell specific ACPI. I think it's SMB BIOS based on Dell laptops. And Asus has its own stuff. Acer has its own stuff. Lenovo has two different methods. One for ThinkPads, which they inherited from IBM. One from their IDPad line. So if you look at the really older laptops, we're talking pre-Windows XP here, so we're talking pretty old. Uh, there is a whole bunch of uh, vendor specific firmware interfaces. Uh, then XP came along and Microsoft said this is a mess and they mandated that everyone would implement a new ACPI specification called the ACPI video bus and things were actually pretty good during the XP era. And then Windows uh, 8 happened, or Vista, and the mess started all over again, sort of, because Microsoft said, uh, you know what, we're going to no longer handle the backlight in, in the core of the OS, we're going to move it into the GPU drivers. So Intel started its own thing again, and AMD and NVIDIA also did their own thing. Although at the same time, what also happened was that actually the, the, the PWM controller got integrated into the mobile GPUs. So they, it was sort of also logical to do it in the GPU driver because it was actually part of the GPU. So the, the PWM controller, which does, does, does stuff. Um, so yeah, then we had uh, we have the, the old vendor-specific ACPI stuff, or firmware-based, could also be SM BIOS or WMI. We have the standardized ACPI stuff, and now we have the native GPU driver stuff. Uh, except the native GPU driver stuff sort of works, doesn't work. If you go to laptops which have two GPUs, an integrated GPU and a separate high, uh, discrete GPU from NVIDIA or AMD. So NVIDIA now is reintroducing uh, using the embedded controller to do <laughs> backlight control. And Apple devices which have uh, two GPUs have something called the Apple GMUX chip. So it's a mux between the two GPUs. So they can both, well, either one at a time can drive the panel. And there the backlight control is part of the mux. So we now we have five different ways of controlling the backlight. 
And on, on some laptops, we see three of these drivers actually saying, oh, I see, because if you, even if you take a pretty recent new Dell laptop, uh, usually the old SM bias method is still there, or at least appears to still be there. If you look at the method calls, which you can do, the call is there. If it will work, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, the ACPI video uh, call is almost always there in anything which is meant uh, from XP, Windows XP era or newer. And the native GPU support also sometimes gives a false positive that the video BIOS tables, which the GPU driver uses, say, yeah, you can do backlight control, but it's a lie, basically. It's not true. So uh, what we, uh, so currently we just sort of register CSFS devices for all of them. That is not entirely true. And just let user space uh, pick one. User space uh, uses a pretty naive heuristics for this. So the different sort of backlight devices which we can register on x86, they have types. There is actually also a type attribute in the SysFS interface. And user space just says, I prefer firmware, which is the ACPI one, over platform, which is the, the custom one, over native. Uh, but this means that if we want to use native on a model, we must make sure in the kernel through heuristics, that the, so we have two levels of heuristics now, although the user space is very fixed. In the kernel heuristics, we must make sure that uh, we actually unregister the other ones if we want user space to use the native one. Because if we register any, and, but we don't know if the native one will be there until the native one shows up because the GPU driver module loads. So we start usually with registering ACPI video and then the native driver loads and then on modern hardware we unload ACPI video again. So you may have seen system D errors, especially on dual GPU laptops, that it's trying to access ACPI video to save or restore the backlight, but it cannot, because it sees, it sees the UDAV event that it gets registered. And then by the time it gets to run, we have already unregistered it again, because we say, no, we want to use the native one. So this is all very messy. This is a technical depth which we bi build up, because we've been adding workarounds on workarounds on workarounds for years. And no one had really had the time to, to clean this up. So currently uh, I'm, I'm making time to clean this up because, well, as I said, it has been eight years, so it's about time. Uh, so yeah, the probe ordering er issues, uh, the whole story about ACPI video registering first and de only then later seeing the native GPU support show up and think, oh, we prefer that one and then unregistering ACPI video basically is, of course, a probe ordering issue. Uh, this is a problem because if we want to have uh, it as a property on the connector object, we need really need to have only uh, have the one -on, one on one relationship between uh, the backlight interface which we're using. So either the vendor specific one, or the generic ACPI one, or the GPU native one, or some of the other special cases, and uh, the property. Right? We cannot have the property drive multiple backlight interfaces or report the value for multiple backlight interfaces back when the property is being read. So uh, yeah, one of the issues is the kernel heuristics, which we have for this already sort of, cannot detect if the GPU driver uh, will actually offer native control, because for that the GPU driver needs to interpret the, uh, its own video BIOS tables, which are all vendor specific formats in, in the VGA BIOS or the EFI graphical operation pr process thingy. So yeah, this is... Uh, uh, this is an issue because the heuristics only pick native when it's available. That's sort of how we did, it's not entirely true, but it's more or less how we detect if we want to prefer the native mode. Um, so yeah, to fix this, what, 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 I, what I've done, I already have a patch set for this in review, is uh, I have uh, split the ACPI video probe code. The probe still runs at the same time as it used to do, because we don't want to change these kind of things because that tends to cause a lot of regressions. But it doesn't actually register itself as a backlight device yet. That part is skipped, but that's just exposing itself to user space, basically. And then uh, we will have the, the GPU drivers actually call back into the ACPI video code. Like, I'm done probing. So ask the heuristics which type of backlight should be used. And if that says ACPI video, you can now register. Right? Because at that time, the, the heuristic code, the, the video detect code, as we call it, uh, under drivers ACPI, uh, will know that there is a native driver, so it, it has all the knowledge it needs to make the decision. Uh, this means, though, that if you s specify no mode set, or if somehow you have an mm, unsupported GPU, uh, the ACPI video backlight will register callback will never get called. 
So to work around that, I have a delayed worker, which runs after eight seconds after HPI video probes. Because sometimes with slow panels, it can take up to five seconds to, to, do, to do the whole KMS probe dance. And then we, we, we add some margin of three seconds or whatever. So ACPI video will show up even if you don't load a native GPU driver, but after eight seconds. Which is a very ugly hack before anyone says like, that's so ugly. Yes, it's so ugly. Uh, better solutions are welcome. Uh, so yeah, uh, another issue is, uh, this is already sort of fixed because we need to fix the DDC CI issue anyway is uh, the heuristics. They look for ACPI video support, for native support, when I still need to add that they look for GMUX support and for the new NVIDIA embedded controller stuff, which luckily has a somewhat standardized interface also. But if they find neither of those four, the heuristics basically return like something else, <laughs> which means the Dell laptop, ThinkPad ACPI, Asus WMI, or whatever driver needs to provide the backlight. But those drivers typically are, are loaded later, right? For things like being able to unlock your disk in a nice graphical manner, we put the GPU driver in the init RD, but all these other drivers are in drivers platform x86, and we typically don't put those in the init RD, which means that uh, the DRM object will get registered and the connector object with user space before the backlight is available. So user space will see a panel if it's quick enough, user space actually isn't quick enough, but let's pretend it's quick enough. Then it would see a panel which doesn't claim to have backlight support and then later all of a sudden the panel will be unchanged but it will get backlight support. But there will be a UDEV event for this and user space will just need to deal with this as if it's a monitor hot plug, while at the same time not resetting the mode on the panel because we don't want an actual mode set. So it needs to recognize that it's still the same panel but that's now with backlight support or well brightness control support. Yeah, uh, the old interface is called Sysclass Backlight. The new interface talks about brightness because nowadays we also have OLED and OLED screens also usually have some sort of brightness curve which you can control. So yeah, sorry I'm using the two uh, intermixed, but for the new interface it will always be brightness, what we're talking about. And so I promised I don't have a lot of sheets, unless I'm mistaken this is the last one. So questions? Remarks, suggestions. Um, so, do you mm -hmm. ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, the this is a class. This or is in this class. And output slash. So the, the new API will use properties on the connector objects, and this is all IOCTOL level. DRM IOCTOLs, you enumerate properties and they have IDs. And yeah, got it, thanks. And actually, well, it's an interesting question because another part of this is that uh, once all of user space is uh, moved over to the new API, which will probably take a long time, but still. Or uh, we could disable the user space part of the backlight devices in the kernel. So we will still have the backlight device abstraction in the kernel because we have these five different implementations, but we could basically get rid of this class backlight, right? We just stop exposing that to user space. It will all be internal that there is a backlight device abstraction. So we no uh, file in SFS to control the brightness anymore after that? Right. Uh, this will be optional. There will probably be a K-config option, like for distros who know that they only oh. use the new way, they can just nuke the old way. Thanks. Uh, is it possible to discover the max level of the brightness? Uh, I'm asking because uh, I have an old uh, netbook uh, and Asus one. I don't remember the exact model, but I don't care. Uh, after a certain upgrade, uh, the, the backlight uh, stopped uh, working correctly. I mean that it was either, uh, full on or full off, basically. And I, um, I debugged it and found, I seem to remember that uh, the max value changed from uh, uh, 255 uh, uh, to 15 or something like this, and that the 
number of steps were not correct anymore. I proposed the fix uh, to revert this to the old value, and I was told that uh, more modern uh, laptops uh, were using this range, and uh, that basically we had to make a choice between the old ones or the new ones, and I agreed to keep my patch for myself, and that made me wonder whether it was possible to discover how the hardware works internally to respect the mm. steps. So this sounds like it was using the vendor specific, so the, the, an Asus specific WMI or, or whatever, yeah. ACPI interface. And uh, yeah, with those interfaces, it's usually not possible to discover the maximum. ACPI video has a method for this. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the native GPU drivers typically have this described in their, bios, uh, in, the, in, in their video BIOS tables. Actually, usually it's a bigger problem to discover the minimum value. Okay. Because that's actually one thing which I think I missed. I might also have not put it on my slides. So um, yeah, I didn't put this here, but actually this we also had two more back that the meaning of value zero is undefined. For the new uh, API, the meaning of value zero is going to be minimum brightness, right? If you want to turn the display off, there are KMS methods to basically turn the entire connector off, so go in DPMS mode. And zero will be will mean minimum brightness. This is a bit of a problem for the kernel, because if we're just controlling a raw PWM as with a native GPU driver, we don't know. Of course, if we set the duty cycle to zero percent, then the backlight goes off. That's clear. And we don't know actually at which value, or if it's ten percent or whatever, we will get. The video BIOS tables are supposed to give us a minimum value, but they don't always do. So at least the AMD GPU driver just has like a define of if the video BIOS table contains zero, just use this. And Intel will, will need to do the same thing, and Nouveau also, so that we can actually guarantee that zero means minimum brightness and that we never turn turn it off in the new when using the new API. The old API will keep the old behavior, because some people actually depend on being able to turn off, they should use it as a sort of quick power management hack on embedded devices <laughs> to write zero to sysclass Briar. And embedded devices are full of hacks. <laughs> uh, not, not that uh, that x86 machines are much better. Any more questions? Oh, behind you. Uh, yes, I. <coughs> you said that you cannot control the brightness of uh, external devices, external displays. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to know why, and is UAPI going to help with uh, that, or? Or is it going to uh, yes, so uh, external displays typically support something called DDCCI, which is done over the same I2C protocol as which is used to get the, e the EDID, so the display uh, identification information. Uh, at the moment, we, we don't support this. There are some patch out of some. Actually, one of the reasons why I started moving on this was some people were pushing to adding uh, a brightness control to CIS class backlight for external monitors in the upstream kernel, but that that will just confuse the hell out of GNOME and KDE because they don't know that you will have an internal panel and or maybe two external monitors which both are controllable. So yeah, this will solve this because we, we are putting it on the connector object so we can, and each, ex each external monitor mm -hmm. will have its own connector object so then you will know that the brightness property on this connector object controls this display. It will be an interesting question how the UI for this will look in user space, right? Because at the moment on my laptop, right, I have I have this this slider here, which yeah. you don't see that it changes anything, but it changes stuff for me. Or I can can use the hotkeys if I can find them. But um, yeah, that. Are there going to be three sliders, and how does the user know which one is which? Uh, what are the brightness hotkeys going to do? Uh, yeah, but that's, that's all for the user space interface, yeah. user interface designers. Yeah. I can just wave that away as <laughs> not my problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, you said your the new API would only work uh, through DRM uh, properties. Uh, can't you have, uh, I don't know, a sim link in the sys backlight directory to point to the correct device and uh, or something that would let uh, apps that are already written for the old uh, API to continue working just by changing the device and not implementing a new, completely new interface? Uh, yes, we could 
add something like a sim link to sys class DRM and then card name dash connector name uh, to indicate that this backlight belongs to this connector, assuming we know the mapping ourselves, which is also a bit of a challenge sometimes. Yeah, that, that, that's my next question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that would only solve the issue for still for only an internal panel, and then actually it's not useful to know. Because as soon as we add like a separate sys class backlight device with the simulink for an external monitor, then that will still confuse the hell out of existing user space, and we don't break existing user space, because they don't look at the simlinks, and all of a sudden they see one extra, and they don't know which one to pick for which panel or which output. Yeah, and that was my next question. Uh, will will the mapping be resolved? How will the mapping be resolved? Which to so the, the, this whole uh, new building which I'm building has a bit unstable foundation. <laughs> so uh, w one of the unstable parts is the, the assumption is uh, there will be only one else <coughs> one laptop panel or internal panel. So and all the the APIs I have been talking about are all about the internal panel. <coughs> So, uh, well, if, 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 it's, if the GPU driver is doing it itself, so if we have the native backlight driver case, then, uh, then it's easy because the GPU driver should know which panel it's controlling. And if it's using one of the firmware things, it will just map that to the internal panel. And for the external ones, we know over which connector we're doing the I2C for the DDCCI, so then we know already have the mapping. Right, and the whole DDCCI thing, which is uh, something for the future, right? It's not here yet. The, the code isn't there yet. There, there is a set of patches, but that's not doesn't fit this model. Um, so uh, uh, there, actually, the whole idea, of course, is this will all be be some DRM helper code where each driver just calls the helper, and that's it, right? We're not going to have each driver implement DDCCI by by itself. That would not be very smart to do. Oh, yeah, behind you. So if I'm using sysclass backlight and sysclass brightness at the same time, I'm just asking for trouble, or would that work? Uh, no, it will be a one-on-one -on -one mapping, so they will have the same range, except when we enforce the minimum value, Then, uh, but then the range will just be shifted, right? So, we w uh, so let's say we, we have uh, a maximum value of 30,000, and we enforce a minimum value of 3,000, uh, then we will report a maximum value in the new API of 27,000, and any value written through the new API will get 3,000 added. And if, if then you use the old API and you write a value below 3,000, and you do a read to the new API, it will just re report zero. <laughs> so it will be a one-on-one -on -one mapping, except for that minimum bit, which yeah, we have to fuss. <laughs> so, so you can intermix them, and you shouldn't get uh, scaling issues, or that, that if you intermix them enough, that, that's... Sometimes if you do these kinds of things and you add scaling, then you see that the brightness starts walking slowly because it's not a one-on-one -on -one mapping and you get rounding errors and then it starts floating in one or the other direction if there's too much feedback between the two programs who are using the different APIs. So yeah, it will be a one-on-one -on -one mapping, value-wise. I assume that answers your question? Yeah. Great. So any more questions? Nope. Okay, great. Thank you.
I just fixed my bugs for SQL lists. <laughs> I got it working, and uh, one of the things that we um, was tricky, it was kind of the question was to, like I said, I say if I want to take an event from the sched switch from when something schedules out to when it schedules back in again. And what the example I showed you, I did the system call to the sched switch back in, but let's just say we just want sched switch to sched switch. And the whole idea like in SQL would be like two different, two different tables. But if I have, if I'm doing sched switch, which like remember I said the events are like a table? Well, if it's sched switch to sched switch, it's the same table. And it really does matter which one's the start, which one's the end. So from an SQL point of view for an API, I have to have a way to dis distinguish between the first one and the second one. So what's the um, syntax that someone should add? Okay. Ask table one, ask table two. Wait, you, so if you do like, so I do from, sched switch. Mike. Yeah, Mike. Mike, 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 where's the mic? Where's the throwing mic? Do you hear me? So yes, yes you do from uh, sketch switch as table one, and then from well, have, sketch switch well, as table like two. As, well, I guess I okay. So then I have to actually go okay. The way the code is right now, because I have the as end as start already, so yeah. that differentiated. So I basically that means I have to implement the code to because right now the, I kind of cheat. So when I when you do that, the first thing I do is I substitute all the and, ands. I just go through and substitutes everything. So yeah, you're cheating and, like I'm me. Cheating. <laughs> Okay, so basically I actually have to write more, I have to redesign it so it could do this that way. Okay, that's my question and my answer. Well, yeah, you have a... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's okay to just... Do you have the mic on? Was that the right way? Yep, okay. I think, yeah. Maybe it's okay to just take the first one in the from block as the first one temporarily. Yeah, and uh, yeah I mean, it does... It's not I was wondering if there's a way to differentiate it when you, yeah, I guess I could do it that way. So it is already there. I just have to actually write more code. Darn it. I, I, basically, uh, the answer is I can't do my shortcut. Okay, that's all I had. <laughs> Anything else? Someone else? Anyone else? Come on, don't be shy. No? Is Christian in, in the room, Christian Bonner? Yeah, he's here. Uh, maybe a small introduction about the conference he's working on. <laughs> Can he hear me? <laughs> he's here. So some, some quick words about the conference you are working on uh, at the moment. Can you, just a small introduction, just to explain people what will happen there. No? Christian. Yeah? Sorry. <laughs> My English. Steve, Steve, I think you need to come up here as well. Oh, <laughs> uh, why? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. Uh, we're organizing a conference as well. Uh, I'm just a micro-conference chair track uh, leader, and he is the actual chair of the conference. We're talking about Linux Plumbers, obviously, which uh, this year is taking place in uh, Dublin. Excellent. And uh, we're fairly along and organizing it will be taking place from the 12th to the 14th of September. Uh, who knows about Linux plumbers? <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so and everyone we, else is sleeping who didn't put their exactly. hand up. Exactly. <laughs> so if you have a talk, uh, if you have something that you want to talk about, we have a referee track, we have a tool chain track, we have an eBPF and networking track, we have various micro conferences ranging from zone storage devices, containers, system D, microconference. So if you have any sort of topic, then go hand in as soon as possible. Makes it easier for us uh, to predict what the schedule will look like. Um, and also, you know, the slots are running out fast. Steve? Yes. Um, 
So by the way, I'm going to give you a heads up. Registration starts uh, June 8th. That's Wednesday. Uh, yeah, I could say Wednesday now because we're after, we're after Wednesday. So next Wednesday is registration. So if you want to get in, we have limited supply. I think we're doing 400 people, I think. About 400 or 500. I think well, I don't know. It's going to be, okay. So the venue is tight. Uh, one reason we actually had uh, to, like, the networking track is only two days. The tool chain track is only one day. The reason why is because at, when Lisbon, we had six rooms, six large rooms. Um, but here, we only have five large rooms. So we had to consolidate. So when people got to, like used to our virtual event where we could have as many rooms as we want. And that's actually, that's one of the luxuries of a virtual event. But when you're actually in a physical place, we, are, we have logistics to do everything. But what we just found out recently, and I don't want, I'm not going to say anything because I don't have the exact numbers yet. But we found out that we have the whole second floor, which is a bunch of like smaller rooms. So what I'm going to throw up is something I want to tell like, you know, the people that are here that run the networking track and the BPF track, they're here too. So I'll let you know that even though you only have two days, we do have full access of rooms upstairs. So let us know now if you want to use those. The only thing is, the only caveat to that is they have no AV. They're not going to have anything, unless you bring your laptop up and you just you know, use your own laptop camera and mic, that will be your AV. But we have rooms upstairs for that, so, but that's for everyone else. If you have like a Bob or something you want to talk about, come to the office. We have, uh, we have lots of rooms upstairs. I don't know the exact numbers, but there are more than we expected when we uh, started this. Anything else we should mention? Uh, I already, three-day event? Yeah, oh, yeah, it's three-day. Uh, it's Monday, Tuesday, okay, 12, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? No, no, I think uh, Wait, Alexi what? wants to ask oh, a Alexi, question. Is he, oh, is he, where is he? Got the mic? There is. This, this are excellent news, actually. I was thinking to talk to you guys about this, because we were planning to do this two-day uh, networking oh. BPF track with all the presentations, and the third day, more like LSFMM, which will be like live yeah. discussion, like small rooms. So since there are small rooms, this is just excellent news. I talked to Daniel already. I probably he hasn't informed you yet. Um, I talked to Daniel a couple of days ago actually weeks, maybe two weeks ago, and informed him that we have uh, the capacity to make it a three-day event. So oh. the, in exactly the way you envisioned. Uh, the the, the three-day event, that yes. two, that's going to be AV and one day with the little rooms. Perfect. So, yeah. yeah. With, and it's not recorded. So like I said, any recording or anything will have to be done by you guys. Uh, we'll hopefully, we'll have enough Wi-Fi bandwidth. Um, Sounds well, great. Sure. So it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, yep. Um, well, it's also we do want to let you know because people have said this to us is like, did you know there's another conference that's happening right in Dublin? Aren't you going to compete with each other? I'm like, well, actually, we're supporting each other. It's Open Source Summit uh, ELC EU uh, that's happening at the same time. They're Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and we're Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Yes, there's overlap, but we know of each other, and we're going to try to make sure that if and please let us know like if you if there's things that you want like if you're running a conference or giving a talk. Let us know that, yes, I'm going to be at the Open Source Summit, and I'll be doing that because we're coordinating to make sure our schedules don't overlap so we can actually have ways where you can spend the day at Plumbers and spend the day at Open Source Summit so you don't actually uh, interfere and every, hopefully everyone will do it. But, you know, scheduling is a pain. Uh, we, someone is always going to be dissatisfied. Yeah, if you have constraints, I think that's important. If you have constraints on if you, for example, need to be at two microconferences or in two sessions or talks, then telling us early makes it easier for us to adapt the schedule. Yeah. Actually, if, if, if you're not the microconference runner, tell the microconference runner. Because we're mostly dealing with the microconference runners or the track runners. Um, we don't need a thousand different people talking to us and we have to figure out, okay, how are we doing all this? <laughs> so. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for coming Thank to our TED Talk. <laughs>
Hej. 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 Uh, okay. Yeah, it's okay. So, uh, my name is Arnaldo uh, Melo. I work for Red Hat since forever, and I maintain the Linux Perf tool, the, the user space tool inside. Uh, almost for more than a decade or so. Today I'm, I'm here to talk about uh, some of the experiences that I had over the years uh, with observability tools. Uh, what made me have interest in these and how it progressed over time. Uh, so, uh, it's mostly about type information uh, for us to be able to look at types used in the kernel, types used in programs, used in space. Uh, details about the, the, those types uh, uh, that can help us make optimizations and uh, reduce cache pressure, things like that, like uh, uh, optimization at a very low level. And also introspection in the sense that uh, Linux itself uh, is able to look at it. I, I, uh, uh, Linux can look at itself and make decisions based on this. It's not just like uh, tooling that uh, humans use to see how Linux looks like or other tools look, or other programs look like. It's about the kernel itself using this type of information uh, to make decisions and and, uh, and, 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 and and things like that. And adaptation as well because uh, Nowadays, people don't want to be replacing kernels all the time. They, they, they don't want to rebuild a kernel just to adapt to some situation. It's not like you can have some defines, and then in that situation, I define that thing, rebuild it, and, and, and ship to thousands of machines. Uh, we want to be able to produce something, some, some code, and this code will be built somehow, and they're going to send it to lots of machines that run in different kernels and this code we will still work. It will adapt to what's available in that specific machine, that specific kernel. So I, it started a long time ago. Uh, Linux 2.4, I was trying to understand networking, and was working with lots of legacy protocols. And then I, I, I noticed that uh, the strict SOC, that, that defines a connection, an endpoint in the Linux kernel for networking, uh, was really big. Uh, you had just one structure for, for, for a connection, and then you had this big fat union with uh, one entry per protocol that was supported by Linux. So let's say TC one for TCP, another one for UDP, another one for Apple Talk, another one for DACnet, another one for uh, each of the protocol supporters. Uh, so because TCP was the biggest one, uh, UDP and Unix local sockets would have a cache, uh, a, a cache impact similar to some degree to the TCP one. So it would be interesting to somehow shrink this thing. The, fir the first thing I, I, I uh, the, the, the reasons for, for shrinking the socket. So how to shrink this thing? You, uh, you, could, you could move some fields around because when uh, you create some data structure, it has to respect alignment rules that are set by the uh, uh, specific to each of the processors. So in 64 bits, you, you do it some way. Uh, in 32 bits, it is a little bit different. There are going to be some examples that will show that. So if you move things around, you can reduce the size of data structures by uh, avoiding those alignment uh, paddings that are added if you don't uh, do it carefully. Bit fields, they are like task struct or struct sock as well, have lots of bit fields. So you had some uh, bit fields in one pl place of the struct and all the bit fields later on. So if you could move them together, then it would save uh, one by two by three bytes per, per uh, data structure. Um, so uh, the end result of this was that uh, uh, Linux got a, a, a hierarchy of, uh, of uh, strict SOC. So instead of having just one, you have the, the strict SOC being the, what's common to all of the, the, the uh, protocols, and then TCP SOC for TCP, TCP 6 SOC, 
is a, a, a specialization of TCP talk and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it's a never-ending story. I was googling to find the patch that I did a long time ago, and the first one that came with shrink in shrinking uh, shrink sock was this from uh, Eric Dumazé from last year. So uh, he was still moving things around, trying to better pack the data structure. So it's not something that you do once. The, somebody who uh, is not aware of this go there and adds a, a field that do, do, doesn't take care, and then there is a new one, and you have to, to reorganize it. Uh, and there's some more. I mean, I, I was curious if this was just a, a patch, but uh, right next to it, there was another one that was doing the same thing. Uh, but th th looking at this is tedious, so I, I was thinking, how, how can I find this information without doing manual calculations and stuff like that? Uh, I knew that GDB knows how to dump data structures and so how, how does it do, do this? So I, I, that's when I got to know Dwarf, which is uh, a funny name. Uh, it's a friend of Elf, which is the uh, uh, executable form format for, for Linux and other Unices. And more recently, we got this org as well for unwinding things in the kernel. Uh, and I created a tool called PA hole for uh, looking at strict holes, uh, structure alignment holes uh, to help uh, doing this. So it guesses this debug information that GDB puts there uh, when you compile with dash G. And uh, it can reconstruct the source code from, from that, but while reconstructing the source code, it adds all sorts of information for you to under better understand how the layout of the data structure is. So uh, this is an example. So you, you use PA hole, you say what is the data structure, the class, and then what is the binary. And then it will reconstruct it and say that 16 bytes, the offsets here, number of cache lines, number of members, etc. This is a very simple data structure. There will be some others later on. And then uh, when I first posted this, uh, there was a, a response from someone at the Atlas project at CERN that said that, oh, yeah, uh, I, I, I loved it, but uh, it's only for C, because I was doing it for the Linux kernel. And uh, we have a code base, which is C++ based. It's written in C++. And, and, and Dwarf? has uh, provisions to represent many languages, not just C. So I, he, he asked if it would be possible to support C++ as well, and I said yes. And uh, I did some changes, and the biggest problem that they had was that they had this lots of machines which were 32 bits, they had optimized it for the cluster, and then they were updating at the time to x86-64, which was new. And, uh, and, and, and when that happened, you get things like this. Uh, this IO file is the file, uh, uh, a structure that is used with FOPEN, FCLOSE, FWRITE. And uh, it was designed in the 32-bit time, uh, when 32-bit was the biggest I mean, the, uh, machine. So it has these flags, which is four bytes, and then a pointer. In 32 bits, a pointer is four bytes as well. So there would be no alignment hole here. But when, this is for 64 bits, so uh, out, of, out of the blue you get this uh, four bytes that's not used for anything. So uh, if, you, if you need to add something else to the file, the data structure, let's say, or, or the data structure with the same uh, layout, you can use these four bytes here that's unused and it's consuming the space. Uh, and, uh, but then just looking at it and uh, and, and, and deciding what to do was tedious as well. So there is this dash dash reorganize that will uh, move things around and remove those, the, those things and pack the, the, the data structure. It, you, it, there's, there's this option, show reorg steps, that we'll, sh we'll, we'll, do, we'll move something, we'll tell what it did, and then show the data structure. Then do something else, tell, tell us what it did, and, and, and show the data structure until the end. Uh, so this is an example of trying to reorganize a task struct, which is, uh, I think, is the most important data structure in the Linux kernel, uh, uh, and has lots of information here about uh, these. Uh, uh, so 
the reorganization saved 136 bytes and, two, and, and the test task structure became two uh, cache lines smaller. Test structure cannot be uh, reorganized this way because there are lots of uh, explicit alignment that decisions so that you can avoid things like false sharing and you want to have uh, some fields close together because they are accessed in, in uh, temporality uh, 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 near. Uh, but, but you can see what kind of for, uh, extra information it, it provides. Um, so then P-hole was just for, for um, dwarf. OK, that's what we had in Linux. But then Dave Miller said that he, he, he works on Spark Linux and he wanted, uh, he knew that uh, Solaris had uh, D-Trace and D-Trace had this thing called uh, TTF, which is compact uh, C-type format. So Dwarf is too big. Uh, I mean, well, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about that later, but they came up with the CTF for D-Trace on Solaris, and uh, in the kernel image, you had all the types that, that uh, are used on the, and that D-Trace could use to, to, to create the, the scripts and uh, access the kernel data structure for introspection. So he suggested that I would support this and provide me some definitions about some, some header files that he managed to, to craft, and then I, I Worked on, on P-Hole and made it be uh, uh, multi-format. So the core of it that does the printing and the reorganization, things like that, uh, now is not dwarf specific. It, it can, uh, it, it, at, um, at that point, it supported CTF and dwarf. So first, there was this CTF reader to, to read the, the Solaris kernel and dump the, the, the types in there in the same fashion as it does with dwarf. Same code, and I wrote a encoder so that I could test the reader uh, with something else than that specific kernel. Uh, so, with this, the PHOL uh, had the, 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 a converter. It could convert from one type, dwarf, to another type, CTF, uh, just for testing. Uh, and, and it was not sophisticated. And, uh, Nowadays, there is libctf that came from Solaris, and uh, uh, P-Hole doesn't support this yet, but may, may, may well do this in the future. So Dwarf problems is that uh, the kernel community had problems with Dwarf at some point, that uh, an attempt was made at uh, having a unwinder based on Dwarf information on uh, call frames. And there was problems, there were the quality that the, the compiler generated, uh, the information led to bugs, and et cetera, and people, and Linux just threw it away the, and, and went back to the frame pointer based one. Uh, the problem is that uh, uh, in the kernel, you have t tens of thousands of obje object files, and, and Dwarf, it, it, this, it, for each of the object files in isolation, it has a representation for all the types that are used in that specific object file. Uh, so, uh, so lots of duplication for f types that are really big, like task struct. So the debugging for files, uh, as a result, uh, are very big, and, and you have to install like a, a, a was it updating my machine yesterday? It was something like uh, 76 megabytes just the, the package, and uh, it, it's it's really big. Uh, nowadays, there are, there are provisions. So dwarf, uh, at that time, it was Dwarf 3. three. Now it's Dwarf 5. Dwarf 5 has ways for you to compact things. But then, um, as we will see, it seems to be too late, at least for the things that I'm talking about now. Uh, so then, at some point after this, BPF is typing. Uh, uh, BPF did this to, for many things, and now it's used for many things. But let's say, to, to, pr to pretty print maps, you don't want to have one program per map that understands what's the layout for each of the keys or each of the, 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 the data entries in each of the uh, entries of the map. And later for compile once, run everywhere, which is the topic for many uh, presentations. I'll, I'll, I will only provide a link at the end. <laughs> but it's really interesting, this thing, for adaptability. It basically, you, you create a, a BPF program. And, and it 
in a way that it records where some data structures that the kernel has are accessed. And then when you are going to load, it will look at the, 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 the BTF information for the kernel and for the BTF information for this BPF program. And we'll do adaptations so that uh, if some field moved uh, offset, off the offset change and some other possible uh, uh, modifications, the BPF program will still run on this uh, different kernel than the one that it was compiled uh, and tested originally. Uh, so th from this, it came BTF, which is uh, BPF type format. Uh, basically, the, the, uh, it reused uh, uh, the parts of the CTF encoder and decoder. No, not a decoder, the encoder, the, 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 the encoder because the, the first producer of, of BTF information uh, was the uh, Clung and Pierhold. Clung generated B, uh, BTF, but for BPF, for, for the BPF target, for BPF programs. And Pierhold is used to convert from Dwarf to BTF using libpf to do the duplication of, uh, of all those duplicate types. Um, BTF, BPF deduplication, it looks at all the objects and removes type uh, duplicates. There are several things that, uh, that, that can happen. In the kernel, sometimes there are two different types with the same name in different objects, and so th there are provisions to, to deal with that. And then I uh, the, the first BTF reader was the kernel verifier. The, the kernel verifier would you, you would associate BTF information with a BPF ROM that you just loaded so that the ver verifier could later on use these for uh, its decisions. And uh, in doing so, uh, oh, the, the, the kernel verifier would verify BTF information. It would look at BTF to see if it, it, it's valid. But if it, in, uh, this information in the end, when you boot the machine, is in the syskernel BTF VM Linux file in CSFS. Uh, so, where libbpf and other customers can 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 access it per, per, and 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 get the information for for all the types in the Linux kernel. This file nowadays is about three megabytes. Uh, there were uh, over over the last three or four years some new features were added that, that made it a little bit bigger over time. But it's on uh, the ballpark of three. Three megabytes. So processing it is really fast. It's in kernel memory, so it's really fast. So instead of PAHOLE using dwarf, which is big, it, well, the interesting thing is that now you can use this file, and then you don't have to specify anymore where to get. If you don't say where to get informa type information from, it will try here. Uh, so you, you now you do something like this: uh, PAHOLE is being locked T. And it will say that it's a type def struct spin lock spin lock t. That, that's what spin lock t is. So if you do like p hole spin lock, just this, uh, it will use that file and will expand it like this. So it's an union that there is this thing in here. But what's this? So you can do things like this, expand it. You ask p hole dash capital E spin lock, and it will expand everything. And uh, it, it, you should try this on task struct. It, it, it doesn't crash, it works, but it will produce a really large file. And this is interesting in a sense because uh, people started using these, of these offsets that are related to the start of here in, in crash analysis. When you get a nopes and then you look at it, oh, there is the, uh, a, a, a new the reference and the offset of the instruction is 158 hexadecimal. Then you get the, you, and you think, that, oh, that's that data structure. What is in that offset? So you can expand the type, ask for those offsets to be printed in hexadecimal, which is possible as well, and then you get to the offset from the that you got on the faulting instruction. Well, where is it? Um, it, 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 it it is on ELF sections, just like uh, Dwarf is, and it is as well in that uh, CSFS. So if you get a kernel uh, with a BTF session, you can use it, let's say, for a kernel different from the one that you are running now. And then you want to, to compare 
the types on that on the running kernel against this other kernel. You can do that, producing the output for both and doing a diff, let's say. Uh, and as well, you can, for a loaded BPF program, you can ask the kernel, say, give me the BTF information for this program, and, and it will pro provide you. This is useful for things like uh, uh, profilers, like perf, uh, to get BTF information, where it will get, uh, 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 besides the, the, the type information, BTF has an extra section that where you can get line information, a uh, line information, like, like to do uh, disassembly, and perf uses this for doing uh, annotation, live annotation or annotation. Uh, so, and, it, and there is BPF2, uh, which is the canonical tool for you to deal with BPF, uh, what's running on the system, pinning programs to some specific location on BPFFS, uh, asking all kinds of information. One, one thing that you can do with BPF2 is, is use the subcommand BTF, Another, you go on the comments, uh, and you ask uh, to get that file, the, the CSFS VM Linux, and, and produce C that you can uh, include in your BPF programs to access the data structure in that specific kernel. So it reconstructs. And, and you can do the same thing with PA hole. You do PA hole dash dash compile and will reconstruct compilable source code like BPF2. That's another thing you can do. Uh, where else? In, in syskernel BTF, besides VM Linux, you have one file per kernel module. In this file uh, are the types that are not present in VM Linux and are specific to this uh, kernel module. Uh, program lines, as I said, you have a, a, a BTF X ELF section and Perf Notate uses it. Let, let, let's see here. So. But uh, I will talk about a, an adaptability use case for a tool that was recently introduced in Perf, and uh, we will see uh, the, an example of getting the source code for a BPF program that is loaded. So Nam Young King uh, 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 wrote a, a... In Perf now, you, uh, we are implementing new features. Uh, instead of changing the kernel to provide some new facility, we we use BPF to uh, hook into some strategic places, gather some information, do in place, uh, do uh, bucketization, aggregation in, in, in BPF maps, and then use the space, it, it, the, perf, the, the existing perf infrastructure uh, sees all these as a new synthetic event, uh, so something that uh, gets all this aggregation and then you get it there. And uh, you can consume it like CPU cycles or, s or some other uh, trace point or whatever. Uh, but but then, then while writing this, he realized that uh, to support multiple kernels, uh, there was this change in the SCAD switch trace point that now has a prev state, a new argument for this uh, uh, trace point. So there are kernels where we don't have that, and there are kernels where we have that. So how, how can I write a tool, in this case perf, that will use this information when available, and when not available, we will use another method to get the same information, perhaps a more costly uh, method. So uh, what he did was um, this. In, in, the, in, the, in the perf loader, in, in perf you, you have to get the, the bytecode for this skeleton, let's say, and, and load into, into the kernel. Perf will call libbpf to say, insert the, the, put this BPF program in place, set up its maps, and et cetera, et cetera. And libbpf will do all this for, for Perf. Uh, in the process of doing so, it will create a BPF skeleton in, in a previous state. And then after this skeleton is in place, done by libbpf, you can go and say, uh, uh, please give me the BTF information for this skeleton uh, and uh, find uh, this type def, a BPF trace cat switch. And then you say, uh, 
you get the type of it, and then at the end you say, oh, is this a function prototype? Oh, yes, it is a function prototype for a, a, a trace point. And then you can ask, how many arguments does this uh, trace point has in this specific kernel that's being used at the moment? VLAN, it's generic because it's the same thing for, let's say, how many entries, how many entries this enumeration has, or how many entries this struct has, how many members, or in the case of a function prototype, is how many uh, arguments, how many parameters. So if it's four, and then it says, oh, I have prep state, and, and it sets this in an area that uh, when the program is loaded, the BPF program is loaded, the logic can check this. And then if, if this variable in the BPF program is set to true, it will it will do this. This, this is the, the, the BPF program uh, that hooks into the SCAD switch at tra BTF trace point. And then it receives this context. And in this context, uh, it, it says, it has pre if it has prep state, then I can use the third argument, uh, the, 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 the fourth argument yet. If not, I will have to use this BPF helper and call get task state for, for this specific thing. So if, if there are four arguments, I'm going to use this because it's already passed. If not, I will use something which is more costly. And then this program, perf, will work with this BPF-based off-CPU profiling. Uh, on systems with the two kinds of, of uh, uh, trace points. So if I, if I go and run it, I say I run it and leave it running here. Uh, uh, this control C is just later on. And then while it's running, I can use BPF2 and say, what are the programs that are running? And I know that the name of the program is on switch, and I ask for four, four lines. And then it says, oh, it's a uh, on switch, and then several informations about the, the, the BPF program. It says it was perf that put it in place, and then there are several maps that are associated with it. Uh, and then I, I can say, show me the code. I say BPF2 proc dump jitted. Uh, because the BPF program is loaded as a byte code, and then the, uh, after passing verification, it, it will be jitted and transformed into the native code. So this is jitted. ID 634. 634. It's this ID here. So I then I get the, the source code. for uh, I, I get the, the uh, native instructions and then intermingle it with it, like with object dump uh, dash ds, the disassembly, you get the, the program. So, so this was BPF2 asking the kernel for the source code that is associated with that specific BPF program, and it provided. So I can as well ask BPF2 map and uh, and then for that, uh, what uh, is the to get the the, the map uh, of CPU that's associated with? I, I know that there is a map with that name. So if I do BPF2 map dump ID 490, I get uh, pretty printed because it's going to use the BTF information that's uh, associated with this specific map. Uh, the feature that Nam Young implemented is uh, off CPU profiling. Uh, after you run that. Uh, perf record with the specific parameters, and then it produces a perf data file, as usual, and then you call this, and then you see that this is, uh, that uh, when when this program, which was a perf bench SCAD messaging, uh, a, a synthetic workload to, to test some uh, messaging uh, SCAD, uh, you see that uh, when it was not running, 2% of the time it was because it was waiting for poll. And 37% uh, was write and 40% was read. And then you, you see uh, 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 that uh, the, 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 this is, is a backtrace, yes? This called this, called this, called this, called this, and this, and this, and this. You, you, uh, he said that he, that he removed the, the call graph operation from this uh, here so to make it more compact. But you could see. Uh, what were the paths that lead to that poll in the application yeah. and uh, to write as well. So this is perf annotate using the same thing. Uh, you, you, run, you run something like this, Oops. Uh, which is, is perf using a BPF to do something. And then if you go here and, and say perf top 
and ask for three counters, uh, L1 iCache load misses, ITLB load misses and cycles. You're going to see nothing. Oh, yeah. And then if I uh, slash, oh, it's, oops. Oh, something is wrong. Uh, but here, this BPF here, and I say annotate, I will see the, again, the source code for that uh, C's exit. It's, it's, this program is hooking on the syscall entry path and the exit path. And then you're going to see here the, these kinds of things that uh, in the previous presentation I showed. That, uh, most of the, the action is happening when at entry and on a knob. That's because, uh, let me go back to the presentation. The, this is a presented uh, in, in plumbers in Lisbon, the, the last uh, plumbers that was uh, in, uh, in person. And uh, this, you see, uh, is similar. Uh, lots of things are happening at the beginning. But I tried the same thing again, but disabling uh, inspect and meltdown hardware mitigations. And then things look more uh, OK. So, because when you are going to, uh, to, to the kernel with the mitigations in place, it will uh, uh, flush some caches and, uh, to avoid the speculations and uh, problems. So, and uh, finally, uh, we have nowadays, BHOLI is used in the kernel build. I mean, it, it's, uh, all the kernels that are being built now that want to have uh, BPF uh, functionality, uh, we'll have to have, we'll have P-hole installed and use it in a step of the build process. So you, you, you uh, compile everything and at some point you have to have this, this, this step that will get the VM Linux producer so far. We'll do, get all the dwarf information, the duplicate it and create the BTF information, link it with the kernel so that when it boots, we have that CZFS uh, file in place. And it's the same thing for, for kernel modules, uh, for each of them, uh, one after the other. So, uh, this is interesting. Uh, the eventually, compilers will produce BTF for the x86, uh, for the x86 target or for ARM and etc. That's not the case so far. It's, they are only producing uh, BTF information for the BPF target. Uh, so, for now, PHOL is... is uh, uh, required, but uh, even when they produce, there will be uh, the need for a step when you, you, you will get all the BTF that was generated for each of the objects and they duplicate it. So P-hole or other tool will have to do this step that is not a compiler. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, BTF information has, uh, BTF has information for, for global variables. Nowadays, just for per CPU global variables, which was the only use case so far that requires information about those, those variables. Um, it, it's really convenient when they're developing new features. Um, uh, so if we go, one, new, one such new feature is this BTF tags. So Clang generates the new dwarf tags and Pihol will convert this dwarf tag uh, for this new BTF uh, uh, type of, of information. So the idea is that when you have a kernel data structure and it's marked, let's say, uh, dash underscore underscore e user or underscore underscore per CPU or, or all the annotations that you have there, this will be preserved. And then uh, when a BPF program goes to access some of these fields, the verifier has more information to decide if this is safe or how this should be done. Um, uh, during the kernel build, because there are these new features uh, being added over time, you have these scripts PHO flags that will, in the end, produce the set of flags that can be used with the specific PHO version that is installed in this machine. And looking at it, we can see we can see several options that were implemented over 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 time. So uh, 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 
the version 108, uh, 1.18 to 100, uh, 1.21 had a problem that encoding BTF variables for the per CPU was problematic. So uh, we had this skip. Uh, uh, and then if it's more than 1.21, then we have a BTF kind float. Uh, we, we, we generate information for floating type uh, uh, variables and types because it was not being generated, but for S390, kernel uses uh, uh, flo floating type for some uh, things. Uh, and then if it's more than 1.22, we can use dash J, which is the same thing as make to, 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 to use to, to load the dwarf information in parallel. And, and, uh, and encode BTF in, in parallel as well. Uh, version 1.22, only loads in parallel, so it greatly speeds up the process, but there is an opportunity for further uh, speed ups uh, that was implemented already. A uh, less bug was fixed uh, last week, I think. Less, no bug. Uh, and so version 1.24 that we'll release after coming back from this conference, we'll be able to uh, encode BTF in parallel as well. So the, the time it takes during the kernel build for this step to be uh, Performed is, is is being reduced. Um, one one other thing is about Rust. Rust is being uh, 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 Rust is, uh, people are, are working to have parts of the kernel built in Rust, and Rust has uh, different types of dwarf information, and uh, it does some interesting things like uh, this reorganized I mentioned at the beginning to make it uh, smaller the data structure. A uh, Rust does by default. If you if you don't say anything, it will move fields around for for data structures. Uh, if you don't want it to do that, you have to specify something. You have to uh, give some attributes to the data structures so that don't do it. But since it does that, the dwarf information that's produced uh, has the the the, is the members in in a data structure with uh, the offsets in, out of order and the kernel. Uh, when, when the kernel is validating this information, it says it's uh, invalid. So talking with Miguel Ojeda, the, the guy who is working with Rust for the kernel, we, we decide for now to, to add this option, lang exclude, and then you can say that if the dwarf information was produced from Rust, don't encode it. Uh, because this is the first problem that we have. There may be others. So uh, we, we need some more time to, to look at this. Uh, and uh, one piece of curiosity, uh, in Dwarf, in the, 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 the first tag, there is the information about what was the language that, was, that produced this object file. And then there are many. I mean, Dwarf is really uh, has provisions to, 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 to express all the constructs that are in all those languages. There, there are many others. Uh, I put just some here. And. Uh, Finally, th there is uh, a pretty printing in the kernel. Y you can get this information that is in the kernel to, let's say, uh, print this uh, print this SKB. So you, you do something like this, and you produce something like this uh, in, in, in the uh, uh, in DMASG or wherever you, you can, or in a file, or in a SEC file, or things like that. So uh, inside the kernel, you can do it. Th there are people now who are wanting to have all the, the, the global variables uh, encoded in BTF so that when you do a uh, K dump, you could have this information there and then you can uh, pre print this while doing post mortem analysis. You can influence how this is done by using some flags to, to make it more compact or more terse. And uh, you can also in user space use PHOLD for the pre printing. So you say PHOLD uh, dash dash pre the uh, standard input, and you say, oh, th the header is of this type. So it gets this type from the kernel BTF information, and then you feed it some binary, and then you get the, it, it, it gets the raw data and, and, and pretty prints it. Uh, because it's in the kernel BTF. You say p whole ELF64 HDR, and it will get the information for that. BTF gen is uh, for older kernels where there is no uh, BTF information, so you can generate just the subset of BTF information that libbpf then can use to 
do compile once, run everywhere, and things like that. And just to, to show one, one re really recent that I'm still reading about from, from the guys behind Celio, it's a Valent. They have this Tetragon uh, that use, DTF is required because to do its magic, to look for exploits or things like that, it has to, to use BTF. So that's it, what I had to say today. There's this information about BTF the dub is really interesting, describing Core Rare, and the presentation is at this place. So, thank you. Any questions? It's not really a question, it's a, a big thanks for PA Hall because yeah. uh, I use it on a daily basis and uh, it saves me a lot of time. Userland, but uh, it's, uh, it's a nice aid in parallel to GP, for example. You just dump a structure, you quickly read from a dump uh, what it matches, etc. And uh, just using it to optimize the code all the time, uh, seeing yeah. the, um, the cache line uh, boundaries, etc. It's really a fantastic tool. Cool. I encourage everyone to use it. Yeah, cool. Nice to know. So something like the task truck has a bajillion macros uh, that are controlled by config options for what's included in there. How we, what are we doing to detect regressions for alignment for like all the different matrix of configs that adjust how it's laid out? The, the thing is, uh, uh, in, in task struct, you have, uh, or in GCC, oh, uh, you, you, you can add an attribute to a specific uh, 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 struct member. So you say, this struct, this struct has to be aligned at 64 bytes. So, so if you add anything before it, and there is a space, it continues at that alignment. And if you fill all the space here and put one more byte, then you create a 63 byte new hole. So the, the, the alignment information uh, is, is it's for there. It was not encoded in the dwarf. Now it is encoded in the dwarf. So for instance, the, the algorithm that I have for reorganizing it, the structure is not taking it into account. It should. It should take that into account and keep that there and then don't use this space. I mean, it, can, it can use this space before because it's there and then you can put, but you cannot move things that are in, inside that uh, cache line that's marked. So you're gonna say, oh, that, that cache line is, uh, it should not be messed with. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the programmer uh, uh, arranged things in a way that uh, those fields in that cache line are related. So uh, I cannot just move that thing. Makes sense, thanks. For, for ABI, I think, but people use this as, uh, uh, I want to add something and keep the ABI. So I get some, uh, one of those holes and put it there, but the ABI is preserved. Uh, yeah. if, if it's just a new feud. Yeah, it's nice to use a hole if there's one available, right? Yeah. Um, so since you are reorganizing the structures, is it possible that it's actually causing cache inefficiency? Yeah, yeah. Because then, then the CPU might have to access different cache lines at some point? Exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, you, I mean, if uh, I have to add something to PA whole saying, oh, if there is some uh, alignment thing inside the, the structure, just say, oh, you should uh, uh, reorganize is not something uh, that should be done with this. Uh, it requires extra care because you, you, could, you could get something that are related and that are separated. There, there is, uh, and, and move them together, and then it would even be better but than the person who originally put all this information. There, there, is, uh, there, there is more, inf uh, uh, there are resources, harder resources in uh, new processors where you can get information in, in tools like Perf to, 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 to see uh, for, uh, to, to see uh, when a cache line is being tugged by different processors, 
and then it's going continually evicted from the, the, the CPU cache. And then people, uh, uh, one dream is to get this information and then feed into the reorganization uh, algorithm so that it moves things to be better placed than before. But, but you run it first, you reorganize with profiling information, mm -hmm. it would be profiled guided data optimization and yeah. not code. That, that was my question, if you can get some sort of a heat map of these structures so you can feed it back into the um, structure yeah. reorganization. In yeah, in, in Perf we have Perf C2C, cache to cache, which produces some output and people are using it because it, it, it was available before in the HP UX uh, in the past. So people, there are some nice articles that you can use that and it, exp it exploits these uh, hardware capabilities and, and you can notice, oh, this, uh, I have a lock here uh, with a thing that is read uh, mostly and then every time I'm gonna read that thing, I have to go to memory because the lock is invalidated. So the, 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 the tool is there, but not as good as, let's say, Peter Zuster would like. He would like something like getting the output for peer hole and doing data structure annotation. Like we had perf top showing the lines of code and then you would see the data structure and then s uh, look at what are, are the fields that are the most hot and uh, while doing it live. So you would see the distributor being accessed. That, that would be really nice. Uh, yep. There are several people who are trying to work on this from time to time, like Stefan Aranian at Google. He has compiled people there. He keeps saying this from time to time. Because there are some things like looking at the, looking, uh, preserving information about uh, accesses to the data structure, like BPF Core has. In BPF Core, you have to say, oh, I, I'm accessing this field, so it produces relocation information, so, so, so that you could map back from the, from the cache line, the offset in the cache line, to the data type, and then to the member, blah, blah, blah. But there, there is some difficulties in this, but uh, eventually this will come to fruition. Thanks. Would a struct group help to identify things that PA hole shouldn't, uh, well, should keep together when it's reorganizing? Uh, what? Uh, a struct group is a feature that Gustavo talked about this morning where you can say that, uh, so it's, it's for mem copy protection and mem sets initially, where yeah. you can group items together and it creates a sort of yeah, I missed that. No, 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 no. Uh, how does that, inco uh, does that produce uh, information that get in the debug information is uh, just like a post-processing phase. I have to I have to take a look at it. Yeah. I, I noticed that, but I hadn't. I, I have not investigated it. Maybe. And how does it play with um, uh, structs that get randomly reorganized? The structs that get out of memory. No, that get randomly reorganized. Do you mean uh, we're using the, uh, the ah, randomly reorganized, understood. Um, then if you don't have the, the map to what is, is there, you will not be able to, to, to look at it. So you will not be able to. But be, uh, uh, by design, yes, you reorganize that and, and uh, randomly and, and th that there is no mapping, it cannot do magic. Yeah, it's on. Uh, yeah, regarding your question, a struct group is not supposed to uh, uh, to modify the, the memory layout within the structure. Yeah, I just wondered if it would provide the information, uh, well, it would allow the expected structure requirements to be defined in greater granularity in the code in a way that might appear in BTF and so PA hole could use it. It's not just to say that this part of the struct, these fields should be kept together for cache alignment reasons or whatever, for cache line. So, so I mean, from the information, you can get this info uh, now. There is this, this uh, 
uh, alignment information. So getting the alignment information should say, oh, this, the, 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 from this on, you should not mess with. They should keep them together or things like that. You could use this as a, as a heuristic and improve the, the way that the algorithm is doing. Uh, the, 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 the decision uh, will be by the, by the developer at the end. You should just try to ask for it to be reorganized. You get the new thing, insert, uh, replace the old one, and run your benchmark. If it gets better, don't do. That, oh, I, I, was, I think it was uh, Jesper was describing how he was, he was looking, at, has this workload and he uses perfstat and looks at how many cache misses and then he moves things around and runs it again and oh, it improved it. So these things are related. <laughs> So a kind of brute force with some uh, information that you have about that data structure. So uh, uh, there, are, there are lots of interesting ideas that you could use to do some feedback loop, run something, measure, change things around, rebuild, run again, compare with the previous one. Yeah, automatically, in some automated way. I was just going to add that usually you just use an anonymous struct, right? If you want to group things together inside a struct, then you just put them inside an anonymous struct. Exactly. And align things. Th that's another way, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you could say the, uh, the reorganization would be just on the top. It is just on the top level one. It d doesn't mess with what is inside it. You would have to ask, reorganize that one as well. And then if there is information in PeerHold, for instance, when it prints a, a data structure, a large one, it, it, it's, it, it prints you have one struct inside another, and, and it looks at this previous one, if it has padding and says, oh, the previous field has padding, and perhaps you could use it um, somehow. You, you mentioned the Rust compiler is actually doing some of this automatically. Is it, do, is it simply just optimizing out holes, or is it doing something any I don't know. I haven't checked it. Okay. What I know is that it does something to this degree, and that this ends up producing dwarf that is out of order, the, the offsets in the data structure. And then the BTF encoder doesn't look at this and passes this on to the BTF, and then the BTF is refused by the kernel. Okay. What we will do in, in the future, if this is the only problem, or it, I mean, to solve this one, is when encoding BTF, put them in, or, in order, in the order that Verify expects. Because I'm not changing the offsets, I'm just ordering it in the way that the kernel BTF code uh, expects. Okay. I, don't, I don't know what this that it does to, but it, it, I know that it changes things around, uh, how and to what extent, and that you can disable these like you do a specific alignment in C. Any more questions? Well, thank you. is a chari charity auctions. So each year we uh, find a project uh, that inspires us and uh, this year we wanted uh, to have some special, special thoughts for kids. So uh, we will speak about kids on computer and um, uh, so we, you will have an introduction about this project and then uh, we have some surprises for the charity auction this year, right?
Hello, 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 awesome. Uh, yeah, well, first, I want to thank the uh, organizers for running this auction for Kids on Computers. So, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so this is going to be a short uh, presentation about uh, this project. Um, uh, Kids on Computers is a non-profit organization, so uh, the, the purpose of this project is to bring uh, technology to areas around the world where people don't have access to technology. So those are remote areas where they don't even have access, I mean, th they don't have a con internet connection, right? So it's a non-profit organization, it's wha it was founded in 2009 in uh, well, yeah, the idea is to set up computer labs around the world. Stormy Peters is the founder uh, of, this, uh, of this project. So she's sort of like a prominent figure in the open source uh, community. And well, we have some computer labs in these areas of the world. Uh, Argentina, India, Mexico, uh, Morocco, uh, recently in Uganda. And what we do is to, um, we, 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 uh, we set up uh, computers with free and open source software. Um, these computer labs are targeted to uh, elementary schools uh, uh, mainly. And our intention is to create a community around a computer lab that runs open source software. So we have some requirements uh, in order to consider uh, bringing a computer lab to a certain community. So they first have to go through a short application uh, process, which is basically they need to uh, prove us that they have a, a proper place where they can store the computers, uh, securely store. Uh, usually in these sort of communities, well, there are a lot of other issues uh, beside uh, lacking of, uh, of technology, right? So some, sometimes uh, it has happened that some people has tried to break into the computer labs, right? So we ask them to, uh, to prove us that, that they have a proper place uh, with certain uh, security measures, right? Usually, what these communities do is, uh, well, they organize with each other uh, and they, uh, well, they take care of the security lab like uh, interns, right? Uh, also, in some special cases, we provide uh, computers to uh, individual students, right? So those, but, uh, those are, are very, very special uh, cases. We have some partners. Uh, the Linux Foundation is one of them. Uh, System76. Uh, recently, the Webasa Foundation, which is another, uh, another foundation that uh, wants to uh, bring technology to, uh, to kids and people around the world. Uh, also, we, we, have, uh, close, we, we, we work close to the people from Internet in a Box. I don't know if you have heard about this project. Well, basically what they try to do is to, uh, to bring uh, internet in a box without internet connection. And what they do is they, they, uh, they have this image where they include uh, things like Wikipedia. The whole Wikipedia uh, are uh, basically in, this, uh, in these devices. So usually when we set up a computer lab, we make use of one or of two of those devices to uh, uh, to set up uh, a network so, so that the kids can have access to Wikipedia. Uh, I think, uh, if I remember well, Khan Academy also uh, is included. And we also try to, uh, to provide them with some educational um, suites like GCompris. And well, the idea of these labs is not to teach them uh, programming or, or computer science. Uh, we basically want to give them uh, technology so they can learn the, the, the usual subjects they, they have uh, at elementary schools, right? So they need to uh, they have uh, uh, math classes, physics, uh, geography, whatever, right? 
So we just want to give them a uh, means for uh, for learning about about the world and well to uh, to make a future. Uh, these are well some uh, some pictures that uh, that Twitter kids and Twitter share recently. Um, this is also uh, well. Uh, we uh, we managed to to provide kids with uh, uh, we managed to 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 benefit uh, more than 400 kids with some computer labs in Uganda recently. And well, uh, another thing uh, is important to mention is that uh, we we provided with used computers, right? So we usually ask people to donate computers. Uh, in some special cases, we buy uh, new devices. But those new, those new devices are usually Raspberry Pis. Here are some pictures of uh, of a lab. This lab uh, was set up in Mexico, and you can see here uh, there is the internet in, in a back server running, and this you can see the, the Raspberry Pi. We also provide them with uh, with projectors, so if they need to give some presentations so or whatever they need to do, well, uh, they can use a, a projector. These are some of the locations around the world where uh, we have schools, we have computer labs, and well, here are some some, some important links if you want to uh, to check it out. And also another thing important to mention is that um, we organize, we try to organize uh, uh, trips and go and visit those communities uh, every year. So those communities usually have what we call a champion. So is the person that is going to be in charge of the of the computer lab. So he's going to be in close contact with us, so telling us how everything is going on, right? So it's sort of like a um, he, th those uh, those people send us sort of like uh, informal reports every now and then. So after setting up the lab, we uh, still go back to visit and see how things are going. And in cases where some computers uh, are broken or some devices are broken, we we try to replace them. And by the way, everything is is free. Uh, uh, we are we are all volunteers, so. None of us um, uh, receive any kind of uh, salary out of this uh, work. Hey, well, that's basically it. And I just want to uh, see if I can run this, this video. OK. Yeah, this is. Uh, a video from, from a trip to Mexico in 2016. So yeah, I, I leave you with that. And that's it. Thank you. So you have any questions about the project? Good day, everyone. Uh, so yes, we are making a charity action as if you real. So I'm very, very uh, happy to 
to be with my friend uh, on stage and trying to make money uh, for the kids. We have been always, uh, we have all been kids at some point and I had to learn the chance to learn computers. So it's nice to give this chance also to any other kid that doesn't have our changes. Um, first of all, uh, I have uh, 0.066 items to sell. Uh, it's on a rush set scale. Uh, it depends on the no number of slides I uh, have to, to pass. So in fact, I have 10 items, obviously, to, to, to scale. Um, to scale. I will make a, a short pass of all the items I, have. I will have to do. I will get back to this one then. This one. So um, the first items, are, there is uh, four of them. Uh, this is a vintage uh, thirst. So this is some bottles that have been brewed for you seven years ago. Uh, I grant you the quality, it's Belgian beer, so the, the more heads it have, the better it tastes. So I will have four of them to sell. I will have some, a couple of drawings from uh, uh, Frank. Uh, so there is uh, several studies. Uh, as you will see, it's pretty vintage because it was done for the carrier 20 that never occurred. So we have um, four of them. So there is a study, a prevention, which is very close to the actual one. There will be another one which is very, very close to the release, uh, but still to 2020. And some back, which is 2021. And the one which is the closest uh, to the actual sticker, uh, which is also still to 2031, which in phase uh, how much we have been postponing this conference. Uh, I will also sell you some uh, items. So I had the chance to, to get uh, to Italy. And in Italy, there is uh, an island uh, which is well known for their uh, end, uh, sorry, human blown um, glass. So it makes some th this kind of items. So it's made by, uh, by people. And it's made of glass. It's a penguin. Uh, we found them very pretty. So I have two of them to put on auction. Uh, there is zip and zap. Uh, <laughs> so this is the two friends. And another friend in the room made me a, a gift. So I will add it to the auction. Uh, it's two processes that have been turned into a key ring. Some may have some interest in it. And if you are interested, it's uh, some Xeon uh, processes. So it could be nice also to add them to the auction. Um, so I will start, obviously, pretty uh, odd today. So I will start with the thirst. So there is four bottles uh, to buy. Um, I will start at five euros. So raise your hand when you want to make a new price. And I will um, increase the price time after time. Uh, you can get individual, you can make also some teams on some items. Uh, we can sometimes I think the auction gets crazy. Uh, last edition it was totally crazy. So uh, at some point, if you want to make a team with your company, with your friends, it's fine. So I would start at five euros for this one, for the first bottle. Ten William, uh, five, sorry, William. Who for ten? Ten, thank you, Willie. Fifty, thank you. You can shout any am amount of money if you want to, want to raise the bar at some point, it's free. So 15 to my left. 50. 50. Whoa. Uh, just to be clear, this is not small. Usually I, I was used to make some two liter butter, so just to be clear, it's a, it's a small one. It's one. So uh, I get back to, no, I, I, I'm fine. Uh, 50 still? <laughs> you're, my, you're my lord. So <laughs> for 60 then, anyone? 51 time? 60? Thank you. Thank you for the kid. 60? No, 60 is good. 60? Is there a 60 to my left? Who for 70? It's crazy. See, if you start at 70 for a bottle, <laughs> I don't know where we'll end. So 70, anyone? 60 is very nice. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, just to be clear on the way to buy it, uh, we accept cash and we also accept our credit cards. Uh, so we can take anything. So who for, I will start so at uh, 10 for the second one. So who for 10? You 10. 10, thank you, Stephen. 15? 30, 30, thank you. 40. 40. 
Just shout, it will be faster. The 40 to my left with Steven. 40, 41 time. Two time, 50, thank you, Willie. Oof, 60. 60, thank you, Steven. Maybe 70, so we'll get to the same price as the first one. Someone for 70. Thank you, Jens. Oof, for 80. They have to be good. <laughs> Woo, what a pressure. Who <laughs> for 80? 70. 80? Thank you, Ricardo. 80. 80 one time. 100. <laughs> Thank you, Jens. Hey, so 110 then? 100. One time. Two time. Three time. Thank you, Jens. Okay, you get warm, so let's start at 50 then. <laughs> we'll win sometime. 50, thank you, Stephen. <laughs> we'll for 60. 75. 75, thank you. Nice price. 80. 80, anyone? 75, one time. Two time. Three times. Who oh, said 100? Ricardo. <laughs> It's, it's fine. I mean, you have the voice. It's you. <laughs> yeah, cool. It, it works. I mean, uh, teams are accepted. So, uh, 100 for this one to my left, to our Ricardo on the East team. Thank you. Last one. So let's start also at 50 because it worked well for the first three ones. 50. So 50, thank you, Stephen. 50. 60. 70. Who? Someone? 60. Yeah, 70. Uh, 70, sorry, sorry. 80. 80. 90. 90, thank you. 100, still? 100. 110. 110. How much? 111. 111. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> One, tw one uh, twenty. This is the last one, and it's from 2015, so it's uh, seven and years old. Red, uh, yeah, it's not exactly the same. <laughs> and it's a little bit more finished. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this one is a red beer. The two others are uh, brown beers. So we were at 120. Anyone else? It's a very nice price. Thank you all for the kids. It's so cool. One time, two time, three time. Uh, one fifty. One fifty. Oh. <laughs> You're crazy, guys. One fifty. One time, two times, three times. Yay! Um, I will probably continue with one processor. So it's Xeon, uh, I can read the version if you like. It's a 2660 V3. It has been used in real computers. I think it's totally broken. And so it has been turned by Adrien, thank you Adrien, uh, into uh, a key ring. So does anyone want it for, let's start at 20? 20. 20, thank you. Who for 30? 30? 30, 40, anyone? 40, thank you. 50. 40, anyone for 50? 41 time. Two time. 50, thank you. So now we are at 70, uh, 60, sorry. I have to recount in English. 60. 75, thank you. What's your name? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know you yet. David. David, thank you, David. Uh, so we were at 75, right? So let's get to 80. 75 one time, two time, three times. Thank you, David. Uh, let's get to the drawings now. So this one uh, was the first study of uh, the stylish of uh, what uh, car the, of the, um, the sorry the sticker. So it was uh, Sandering from Frank. Uh, he was trying to establish some people and trying to find some IDs on Sandering. So this is the first drawing you can put on cell. 
Um, I can offer to start at 20. Anyone for 20? Yep, thank you. Anyone for 30? 30 euros. Anyone? Yep, thank you. And anyone for 40 euros then? We have 30 at the back of the room. So it's a unique drawing. Uh, it has been made once. It's still uh, made of uh, a black pen. I don't know how to say that in English, I'm sorry. It's, uh, it's a manual drawing. Crayon drawing, maybe? I don't know. How do you say that in English, Frank? The, your, the crayon? No, it's not nice thing. A rough? OK. So we have 30 at the back. Anyone for more? 40, thank you. We'll, we'll, 40, 41 time, two time, three time. Thank you, Willie. Really. Now we have another version of this drawing, uh, which is more closer to what we have today. Um, so it starts, uh, let's say, also start at 20. So maybe 30 at the back. Yeah, thank you. 30 at the back. Anyone for 40, please? For the kids. No. 30. One time. Two time. 40. 40. Thank you, Anis. It's a pre one version. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> it has been tested, but never released. So 40 to my left with Anis. One time. 50. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. 50, so now we are now at 60, 60 euros for a unique drawing from Frank, which I've been uh, kind enough to do us, all of us for, uh, for this week. So 60, anyone? So 50 one time, two time, three time, thank you. <laughs> so still two drawings to sell, so this one is very close to the the final release. You can see the name of the conference, embedded on Canal Recipes. You can see the, the motto, the grid got back to. Uh, we can recognize uh, the picture. We can see the COVID incoming. Characters. On characters, I mean inverted, as Frank is saying. I did not notice. Yep. So let's start at 20 euros. How much? 20? Fine. 30? Thank you. 40? 40. 40, thank you. 50? 50, thank you. 60. It could be an, a nice drawing to put in your desk or at your office or to make some, uh, to decorate your, your office work. So we are at 50, right? You need some cats. You need some cats. 60. 60, thank you, Stephen. 70. 70. For 80. 70 is a good price, thank you. 80. 70 one time, two times, three times, thank you. <laughs> so, the last drawing for this cell, uh, this one is very close, as you can see from the final release of, of the stickers that you have, uh, maybe all of you now on your laptops. Um, on this one, you can notice it's in French. Uh, you have rendezvous, where it become to meet at. And the date was obviously from the past year and not the actual one. But it's very, very close to the final drawing. So let's start at uh, 30 for this one. Anyone? Thank you, 30. 40. Thank you, Aurélien. 50. I'm sorry? Yeah, this one. No, I'm sorry. I was just showing the the sticker to the right to to show that how close there are the to the two of them. So it was a very the final release almost of the drawing. Uh, so we are at 50, right? I'm lost. Sorry. 50, anyone? <laughs> we have the door right here. Thank you, thank you, Hans. 50 at the back. 60, Aurelia. 100? Wow. Thank you. Any? 110? 
112, uh, 120, sorry. <laughs> 120, anyone? Thank you, Aurelia. Thanks so much. 130. Agolia team, 130, thank you. Anyone for 140? Let's start to make a price. Thanks for the kids. 130? 150. 150? Wow. Thanks, Aurelia. 160? <laughs> no? 160 one time? Two times? Three times. Thank you, Algolia. So now let's start uh, with the penguins. So we have zip. So this one is, uh, yeah, you can see this mold. It can be put this way or this way. It stands on the two sides, but this one is much more funny. So it's uh, unmade. It was a uh, glass blowing. Uh, it's a unique piece. It had been made by an, uh, a guy in, in uh, Murano. It's close to Venice, uh, Venetia. So uh, I propose to start at uh, 40 euros for this one. So let's start at oh, for 40 euros. Yeah, thank you, Hans. 50, William, 60. 100. Yeah, 100. Thank you, David. Thanks so much. 110. 110 at the back. I don't know your name. Thank you, Quentin. 120, anyone? David, 120, thank you. Very, gen very generous. 130 for William in front. 140, maybe, someone. Yeah, back to Quentin at 140. 150. This one made this unique piece. 140. One more time. Two time. Three time. Thank you, Quentin. Uh, just a note about these two penguins. We will provide the box so you can get it safer because this is very fragile. Before the next penguin, um, I offer to put another processor uh, on sale. Uh, it's the same version, so 2660 V3. So anyone for 15? 15, 15, thank you. Uh, anyone for 20? 20 at the back, 30. 30 euros, it's a cool processor, it can make you very geeky with it. 30, thank you. Anyone for 40 euros? Thank you, Nicola. Anyone for 50 euros? Thank you. What's your name? I don't know your name. Emily? Emily. Emily, thank you, Emily. Anyone for 60 euros? Nicola, maybe. Thank you, Nicola. 70. This is the last one I have to sell. And thank you once more to Adrien, who provided the, the processes. It's very kind of you. Uh, so we are at 70, right? Are you interested, Amy? No, 60. It's fine. 60 one time for Nicola. Two time. Three times. Thank you, Nicola. So I'm back to penguins. The second one, which is my preferred one. This one is uh, zipping on the, or zapping them on the heist. So I will start also. So this is the same uh, peop the same guy who, who who made this one. So it's also a unique piece, made of glass. And so I will start at 50 euros. Whoa, so many hands. <laughs> which one? <laughs> Let's start with Amy to be gentle. Anyone for 60? 60 in front, 70 behind maybe, 80. 80, 100 for William in front, thank you William, 110, thank you Thomas, Thomas right, uh, Guillaume sorry, <laughs> sorry you. 110 for Guillaume then, 120, 120 for William, 130 for David, anyone for 140, 140, thank you Guillaume, 150, 150, David, thank you. Very generous. 160. 160, wow. <laughs> Crazy guys. 170. 160 is a very nice price. One time. 
to the time. It's yours. Thank you, Guillaume. Um, I think we are over for this cell. So unless anyone, yes, Jens. I can't. Be my guest. Tell me. So um, I have here, as I mentioned in my presentation, we managed to get uh, 14 million IOPS out of a single core. Um, one of the devices we used is one of these Gen 2 Optanes. This bad boy um, will do 5 million IOPS and I forget, 7, 8 gigabytes a second, something like that, Gen 4 PCIe, complete with IU ring sticker and my worthless signature and some other writing. So I would like to add this to the Oxen. Is it possible. Working? It is fully working, so you can beat it up and do whatever you will with it. It's not NAND flash, so you can override it, no penalties. Um, it's quick, 200 nanoseconds per I.O. I think that's pretty much all the Intel marketing. So it's, it's a piece of history. I mean, this disk has been part of the benchmarking it did on the, the new record he set up, so. What's the size? 400 gigs. 400. So it's a really a... It has been signed by, uh, thank you, Jens, for signing and making this device. Yep. So, Stadium with 100 to my left. Thank you. 200. Whoa. 200 to the right. Now we, you can start making teams. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's start at 250 then. It's a very nice product. It works well. It makes 5 million layups. So, it's a really crazy device. It's a piece of collection. Anyone for 250? Two hundred? One time? Two time? Three time. It's yours. Oh yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes? <laughs> and thank you, Jens, for your help. Anyone else? <laughs> Let's go crazy. <laughs> no, thank you all for making this uh, auction. I think it's a crazy use we had uh, since the beginning of Canal VCP. So thank you all for your generosity. Uh, I appreciate it. And the kids really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for your, your help. Uh, you are a great audience, I have to say it. I'm very proud of to see all of you being here. You are very nice people. It's always a great pleasure to see you here and to, to share this time. So. Thanks, every, thanks, everyone, for participating. I hope you will make good money for your uh, association, and uh, you will make a good use of it. Thank you, Canary CPs, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow, and some for the dinner. Maybe you, you want to give the dinner? No, it's fine? OK, so see you at the dinner for those who were registered. <laughs> see you tomorrow. Oh, for those uh, who, who, who bought something, please go to see Anne uh, for the payment. Uh, if you have credit card or cash, so we can make it. Thank you.